Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023. And I'm so pleased that the Greens have been able to secure so many changes to strengthen this mechanism. Thanks to the strong negotiations of Greens leader Adam Bant and his team, and thanks to the Greens being in the balance of power in the Senate, coal and gas have taken a huge hit. We've stopped almost half of the 116 coal and gas projects in the pipeline from going ahead. Pollution will actually go down, and we've derailed the Beedaloo and Barossa gas fields. Prior to these amendments, Labor's reheating of Tony Abbott's safeguard mechanism was a company-by-company -company net emissions target that reduces by 4.9 per cent a year. Under Labor's original draft, the mechanism covered the top 215 big polluters in the country, but if a company exceeded its net target, it could purchase carbon credits generated by other companies' pollution cuts or carbon offsets that have no integrity, such as fencing land. A company's real pollution could still have risen. Labor's original safeguard mechanism was a plan full of accounting tricks, no real cuts to pollution, and it allowed more coal and gas and did nothing to stop the 116 new projects uh, for coal and gas in the investment pipeline. The Greens have secured changes that will make a big difference. I'm going to run the chamber through those, but first some important scientific context. Last week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released its latest report, its sixth synthesis report collating the, and analysing the wealth of scientific, economic, health and social impact research done in recent years. Nothing in the report is surprising. The world's scientists have been warning us for years, but the evidence is still shocking. Humans have changed the climate and we are paying the price. Australia is just one of the countries um, that's contributing to this problem, and Australia is in fact one of the countries that is most exposed to climate damage. And this just isn't about future generations anymore. The impacts of the climate crisis are being felt already. Devastating bushfires, floods, heat waves, declining biodiversity, coral bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, sea level rise putting Torres Strait Island communities at risk. We've heard these warnings before, and the nation's parliament has ignored them. We've squandered the last critical decade under a climate-denying government. It's time to act as if we are going to keep global heating below catastrophic levels, and the time to act to do that is now. What the IPCC report also confirms is that we can still act. Every fraction of a degree of avoided warming reduces the risks and makes us safer. We have the solutions we need. We know what needs to be done. So far, we have just failed to do it. The pace of change must be accelerated to bridge the massive gap between where we are and where we need to be. The UN Secretary General has called for developed countries like Australia to get out of coal, oil and gas, to stop licensing new projects and allowing existing projects to expand. We cannot put the fire out while we are pouring fuel on it. That's why the Greens will continue to call on the government to commit to no new coal and gas projects. Not one of those 116 projects currently waiting for approval can go ahead if we are serious about tackling the climate crisis. We need to go all in on making the transition to a sustainable energy system. We need investments in new technologies, in manufacturing and supporting the industries of the future. We need to support affected communities as we phase out fossil fuels. All of this is possible. It's also essential and it's urgent. The IPCC could not have been clearer about this. The cost of inaction far outweighs the cost of action, and we owe it to the planet, to our children, to their children, to act now and to get out of coal and gas. So it's against this scientific context that the Greens sought to negotiate with Labor to try to stop new coal and gas. We pushed and we pushed and we pushed. But in a climate crisis, the Labor Party still wants to open more coal and gas. And when we're negotiating with Labor, it's like we're negotiating with the political wing of the multi-billion dollar fossil fuel industry. Despite Labor's unwillingness to act urgently to prevent all new coal and gas, we have secured significant changes. The Greens have stopped about half of those 116 new coal and gas projects from going ahead. We've secured a hard cap on pollution, which means pollution will actually now go down and not up. 
and the coal and gas corporations can't just buy their way out of it with, off with offsets, dodgy or otherwise. We've secured a pollution trigger, which for the first time in history means that the remaining coal and gas projects will be assessed against the hard cap for their impact on the climate and can be stopped. We've derailed both the Beedaloo and Barossa climate bombs. The Beedaloo and many other new offshore gas fields will now be required to be CO2 net zero, casting serious doubts over their viability, and that is excellent news for those First Nations communities um, atop the Beedaloo Basin that have never provided consent to that project and do not want it to go ahead, risking their land and water and our shared climate. We've also secured a range of other amendments, including wiping out many of those dodgy offset projects and methodologies, which will bring us much closer to a future without coal and gas. This is why people put the Greens in the balance of power, to push Labor further and faster on climate and to get action on coal and gas. With our significant amendments, the Greens will be voting to pass this bill and will back the regulation, but the fight against new coal and gas will not stop. We will fight every single one of those remaining projects. Before we started our negotiations, under Labor's plan, actual pollution from coal and gas was going to go up, and there was nothing in the safeguard mechanism to stop new coal and gas. Real pollution under the safeguard mechanism must now come down, and a failure by Labor to ensure that happens will mean that Labor is breaking the law. With the safeguard pollution trigger, Labor now has the power to stop coal and gas projects that would breach the pollution cap. Every new project that gets approved from here on in is Labor's direct responsibility. This fight is not over. If we can grow our movement and get more Greens in this place, we'll be able to achieve more. The only obstacle to stopping all new coal and gas in this parliament is Labor, the Liberals and their fossil fuel donors. We need to build community power to overcome them. We'll continue to push to strengthen the environmental laws that will come before parliament uh, later this year. We'll continue to fight the fossil fuel subsidies in the budget, the $11 billion of freebies in cheap diesel and accelerated depreciation that the fossil fuel companies get, that ordinary Australians don't get. We will continue to back the fights of communities right around the country who are fighting those coal and gas projects in the pipeline, including in Scarborough and Narrabri. And we know that the people are with us. We are in solidarity with First Nations people, with climate scientists, with our Pacific Island neighbours and with the majority of people who believe that we shouldn't be making the climate crisis worse by opening new coal and gas. I'm going to take the opportunity to run um, the chamber through the effect of the amendments that the Greens have been able to secure. So, firstly, we've stopped about half of those 116 new coal and gas projects from going ahead. And as I mentioned before, it's because we've secured a hard cap on pollution, which means that pollution has to actually go down, can't go up, and the coal and gas corporations can't buy their way out of it which will mean that many of those 116 new projects in the investment pipeline simply cannot go ahead. Secondly, um, we have secured a legislated hard cap on pollution. Before we start a negotiation, real pollution under the safeguard could rise and coal and gas emissions were forecast to go up. For the first time, we can be assured that pollution will go down and not up. Pollution must fall and offsets won't count to stay under the cap. The polluters can't buy their way out of this hard cap. Thirdly, we've secured a pollution trigger to stop coal and gas projects. For the first time in history, the government must assess the impact that new coal and, go new coal and gas projects will have on the climate. If a new project is going to lift overall pollution, they must act to stop it going up, including by restricting or stopping the project. If they don't act, they'd be breaking the law. This is a huge barrier to new coal, oil and gas projects proceeding. Fourthly, we've derailed, derailed the proposed Beedaloo Basin gas field, which I just referred to. We've derailed that mass fracking of that carbon bomb. And the reason for that is that the project will now face an extra cost of an estimated $1 billion a year, as they're forced to offset all of their emissions. All. This is a huge financial barrier in the way of a project uh, proceeding by forcing them to be net zero from day one, and it brings its viability into serious question, which we celebrate. We've derailed, derailed the proposed Barossa gas field. 
Tiwi Islanders fighting this project will have received a huge boost, as now Santos will be required to offset all of its CO2 emissions, placing again a huge financial hurdle in the way of this dirty and unwanted project that does not have First Nations consent. Um, the sixth thing we were able to achieve through our negotiations is to require new offshore gas fields to be net zero. New gas fields feeding existing LNG plants will require their CO2 emissions to be net zero, again putting further hurdles in the way of new gas. We've stopped dodgy offset projects. We've helped stop the greenwashing of the safeguard mechanism, low integrity offset offset projects generating human-induced regeneration ACUs, or Australian Carbon Credit Units, will be stopped until they go through an independent audit. This could take up to a quarter of future offsets out of circulation. This will force more on-site pollution cuts from companies. And companies will also have to report on and justify their use of offsets to make it easier to fight corporate greenwashing. We've stopped coal and gas funding. The Industry Research and Development Act, which is the law that the Liberal and National Parties use to hand out millions in fossil fuel subsidies and grants to projects such as the Beedaloo, will be changed to ban coal and gas funding. The new Powering the Regions Fund also cannot be used to fund coal and gas. And in fact, about an hour ago, uh, we successfully stopped the National Reconstruction Fund being used to fund new coal and gas as well. We've limited toxic methane. Methane, as I hope people know, is a more damaging global warming gas than even carbon dioxide, and it's the main pollution from coal, mi coal mines. Methane monitoring of coal and gas projects will now be toughened, leading to deeper cuts again in pollution. We've secured sector-by-sector -sector pathways to net zero. The Climate Change Authority will have to provide advice um, on the development of net sectoral transition and emission pathways for the purposes of guiding future policy and investment decisions. And by detailing sectoral pathways to net zero, it will be much harder for new coal and gas projects to be financed. So coal and gas have taken a big hit thanks to the amendments secured by the Greens, but the fight is far from over. We were demanding no new coal, oil and gas. The UN Secretary General and the IPCC and the International Energy Agency were demanding no new coal and gas. That is what science requires. We just got a lecture on the laws of the economy. Well, I, I see you and I raise you the laws of physics. You can't argue with the climate crisis. And it's not going to be fooled with the dodgy accounting tricks that we saw under this original version. I'm so pleased we've been able to um, strengthen this mechanism, and I'm so pleased that with this hard cap, we will now have prohibited about half of those 116 coal and gas projects from proceeding. That is a great first step, but we are coming for the rest. We have now given the government the ability to assess the climate pollution of all of these projects. And we will be um, urging them, every single proposed project, to reject it, as I am sure will the community, will anyone who cares about a livable future, um, and will side by side with First Nations communities, we will fight every single one of those remaining coal and gas projects. And we will fight side by side coal workers and gas workers in existing communities who want an economic future who want a diverse future for their region and who want a say in what comes next as the world continues to turn away from dirty fuels and embraces clean energy. And my colleague, Senator Penny Oldman Payne, has done some wonderful work in that regional transition um, space, and we hopefully we'll have some good announcements to make um, in months to come on that. But we're all in this together, and I am sick of the fossil fuel companies buying the outcomes that suit their private profits, buying off the people in this place. It's not a democracy. It's been a, a, a plutocracy until, uh, until now. And I'm so pleased that the fossil fuel companies are hopping mad about these changes. It was so, um, it was so heartening to see their stocks fall yesterday, particularly Tamboran, the um, company mostly behind the Beedaloo Basin. Uh, I look forward to genuinely making that transition to a 100 per cent clean renewable economy with all of the jobs, all of the hope and all of the prosperity that that can provide to Australians and the world. Um, we've taken a step along the way. It's certainly not enough, but it's a step in the right direction.
Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Green. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm very pleased to rise to speak on this bill. Um, and I think from the outset, I think as the, the first government speaker on this bill, um, an important piece of legislation for us to pass. I might, um, I think, I think I can characterise the debate that we'll be having over the next couple of hours and maybe over the next couple of days. We are probably going to hear quite a lot of scaremongering from those opposite, even though they had 10 years and an opportunity to do something when it came to delivering energy policy. They failed to do that and they haven't negotiated with us on this um, legislation. Um, so they're going to sit there and scaremonger and talk about all the things that they could have, would have, should have done um, but didn't do. Um, and respectfully to my colleagues at the end of the chamber, I think we'll have some, some overselling of some of the things that they um, claim that they negotiated through. Um, uh, and I, I hope that they are genuine and um, reflect the actual impact of those amendments and how they will be um, uh, used by um, the re regulators and by the ministers um, uh, to achieve this outcome. Um, and I hope that we don't see um, mischaracterisation of those amendments. Um, but I think we know there's a political objective here to, to claim that um, more was won uh, through, this, through this process than what, um, what was actually achieved. What I do know from a government point of view is that this is government legislation. We're proud to be bringing it to the... To the um, to the parliament and that um, without a Labor government, we wouldn't be seeing any action on climate change at all. Uh, this is a critical element of the Albanese Labor government's comprehensive effort to address climate change. This legislation provides long awaited certainty and vision for Australia's response to climate change. It is an opportunity to reduce emissions from our biggest emitters for the very first time in a decade. Our policy is reasonable and sensible and consistent with the commitments that we made at the election. Ten long years have been wasted up until this point. It's precious time that we can't get back, which is why the passage of this bill is so urgent. We know that industry has been calling for this policy to be settled for far too long. Manufacturers and heavy industry particularly have been crying out for stability and certainty in the energy space, and today we're delivering it. Because we know that jobs and our environment rely on this certainty. The passage of this legislation will also give certainty to regional Australians who have been left in a holding pattern for far too long. Farmers who see the impact physically manifest in their own backyards, their workplaces. They deserve certainty and ambition. Regional workers who have powered our nation for decades. They deserve clarity on what our changing energy environment will mean for the jobs that they have now and the jobs they have in the future. Because let's be clear about this. This is a world of opportunity for regional industry in renewables and modern manufacturing. First Nations communities also deserve our urgent and comprehensive action. Too often, they are the communities on the front lines of climate change. I have spoken many times before in this chamber about the Torres Strait, and it's worth repeating in this debate today. On my last visit to the Torres Strait, I spent time with Councillor Hilda Mosby in Masik. Masik is one of the islands that makes up the Torres Strait. It is a beautiful, abundant home for a strong community of leaders, fishers and teachers. But Councillor Mosby took me on a drive around the perimeter of the island and showed me some of the areas of concern at risk of climate damage. Right now, Masik, the Masik community is quite literally contending with the loss of some areas of the island which have profound cultural significance. This is the case for the Torres Strait. There is no time to waste. And yet, in this parliament, under the former government, we wasted 10 years. In fact, for the Torres Strait Islanders, our climate response should have been settled many yesterdays ago. This is the case for many communities across the country many types of people who just want to see an end to the climate wars. They await our action with understandable, anxious impatience. This is not to say that we want to deliver hasty or sloppy policy. This is a reform that has been widely consulted and it has broad support from across the economy and the community. It is never easy to make significant changes and keep everyone in the tent, but it has always been our government's approach to listen, to take expert advice, 
to find points of agreement and to deliver on our commitments. This policy is about sharing the load of this effort across our economy. It was carefully designed to cut pollution in our biggest industrial emitters while being mindful of the need to minimise costs and allow flexibility for the least cost abatement opportunities to be deployed. It will provide strong investment signals and provide a balanced scheme that is effective, equitable and simple. On the other hand, we know that the former government left this policy in a state of chaos. A decade of inconsistent policy making demonstrated to Australia that the world that the former government lived in was plagued by inconsistency and disunity. For almost a decade in government, and still now, they couldn't agree on a target or a mechanism to deliver it. They hid power prices rises from the Australian people before the election. They vetoed job creating renewable energy jobs just because they didn't like renewable energy. They had 22 energy policies during their time of government. 22. And really, they couldn't land a single one. And why? Well, we know that they are opposing this bill again, why they are scaremongering and making baseless claims. It's because fundamentally they're opposed to action on climate change and they want to continue the climate wars. On this side of the chamber, we're happy to talk about the facts of this policy, the things that it will do, the jobs that it will protect and the jobs that it will create. We're not interested in dealing in scaremongering or talking about things in the concept of climate denialism. You'll see that from other members in this chamber. You'll see that from um, uh, members of the Liberal National Party. But this is um, our government's response to climate action. We are reducing emissions. We are working with industry. We are delivering funding to the regions. We are ensuring that our government delivers on the commitments that it took the, to the election. And we are doing this by taking the community and industry and businesses and workers with us. This is what Labor governments do. And only Labor governments can do this important work. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on the Safeguard Mechanisms uh, Crediting Amendment Bill 2023. And despite its name, uh, what is going to become very, very apparent uh, throughout the course of this debate is there is nothing safe about this bill. Mm -hmm. In the first instance, what do we know? Well, what we know is the green tail is yet again wagging the Labor dog. Now, why do we say that? Well, because we've seen a big announcement that a dirty deal has yet again, yet again been done with the Australian Labor Party and the Australian Greens. The government has yet again, because it is the green tail wagging the Labor dog, capitulated to the demands of the Greens. But in capitulating to the demands of the Greens, what has the government actually done? Well, it is literally ensuring an energy crisis for our country. Now, I know that Senator Dunningham, in leading the debate from the opposition side, would love to have spoken about the dirty deal that's been done with the Australian Greens. But as he reminds me, despite Senator Waters standing up and talking about the deal, talking about the amendments that are going to be moved, I have to say what is so disappointing in coming to this debate of what is an incredibly complex piece of legislation, not one amendment has been tabled by either the government or the Australian Greens. And you have the audacity to say that we are not participating in this debate in good faith. Let me be very, very clear. Those of us on this side of the chamber actually support action on climate change. Yep. In fact, not only do we support action on climate change, we have a track record in government of delivering on action on climate change. But guess what we will never, ever do? Tell us. We will never support doing it like those on the other side are about to do tonight and tomorrow by putting in place economy-wrecking measures like this terrible bill does. Shame. When I reflect on the nine years that we had in government, our record is very clear. Our record stands. We have been able to reduce emissions, 
to reach a cleaner future, but at the same time, and this is the balance that those on the other side just don't have any regard to, ensuring Australia remains strong, prosperous and independent. So let's look at what we did manage to achieve. The economy, whilst achieving emissions reductions, was still able to grow by 23 per cent over nine years in office. We met and exceeded Australia's Kyoto targets. We signed Australia on to achieving net zero by 2050, and we reduced emissions by over 20 per cent on our 2005 base level. In fact, what that did is put Australia well on track to meet and beat our Paris Treaty commitments. So guess what? You actually can take action on climate change, but at the same time do it responsibly so that you don't destroy the economy. Because you see, when you destroy the economy, you actually destroy jobs. And what we are seeing now as the bill is now being debated in the Australian Senate, is quite literally major coal companies have come out tonight, it's been reported, and they are warning. They're warning this, and these are the people that would know what the impact of this legislation is going to have the experts. on the experts. The experts, they're saying this. They're warning that Albanese, Anthony Albanese's deal with the Greens to pass Labor's signature climate policy is a carbon tax by stealth, and this is the problem, though, that will drive up energy prices, destroy jobs and kill foreign investment. That is a recipe for disaster. That is what the experts are saying. It will drive up energy prices, destroy jobs and kill foreign investment. Whitehaven, New Hope, Bowen Coking Coal and Peabody Australia, they have condemned Labor's 11th hour safeguard mechanism shake-up amid concerns, and this is them talking, those who would know the experts, as Senator Dunningham said, the changes would damage prosperity and make it harder and more expensive to reduce emissions, which is a little ironic yes. given the purpose of the bill yep. is to reduce emissions. Now, this is what's so interesting about these companies. They collectively represent $15 billion worth of fossil fuel projects and count billions of dollars of investment in their pipeline. Now, investment in their pipeline actually means more jobs, but let's not worry about that. Yep. And they actually say this as well. The government's proposed amendments will make Australia uncompetitive. So you go back to driving up energy prices, destroying jobs and killing foreign investment with the assessment being that this bill, if and when it passes, and we know it will because a dirty deal has been done, will actually make Australia uncompetitive. Who in their right mind would not listen to the experts who are saying that Australia is going to become uncompetitive? You're actually going to drive up energy prices, destroy jobs and kill foreign investment, unless, quite frankly, you're an ideological zealot and you actually did not care about the impact of this bill on Australia and Australians. Because, as I said, you see, when we were in government, we did take action on climate change. But I tell you, we'd never take action on climate change that compromised Australians' jobs, compromised their cost of living in terms of being unable to turn their lights on. Correct. I mean, how many, how many reports do you need to hear as a government ten months in, of people having to choose between turning their lights on and eating, between turning their lights on and paying their mortgage, between turning their lights on and paying the school fees. And yet, Senator Hughes, you are right. It is not even yet winter. What are you going to say to those people? You made certain promises to them prior to the election, promises that they took in good faith and they actually voted for the one promise, which they're never going to get back, that you would actually reduce your energy bills by $275. And instead, this is what we are now seeing. And this is before this bill goes through. Electricity prices are continuing to spiral out of control under Labor, with new increases of up to 23.7 per cent 
for households, that money just doesn't fall into their pockets by accident. They've got to go and find that additional money. 25.7 per cent increase for small businesses. Again, small businesses are battling as it is. Where do they find an additional 25.7 per cent on their energy bill? What's worse is, though, the proposed increases to the default market offer. That's actually going to directly affect around half a million households across Australia. And guess what? They're not going to be better off. No. They're not going to be better off. They are going to be worse off. And what you'd think is it was the opposition actually putting this forward. It's not us at all. This is the analysis that has been undertaken. The proposed increases to the default market offer will ensure that more than half a million households across Australia will be worse off. Now, if you're in New South Wales, up to $564 per year. So much for electing the Albanese government who told you they would actually lower, lower your energy bills. Well, that's not happening. You're not getting the $275 taken off. But the actual increase in the default market offer means you're going to be worse off by up to $564 a year in New South Wales, $485 a year in South Australia and $383 a year in South East Queensland. I mean, seriously. And this isn't the only thing that's breaking people's bank. More than 100,000 small businesses will also be impacted by the increase in bills by up to $1,151 a year. Again, I don't know where these small businesses find this additional money. Yeah. It gets worse, though. It gets worse. This comes on top of increases announced by, in Victoria by an average of 31.1% for households and an enormous 33.2 per cent for small businesses. That is yet another on top of 400,000 families and 55,000 businesses that will be hit by unprecedented price rises. What do you think is going to happen? What do you honestly think is going to happen when the major coal companies are actually saying to you, we are the experts and guess what? The bill that you are going to pass, in fact, it's not the bill you're going to pass, it's actually going to be way worse yep. because we haven't actually seen the amendments. It's going to be way worse. And we heard Senator Waters give us a bit of an outline that this is only step one. Uh, step two, three, four, and five are well and truly on their way. But you are going to pass a bill that, in addition to all of the price rises that are currently being felt because of decisions that you are making, and your failure to understand one word when it comes to gas, and that is supply, you get more supply into the market, is how you actually put the downward pressure on the prices. But you don't know that. But you are actually going to pass a bill that the companies themselves are saying will drive up energy prices, destroy jobs and kill um, foreign investment. Uh, coal Australia's largest export industry. Uh, sorry, with, Australia, uh, with coal Australia's largest export industry, this is what's been said: global coal demand is at the highest level in history, and it's fanciful to think that reducing our high-quality, note high-quality exports in the face of record demand will do anything other than drive up energy and steel prices, create a net increase in global emissions. Well, that's a great result for everybody here when they yeah, cross well to the other side of the chamber and support the bill. Excellent. You could actually drive up energy and steel prices, yeah, well create a net well done, increase yeah, in global well emissions, but on top of that, destroy Australian jobs both in regions and in cities. Again, I'm not quite sure what you are seeking to achieve with this bill. It is possible to take action on climate change. It is possible to take action to reduce emissions, but at the same time balance the economy, balance increasing productivity, balancing ensuring Australians are not being subjected to record high energy prices, ensure that Australians are not losing their jobs. But again, you can only think that you are ideological zealots who don't care about the economy, who don't care about the average Australian, who don't care about 
the increasing costs that they are actually seeing on a daily basis. And then I look at my home state of Western Australia. President of Peabody Australia's operations has said this. The company is concerned the legislation would make the mining industry less competitive at a time when it's integral to providing the minerals and energy required for the energy transition. Again, mining and resources, an integral part of our economy. And you've got the president of Peabody's Australian operations saying you're going to make the mining industry less competitive. What else can you make less competitive yes. in this country? Seriously. It's the Midas touch in reverse, though. Everything you touch, you are making less competitive. Everything you touch, you're actually increasing the price on. Every promise you made prior to the election, you are not standing by and you don't seem to care. People took you at your word when you made the promises to them. People took you at your word that you would tackle inflation, tackle interest rates, tackle the rising cost of living, tackle energy price increases. And yet, piece of legislation after piece of legislation after piece of legislation that is going through this place is doing nothing to tackle those increasing costs on Australians. And when you see, as I said, what the experts themselves are now saying, what the experts themselves are now saying. This piece of legislation is going to have a detrimental impact on the Australian economy. Disaster. It is going to have a detrimental impact on jobs. It is going to have a detrimental impact on energy prices. It is going to, as the experts say, make Australia a less competitive place to do business. But that's the lot that we now live in in Australia. You are walking lockstep, yet again, history is about to repeat itself, yes, it with the Australian Greens. And the sad thing is we'll see in the future what suffering this bill brings to the Australian people. We'll see it in the future how this bill wrecks our economy and how it makes life more difficult for all Australians. So to those on the other side, in concert with the Australian Greens, shame on you. You should hang your heads in shame. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the IPCC sounded a final warning alarm on the climate crisis. This crisis began over 250 years ago in this country with colonisation. Climate change and its root causes cannot be separated from colonisation. First Nations people are hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change, yet they have benefited the least from the dirty, polluting industries that this bill targets. Industries that have generated trillions of dollars of stolen wealth, all at the cost of polluting and killing our lands, our waters and our skies. We are in a climate crisis, though I would like to remind you all that the majority of First Nations people have been in crisis every day since colonisation. As we have been pushed off our land and forced to stand back and watch the colonial project destroy our lands and waters in the pursuit of extracting fossil fools, fuels. And for this reason, there can be no climate justice without First Nations justice. The UN Secretary General has called last week's report a final warning, a code red for humanity, a clarion call to do everything, everywhere, all at once. How many times have we heard such urgent and desperate calls to action only to fall on deaf ears. Every new report, he is forced to come up with new words to try to convey the urgency and seriousness of this message. And yet, every time this happens, 
The Australian government ignores this message and continues to bleed this land dry and pollute its waters and skies. This land is our mother and we are killing her. Every time a new coal pit is dug, she is wounded. Every new fracking well that is driven into her veins, she bleeds. I appreciate the government's efforts to cut emissions and bring forward the decarbonisation of heavy polluting industries. I commend the work of the Greens in securing an agreement which makes this bill and its rules something to not be completely ashamed of, which is what most climate bills in the last three decades have been. With the agreed changes, we will finally see genuine cuts to emissions in the biggest industries that are responsible for 30 per cent of our domestic emissions, not to mention all the emissions that occur overseas from exported products. I support the agreed changes that the Greens have secured and have been in conversation with the government around some additional changes to go one step further in their climate action and ensuring First Nations people do not get left behind. Beedaloo. This is particularly in relation to fracking in the Beedaloo. I have heard from First Nations people across the continent about the harms posed by fracking and their unanimous opposition to these dirty projects. First Nations people have resisted the extraction of fossil fuels, especially fracking, for decades. First Nations people across the Beetaloo right now are desperately calling for fracking to stop and for the protection of their cultural heritage. And yet, Rather than listen to the voices of grassroots First Nations people, this government has not yet ruled out supporting fracking in the Beedaloo. A recent Freedom of Information exposed a secret report to the National Indigenous Australians Agency that concluded that traditional owners in the Beedaloo Basin won't benefit economically, socially, or culturally from fracking their country. This FOI also stated that traditional owners are at a clear disadvantage when negotiating with gas giants. Anyone who has actually spoken to any First Nations people in the Beedaloo region will tell you about the manufactured consent that has been obtained by land councils and how hard it is for them to have their basic rights upheld. When it comes to Beedaloo, the government has stated publicly that it is committed to implementing recommendations 9.8 of the PEPA scientific inquiry into fracking in the Northern Territory, which ensures the gas industry is required to offset all scope one and two and domestic scope three emissions. I support the government and the Greens ensuring that all scope one emissions will need to be offset and the referral of scope two and three in the Beedaloo to the Ministerial Climate Change and Energy Council. However, this does not go far enough. I foreshadow that I will move a second reading amendment seeking assurance from the government that following the review by the Council that they will ensure scope to emissions in the Beedaloo will need to be offset. Fracking the Beedaloo makes no sense from a climate point of view, but most importantly that there is still no consent from the First Nations people. Given the clear disadvantage of traditional owners when negotiating with gas giants 
and their almost unanimous opposition to fracking, which came out of the recent FOI report, this government must prevent any further activity in the Beedaloo until and unless genuine, free, prior and informed consent has been obtained. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands Is that racism? Is that racism? Can I just call out racism in this chamber right now, please? Chair, President, call it out. Point of order. An accusation sorry, made in this chamber, Senator and I would Thorpe, like Senator sorry, Thorpe Senator to withdraw. Thorpe, just, sorry, Senator Hughes, you have a point of order? Yes, Senator. Uh, well, I'd just like to point out that Senator Thorpe has just made a comment about me that I think she should withdraw in its inference. Well, in fact, it's direct calling. Senator Thorpe? What? What are you asking me to do? President, what are you asking me to do? Uh, Senator Thorpe, I've just had you a point of order it? that you actually made. Um, I, d I did hear what uh, Senator Hughes said. And, and you don't see that as racist? Uh, well, that is not my, my call to make. However, I, are you making a point of order? I'm making a point of order that I'm in my workplace and I don't need racists being racist to me while I'm reading my speech. Can you please make sure that I am not targeted with racism while I'm trying to do my job, please? Senator Thorpe, uh, Senator Hughes. I don't think it's appropriate for Senator Thorpe to be referring to anyone in this place as racist, and I would ask her to withdraw. I would ask her to withdraw. Senator, that is absolutely inappropriate, and I will not be referred to by you as anything, Senator, let alone Senator that. Hughes, you take need your to seat. Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes. Senator Hughes, you are not helping, and you. Senator Hughes and Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe and Senator Hughes. Thank you. Now, Senator Thorpe, I did not. I heard what Senator Hughes said, and I didn't uh, hear anything uh, that was. No. Now, what I will ask is, uh, so Senator Thorpe, if you would like, if you would like a review of the Hansard, um, then we can certainly. I can certainly ask for a review of the Hansard. I would like that, please, because I will not stand for racist racism Se in Senator my workplace. Thorpe, you are not helping the situation by repeating that claim about Senator Hughes. I would ask that you withdraw that imputation. I will, not I will not withdraw until you understand that I've just been racially vilified while I'm reading my speech. Senator Thorpe. So, Minister. Um, I think if it might assist the chamber, there's obviously a disagreement that's gone on here. I think your suggestion that um, the Hansard be reviewed um, and um, that the president or, or yourself come back to the chamber at a later date might be the best way to facilitate this evening. Senator Hughes. Well, I would like to just make the point that uh, the constant reference to Australians who are born here from a different heritage referred to as colonisers is not helpful in so, any okay, way. So, so perhaps we need to refer to the Hansard in more way than okay. one. So Senator Hughes and Senator Thorpe, uh, I will confer with the President and also the Clerk, and we will review the Hansard and we will come back and report back to the Senate. Thanks. Senator Thorpe. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I appreciate that. Can I continue to read my speech? You have the call. Thank you. I was at that I was acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waters, air and sky of what we now call the Beetaloo and Connected Basins. The traditional owners are still protecting country from desecration and they come from many nations. 
and clans, but they have come together to fight for country. What do you know? I salute them and I 100 per cent support them. And everyone in this place must listen to their voices. They are standing united against the desecration of their lands, poisoning of their waters. They fight for country like their ancestors, their lawmen and women, and how our old people have always looked after this country before the colonisers come, before they rocked up on their boats. Through my amendments to the second reading and committee of the whole, I am bringing their fight into this chamber, not outside, into this chamber. And I hope to get support from all of you on this, or some. My second reading amendment also seeks to ensure that First Nations people are given opportunities in carbon offset projects. While I am of the view that we should be cutting emissions as much as possible and as quickly as possible before using offsets, I recognise that there are genuine land-based solutions to drawing down carbon. This includes First Nations management of country, including sea country. This includes but is not limited to savannah burning. It involves cultural burns, managing feral animals like wild boars and land regeneration. Projects on sea country include but are not limited to the cultivation and harvesting of seaweed and kelp. Our people have been farming seaweed since time immemorial for food, fibre and medicine. Seaweed farming also offers opportunities for reducing methane emissions in agriculture by using seaweed as a supplement in cattle feed. I will seek to ensure that First Nations people are at the forefront of leading these projects in their own waters. This amendment also calls on the government to ensure their support for First Nations-led verification assessments in carbon sequestration projects. This means that First Nations people can assess the environmental, social and cultural values of carbon farming and sequestration projects. This must also be paired with investment in training for these purposes in First Nations communities and in all First Nations communities, including mob in regional and remote areas and on missions and reserves. I will continue working with the government and hope to get their support for this amendment look forward to continue working with the government and others in this parliament to ensure that First Nations justice remains at the core of climate action in this country. Thanks. Um, Senator Thorpe, just before you go, can you just uh, confirm that you've moved your second reading amendment, please? I move my second reading amendment. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Um, I'm just going to make a very brief contribution this evening. I've spoken about the safeguard mechanism numerous times um, over the last number of months, and uh, I don't uh, propose to rehash any of that. Um, as the chair of the uh, Senate Environment and Communications Committee, um, I chaired the inquiry into this bill, and I can assure you that the contributions that we heard from industry, from environment and climate groups, from business, from emitters, uh, were much, much, much more balanced than what we are hearing in this chamber tonight. So I would strongly suggest that people switch off and go and read the report from the committee, which has a much more balanced approach, which draws directly from the people who came and spoke about the um, safeguard mechanism and it does actually probably give you a much better view of what's actually going on here than what we're hearing, particularly from those opposite. 
I'd also like to take the opportunity to commend uh, Minister Chris Bowen and his team for their tireless work to achieve something that so many of us have been aching for for well over a decade. Thank you very much. I do commend people to this bill. It is a fair bill, it is a balanced bill, and it is an essential bill. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam President. Well, Labor has effectively caved to the Greens' demands on the safeguard mechanism and said goodbye to both coal and gas in this country. They've given in to placing a card cap within the mechanism which hamstrings the majority of coal and gas projects into becoming unviable under the mechanism's reduction target. Now, we know those up there will celebrate that, but for those of us that live in the real world, we actually have to deal with the fallout of those things. Uh, and what we need to remember, though, about these targets as well is that they'll be just ratcheted down on a whim. These are targets that are going to eventually come for other industries. So businesses, I'd say to you, even if you're not in the sector at the moment that's being uh, impacted here, you shouldn't be fooled that you are immune to these radical agendas. It would be nice if some of the industries did project some metal, find some metal and come out publicly against this policy and certainly reflect what they're saying in many, many senators' offices uh, on this side of the chamber and come out and say that publicly rather than being too scared to stand up to this new government. Uh, and uh, they're at the moment hiding behind the fact that uh, not their chicken, not their chicken coop. But let me be very clear, it will be soon enough. In fact, the Energy Minister spoke with Andrew McCormick on Triple J's hack a couple of weeks ago about the safeguard mechanism. He said, and I quote, this isn't just about coal and gas. It's about aluminium. It's about steelmaking. It's about fertilisers. It's about the two airlines and it's about old and new. So if you think about it for a second and you think that you won't eventually be caught up in this extreme ideology, you will. The only safe spaces are the solar and wind industries, who this government sits in the back pocket of. And surprise, surprise, those industries have been monopolised by China, as well as all of the relevant resources, cobalt and lithium. Now, we've tried to make this government realise there is a way to, cake, to have your cake and eat it too in this space, but we do know that it's in Labor's DNA to play big government and make demands of all Australians, their way or the highway. They're not here to serve you. They know what's best for you and their contempt is palpable. This plan is going to lead to an offshoring of emissions, carbon leakage, plain and simple. This plan is bad for the economy and it's bad for the environment. In order for Australia to decarbonise our economy, we actually should be trying to get the balance right. And that's the balance between cutting emissions and allowing the economy to grow. When people are already paying more for everything, from fuel to groceries through to household and building materials, this plan, this deal, will see those prices continue to skyrocket. As a nation, we actually are already in the midst of an energy crisis and a cost of living crisis. This plan, under the safeguard mechanism reform, will ultimately hurt Australians on both of these issues. It sets Australia up for an even worse energy crisis in the years to come, as some of our key industries buckle under the pressure of mandatory abatement and increased running costs. It doesn't matter if it's the ACCC or the market operator. The Australian government has been told time and time again that the energy crisis we face as a nation is due to a lack of supply. But of course, those that sit opposite this government, they know better. They believe they can still do a deal with the Greens that will actually restrict supply further. This will make it harder for the Australian economy. It certainly won't decarbonise the Australian economy nor the global economy. You want to do what you can to support Australian industry. But unfortunately, this deal with the Greens is about trying to decapitate some of our most important industries just in order to get this ridiculous, nonsensical and, quite frankly, dangerous safeguard mechanism through. 
And we know that this is the most punitive carbon tax in the world, Bonanam, but don't be fooled, it's a carbon tax. It's exactly what it is. And it is the most punitive carbon tax in the world, both in the level of emissions reduction and the carbon pricing. And this scheme, surprise, surprise, hasn't been successful anywhere else in the world. And our pricing isn't even competitive with those international prices. And so one might ask, what's going to keep businesses here? Well, it's not. You are in the process. You should be very proud of yourself if this is what you were aiming for. You are going to be sending Australian jobs and industries to China and India, who are in fact, and I mean, I know this might require some intellectual fortitude and it's not the strength of some of those that sit at the end of the chamber. I think we've seen that regularly. But these are some of the world's biggest emitters, four to five times greater than us. So that's great news for the environment in real terms, that the Greens are actually now privy to sending off more emissions, to contributing more emissions to the world through their absolute fantasy land ideology that somehow this safeguard mechanism and the concessions that they've got is going to make one iota of a difference to a country and their emissions that currently supplies 1.3 per cent of uh, emissions globally. But I mean, that, that would be in the uh, left wing morality triangle that we know at the top sits solar and wind. Uh, economic management, but protecting jobs and protecting industry, we know sits somewhere to the bottom. I'm not quite sure if it's second bottom because, you know, abusing conservative women, I think, is probably their most, uh, one of the things they care most about doing, followed by killing off Australian jobs and small business. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's not their issue because the Greens and the activists can cheer and coo for a brief moment when they feel that they've saved the planet before the sun gets blotted out by the increased emissions offshore in Asia. Oh, if only we hadn't let our ideology get in the way of reality. Who could have predicted this? Well, I'll tell you what, everyone that sits on this side of the chamber could have predicted this for you. And there are sensible measures we could take. There's a plethora of technologies and energy sources we should be considering in the medium to long term. But this is what happens when you are motivated by fear or alarmism or ideology. No coal, no gas, no nuclear, no baseload, no clue. When you keep saying the end is nigh, despite the science that you claim to follow, you are forced into rushing into half-baked policies that do more harm than good. And this is the problem when you legislate and force a free market into subservience to the state. When it's enshrined in law, it's very difficult to unwind. And this is a government who wants to make renewables 82 per cent of its energy mix by 2030. They're all cosied up with their renewable friends. For getting to achieve that 82 per cent, we need to see a growth of renewables of 1 per cent per month. So perhaps that's why Premier Dan Andrews is over in China, cosying up to his Chinese mates, seeing what support he can get for the government. Chris Bowen also, though, said on Hack a few weeks ago, and I quote again, as much and as fast as we're transitioning to renewables, the coal-fired power stations will close down and come out of the system. That means you've really only got nuclear and gas. We're anti-nuclear. I don't think nuclear stacks up, and that means you need to make that sure that your gas supply is reliable. So hang on, let me just get this straight. 82% of our energy mix will be overwhelmingly renewables, but he acknowledges that we're still going to need a baseload, reliable supply, Coal's gone, nuclear's out under this government. So if he acknowledges that's the case, it's going to be gas that keeps the lights on at night, keeps industry powering ahead. Well, if he, believe, if he actually does believe that, then why is he backing a policy that specifically targets coal and gas companies to significantly reduce their supply and scale back their operations? Why is he crippling the very thing that he says is our only hope? Because this government is at the beck and call of the Radical Greens, the renewable industry and its global partners. It is never about Australian businesses or the consumers who are doing it tough for those on the other side. It's all just numbers and targets, not lives and livelihoods. The Coalition has always taken a sensible approach. Our safeguard mechanism, before it was hijacked and corrupted, was designed to halt Australia's emissions at a steady level. So we could then get to work employing measures and policies in consultation with industry, actually speaking to the people that it's going to impact, 
to begin the task of reducing the nation's emissions while ensuring we could provide consumers with affordable, reliable base load power. And this is achieved through embracing many forms of clean or low emissions energy sources so that you can provide ample supply and competition to keep prices down and ensure the lights stay on. And despite the obvious flaws in wind and solar that we've spoken about for months and months, it is of course not in the interest of business in that space to bring other forms of energy to the table. They will have a total monopoly in a net zero world. And nobody in this debate is saying that the economy can't or shouldn't decarbonise. It's critical, and it must. But you have to have balance with that whilst allowing the economy to grow. You have to balance that with industry, with jobs, with manufacturing. I mean, the fact that we've just come out of a, an alleged manufacturing bill and, you know, on one hand they're saying, let's boost Australian manufacturing. On the other hand, but hang on, we're going to shut it down because you're not going to have any clinker from the cement. There's going to be no sovereignty in cement anymore. We won't be able to produce aluminium or steel. We're going to shut down all our coal mines so the manufacturers won't have reliable power. I mean... We, I mean, do you even sort of try and map that out in your own head? Do you try and work out that if you're turning the lights off and cutting out all our energy sources, making it more expensive and impossible for manufacturers to do business, that it doesn't matter how much money you put in a manufacturing fund, it ain't going to boost manufacturing. It's not going to boost manufacturing in China. It's going to boost manufacturing in India. It's certainly not going to be doing it in Western Sydney. It's not going to be doing it in the Hunter. All you're doing is sending jobs and businesses overseas. And the fact that you as a government have introduced what you, know, you refer to as your signature climate policy, but you haven't had Treasury or the department do any modelling on the impact. Or you know, maybe you have, but you don't want anyone to know what it is, so you won't, reduce it. You won't, you won't provide it to the public or anyone on this side of the House. And this actually should concern all Australians. So whether they've had the modelling done and it tells them what a disaster this is going to be, and so they're keeping it secret, well, they just haven't bothered to do it at all. And we can't get a straight answer one way or the other. And we know that the Greens were actually concerned about this modelling at one stage. They actually were asking questions. But somehow I've got a little bit of a feeling, may have heard through the grapevine of industries as they were coming to see us, they'd also been to see the Greens, they'd been to see others in desperation to make sure that their businesses wouldn't be so heavily impacted that they had to cut jobs, move their industries offshore. But just something tells me that perhaps the Greens have been showing this modelling, given how they've somehow shifted their support. So I guess same party who stood with us about a month ago asking for detail from the government, but of course these are the political games that they will play. They're not really interested in positive outcomes for the people in this country. They just want to appease their secret supporters and back alley beneficiaries. If indeed the minister talks about the challenge ahead being akin to the Industrial Revolution, you would think the government would have done extensive economic modelling on the impact of this policy on regional Australia, communities, industry and just you know, maybe a little bit of interest how many jobs are going to be impacted. But it hasn't done any of those things and therefore should not be surprised when the coalition that actually does sincerely believe that you should get the balance right between the economy and the environment when we start to say, well, actually, hang on, this doesn't stack up. These are policies imported from Europe, designed for European markets, and its energy mix. There is no one-size-fits-all approach in this space. What's good for Poland is not necessarily good for Perth. What's good in Sweden does not fit Sydney. So if you look at the reconstruction fund again, what we see is an ideological bias from government. It will decide what sectors are in and what sectors are out. And this is the problem with a Labor government. It's all about big government. Big government believe, means they believe they can steer the economy as a government, that industry and enterprise follow government dictates. And as we're continuing to see, prices will continue to skyrocket under this model like never before. This is a government who came to the Australian people and promised a 275 reduction in household power bills. Now they're going up hundreds of dollars right across Australia. And we found out just over a week ago it's going to go up continually between another 20 and 34 per cent. And that's just the second half of this year. This is a government who breaks promises, cannot deliver on any economic management it's proposed, 
and I have absolutely no faith that they will be able to get this right. The Labor Party has announced a plan to de-industrialise the Australian economy rather than decarbonise it. Prime Minister Albanese assured us his government would never do deals with the Greens. But how many broken promises can one government stack up? This government is certainly a record breaker in that regard. This is why we warned the Australian people against you. When you go vote Labor, you get the Greens too, the Watermelon Party. Uh, Senator Fruki. Thank you, President. <clears throat> I rise today to support this legislation, um, but I, I am doing so with a heavy heart. A heavy heart because of the missed opportunities this bill represents. That trying to get strong action from the Labor government on climate is akin to trying to draw blood from a stone. That in a progressive parliament where we could pass the strongest policies that protect the planet, which is what people have put us here to do, the best Labor can offer is a pragmatic compromise. My heart is heavy because once again science loses to big business and there is so much at stake. My love affair with nature started early in my life in Pakistan. My favorite two weeks of school summer holidays were spent in the Kagan Valley in the foothills of the majestic Himalayas. From the valley, we could see the tall snow-covered peaks of Chagori, K2, and Nanga Parvat. It was here I walked on glaciers, drank sweet water from ice-cold rivers fed by melting snow, and saw the sky reflecting from lakes so glassy that you couldn't tell where the sky ended and where the lake began. I climbed mountain slopes dense with tall pine trees and a carpet of pine needles under my feet and breathed in the crisp air laden with their scent. The scenery and smells have become part of my DNA. Scientists tell us that even if we limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C, more than 30% of glaciers along the Himalayan mountain range, including in my beloved Kagan Valley, will disappear by the end of this century. And once the snow vanishes, so will the rivers and the millions of people in Pakistan, India and other countries who rely on them for farming and food. Mighty nature won't disappear with a whimper, though. When the snow melts, it will cause havoc by flooding rivers and lakes, bursting their banks. It will consume the habitat of the endangered Barfani cheetah, the snow leopard, who has survived these harsh, harsh rugged mountains over millennia, but may not live through the human destruction of nature. Lives are already being lost. Villages have disappeared. People who've lived, worked, and played in the shadows of these mountains are being uprooted, forced to start again in new places, their connection to land and water severed forever. In June last year, I saw this country I grew up in underwater by a climate-charged super flood, the place where I've spent my childhood the place with so many happy memories, the place so many of my family and loved ones still call home, became the scene of an apocalyptic horror movie. A third of Pakistan, the world's fifth most populous country, was submerged. Up to 50 million people, double the population of Australia, were dispossessed. It is hard even to comprehend. Millions of homes were destroyed, thousands of acres of agricultural land were flooded, schools and hospitals were wiped out, thousands of people died. Women and girls were hardest hit. Nearly 700,000 pregnant women in Pakistan were deprived of maternal health care during the floods. Climate change is an issue of gender equity. Women are on the front line of climate disasters. As Fatima Bhutto recently wrote, there is no greater feminist cause than the climate fight and saving each other. As a feminist, as an environmentalist, the climate crisis is deeply personal for me. What happened in Pakistan was predictable and preventable. What happened in Pakistan will keep happening. The climate emergency has been here for some time now, and the sirens are blaring louder than ever. For those of us from the global south, there is a sad an infuriating sense of injustice when it comes to the climate crisis. Because this is a crisis caused by wealthy colonial countries of the global north, who have known now for decades that their greed and exploitation of nature is destroying the planet, but have refused to listen to the science and put humanity and the planet first. 
The Western world willfully ignores the fact that climate change, while affecting black and brown people disproportionately, also exacerbates existing injustices for these people who have been screwed over for centuries by colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism. Those who have contributed least to this terrifying climate emergency are experiencing the first and worst of it. They are on the front lines of a war waged by Western fossil fuel interests against the planet, a war they didn't start and can't win. Climate justice is a very personal struggle for me as a woman of color who grew up in Pakistan. Here in Australia, I've seen the relentless fossil fuel monster destroying country, whether it be coal mines at Bogabri gobbling up state forests, or at Narrabri where Santos's coal seam gas wells will rip through the Pilaga and then the pipeline through the Liverpool Plains. The environment, regional communities, and animals are bearing the brunt. The devastating 2019-2020 climate-induced bushfires harmed or killed three billion animals. It was one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history. The bushfires took the lives of 34 people. I knew one of them, a friend from John's River, whose home their dad built with his own hands was consumed along with her. So yes, the climate crisis is deeply personal for me. We are in the fight for and of our lives. Australia is one of the largest dealers of, the fossil, of fossil fuels that are driving the climate crisis. We are the third largest fossil fuel exporter. It doesn't matter where these fossil fuels are burned. Australian fossil fuels drive climate disasters everywhere. Australian fossil fuel exporters and the governments who are in their deep pockets have blood on their hands. That's the stark reality. It is unacceptable that the government is happy to take the revenue, but not the responsibilities for fossil fuel emissions. Pacific Islanders are already paying the price of Australia's inaction. Communities face rising sea levels, tropical storms, the loss of arable land and drinking water, and the enormous challenges of displacement due to the climate crisis. They are sick of Australia's inaction. Leaders from Vanuatu, Tonga, Fiji, Niue, Solomon Islands and Tuvalu told it like it is earlier this month. They said the Pacific will no longer accept the fossil fuel lie. We have the power and responsibility to lead, and we will. Pacific leaders called for the Paris Agreement to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C and have demanded an end to the development and expansion of fossil fuel extracting industries, starting with new coal mines. Last week, the IPCC released a final warning on the climate crisis, a survival guide for humanity. The world's top scientists put out a report that said the fossil fuel industry will end the planet unless we end it first. And still, labor keeps on defending this planet-killing industry. The world's leading climate scientists again call for an end to new coal and gas. We've been saying this until we are blue in the face. But that is not what Labour's safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2022 does. In its original form, Labour's bill merely touched up, tweaked, and ultimately tinkered around the edges of Tony Abbott's safeguard mechanism. The government blew its own horn and talked up its reforms like they were huge transformative policy that matched the scale of the crisis. The government claimed that after a decade of denial, Australia was finally getting strong action from a government that recognized the severity of the climate crisis. But the reality is the government policy was all smoke and mirrors. It was a plan for accounting tricks, not real cuts to pollution. It was a plan to hide emissions, not cut them. The Labour Party is no less captured by the fossil fuel interests than the coalition. It's just smarter about acknowledging that there is a climate crisis and that we need to fix it without fixing it. But Labour, like the coalition, won't listen to the science on climate when it comes to actual action. Labour's original safeguard bill was a hollow, empty package which allowed unlimited dodgy offsetting, a free-for-all for fossil fuel companies. Under Labour's initial climate plan, pollution would have gone up. Under Labour's plan to address climate change, the climate crisis would have gotten worse. The policy was practically written by the fossil fuel industry, 
The Greens may as well have been negotiating with Santos and Woodside. Labour's motivation throughout this process has been to safeguard the interests of the fossil fuel industry, and those interests are in direct conflict with the survival of our planet. So given Labour's determination to protect the fossil fuel industry, it's quite an achievement that the Greens could use our balance of power to push reforms. Most importantly, a cap on emissions that requires real, not net, emissions cuts. Amongst many other amendments, the Greens have also secured improvements to the integrity of offsets, which have been a dodgy con job for far too long. But the fight is far from over. The safeguards mechanism has been improved, but these changes are not nearly enough. The signs couldn't be clearer, and the urgency couldn't be greater. We need an end to new coal and gas. That is the bare minimum needed for the survival of life on our planet as we know it. The only obstacle to ending new coal and gas, the only obstacle to getting us off this dangerous trajectory of expanding fossil fuels and climate catastrophe is the Labour Party and the fossil fuel companies who fill their coffers, hold the cards, and whose bidding Labour does. I've not been shy about my view that the number one priority for the Greens in this negotiation was new coal and gas projects. But cowardly Labour took that off the table, making it clear that they were more interested in politics than science. While insufficient, this package will reduce pollution. We are in a situation where every fraction of a degree of warming must be avoided. So it is important that the improvements we have, we have made, are enacted. Labour should be under no illusions, though. There should be no backslapping or self-congratulation. Parliament today has not done the job of facing the climate crisis. The challenges are quite clear. One, we are in deep shit, shit on climate. Two, Labour's dogged allegiance to fossil fuel companies and their donations is the roadblock to climate action. Uh, Three. Um, Senator Fruki, just a moment. Senator Solomon. Yes, uh, uh, point of order. Uh, there was some unparliamentary language used in Senator mm -hmm. Fruki's remarks just then, and I asked you sure. to ask I, her to withdraw. I thought uh, Senator Fruki had corrected it, but um, Senator Fruki, if you made an unparliamentary remark, can you withdraw that, please? Sure. Three, how do we shift power so we can stop new coal and gas? Well, green billionaires ain't going to save us. So let's not buy into that, that myth. Billionaires are driven by profit. They are not here to save the world. And the big environmental NGOs must develop a backbone and actually influence the government, not the other way around. They must also decolonize to center the voices of the most marginalized by the climate crisis, First Nations people and people of color. From the TV islands to Narrabri, First Nations people are on the forefront of the struggle against fossil fuels, yet they are made invisible. I have always believed that the power lies with the people. The most powerful campaigns are those born around kitchen tables or at a local pub or a chat on the phone or a yarn under a tree. And I'm ready to build an even, even bigger grassroots climate movement in the streets to not only force labor to act, strongly, but if they don't, then let's get ready to wrest power off them at the next election. We need to get bolder and bolshier, because in 2023, there is only one test that matters when it comes to stopping the climate breakdown, an end to new coal and gas. And I'm ready for that fight. We can't rest or celebrate until we have achieved that. Thank you, Senator, Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, and uh, it's really good to be able to make a contribution on the safeguard bill. Um, it's a bit like transfer pricing um, in accountancy is emissions reduction, and that's because it's very hard to cut emissions. Order. There's too much chatter across Got some very the important remarks chamber. I'm finding here. it difficult to hear the contribution yeah. from Senator Bragg. And these are very Please important. go ahead. These are very important. Remarks. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah, I think as a reformed accountant, I often think about transfer pricing being very similar to reformed accountant um, of improving. I'm believing in self improvement over here. So, um, transfer pricing is a lot like emissions reduction, that it's very difficult for Australia to solve that problem on its own, which is why global agreements have been put forward uh, as the framework for this policy challenge. And I think that in the years gone by, it was very important that the Liberal Party in government decided to sign Australia up to net zero. Uh, and that happened at the COP in Paris in 2015 and then was uh, formalised and brought forward uh, at Glasgow. And uh, that has allowed, I think, the country to at least have a discussion about climate policy inside a sensible framework that the parties of government believe that climate change is a serious issue and emissions abatement is important. Uh, I think with that in mind, the country is in a much better position than it has been for many decades because uh, whilst the Howard government was an excellent government, um, I think in hindsight perhaps they had wished that they had signed up to Kyoto and that Australia had been at the table for all those various agreements. Uh, so I think we have a position in, a, in the country now where you have agreement on the macro direction um, in terms of the 2050 position, and then your only real disagreement is then uh, how fast can you get there, and so therefore what are your, what are your targets that you're going to have in the interceding period? And then as a subset of that, uh, what are the policies you're going to use or deploy to get emissions down? Now, uh, you know, unlike some of the very uh, kind and um, impressive people on the crossbench. Uh, we are a party of government and so we will develop a policy before the next election on emissions reduction, uh, which will also include the policy required to be deployed to cut the emissions. And those will be policies in transport, policies in electricity, policies in the industry. And this is one thing that we will look at, obviously, as part of that discussion. And the safeguard uh, will be a policy which uh, will be able to address industry emissions, and let's see where it gets to. Um, but the point is, as a party of government, the most important thing is that you have a long-term commitment to the global agreements which are required to cut emissions. Because unless you have a global framework, then this is pointless. And the points that have been made tonight in the chamber about exporting emissions, I think, are legitimate and can be sustained uh, by any reasonable person. I mean, there's no point in Australia exporting heavy industry uh, because that will result in loss of jobs here in Australia and that would be against our constituents' interests. But it would also be against their interests to be outside of the global framework and it would also be outside of their interests or against their interests, I should say, Acting Deputy President, not to consider the huge benefit that can accrue, particularly to regional Australia, if you have a proper decarbonisation agenda. And most of the new jobs, most of the new jobs in the decarbonised economy will of course be in regional Australia. Um, they won't be in Pitt Street or George Street in Sydney, although those are very nice parts of Sydney. That's not where the new jobs will be. The new jobs will be uh, in the Hunter and in the south coast, and they'll be in uh, parts of western New South Wales. That's where the jobs will be. And so we have to make sure that we calibrate the policy carefully to maximise investment in decarbonisation projects, but also maintain existing in industry as it can transition through. And I think particularly uh, uh, that is going to be essential over the next little while. So that is basically my view on that matter. And uh, I think we will have a good policy before the next election. I know Ted O'Brien, the member for Fairfax, is working on that. And I look forward to seeing what he comes up with as part of the uh, very good coalition team. Yes, Senator Sullivan. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I rise today to speak on uh, the safeguard mechanism uh, crediting Amendment Bill 2022 provisions. And uh, what this bill is all about is a demonstration of 
the fact that Labor are up to their old tricks, their old tricks here, leaving Australians in the dark and bringing in a very sneaky tax, a very sneaky tax, and a yet another dodgy deal with the Australian Greens. Um, we haven't seen the amendments that uh, have been agreed to by the government, the amendments that were proposed by the Australian Greens, and we're in here having a debate, really, in the dark about what's actually going to be happening here. But we do know, we do know that there's been a dodgy deal that's been done. A dodgy deal has been done. This amendment to the Safeguard Mechanism Bill, which, frankly, is butchering an otherwise uh, pretty sensible bill, a bill that was achieving uh, many, uh, many things and, uh, and was importantly driving down emissions, and this bill is just completely butchering it. Uh, they're hijacking a bill that was otherwise a good bill. Uh, it was initially put in place to track and cap emissions to one that now penalises businesses and supports taxes. Now, the coalition reduced emissions by over 20 per cent on our 2005 base level, beating our Kyoto targets and putting us on track to meet the Paris Agreement. And we did this without damaging the Australian economy. In fact, over that period, we grew it. The Australian economy grew and we met our targets. In fact, we beat our targets. But this lot over here, they, can't, uh, they cannot help themselves. Increasing the price of carbon dioxide to, 70, to carbon emissions to $75 and expected to rise by $100 by 2030. Now, this is three times higher than Labor's, the previous Labor government's carbon tax. And we all know how that went down in Western Australia, didn't we, Senator Brockman? West Australians knew that it was a dodgy deal back then, and guess what? They know it's a dodgy deal right now because it's going to cost jobs, particularly in my home state of Western Australia. This is a carbon tax by just another name. The price is higher than eight of Australia's ten top two-way trading partners. Labor simply refuses to tell Australians how its reforms to safeguard mechanism will impact families businesses and jobs. Now, in preparing for this legislative debate, I, I went back and read the Coalition Senators' dissenting report, a uh, very good report, and I commend it to the Senate. I encourage you to have a look at it as well. And I commend my uh, very good colleagues, uh, Senator Hughes Cadell, who is sitting here with me uh, tonight in the chamber, and Senator Dunham, who is also uh, their, their contribution here and the dissenting report is something that uh, everyone here should read. And in reading this report, what struck me is the consistent theme that we're seeing from this government in how it formulates public policy. I want to take you through it. The economic impacts have not been assessed, was one of the points they made. That the government has not provided sufficient information to the inquiry on the economic impacts of the reforms. Went on to say that this bill will result in further price increases for Australians. No witnesses to the inquiry were able to provide analysis of the economic impacts of the reforms to the safeguard mechanism. When requested, both the Minister for Climate Change and Energy and the Department for, of Climate Change, Energy and Environment and Water declined pr to provide the economic modelling that was undertaken. Now, does this sound familiar? Because this has been a pattern in how this government develops policy, brings it to this place and just <laughs> expects that the Senate and Parliament would pass it. We saw it with uh, the Secure, secure jobs, better pay. I sat through that inquiry, very short inquiry, though 22 days was all we had for that one. Sat through that, and we asked for whether any modelling has been done. No modelling had been done. Sat through the inquiry into the uh, cheaper childcare bill. Asked if the department had maybe done some modelling. Like, how many new places would that childcare? Bill create yes, of course. There's an extra subsidy that was going to, to families, but uh, you know, how many new places would it create? Oh, there's no modelling that was done on that. So we're spending four or five billion dollars on that program, and no, no new places were created. Like this is a pattern that's been followed by this government ever since they were elected. It just seems that they were elected just to rule rather than actually lead and rather than actually deliver the outcomes that Australians were expecting, the, the outcomes that you promised that you would deliver. 
and you're not doing that. You're just, you're just all talk. Now, recently, the government announced changes to the superannuation, which demonstrated two things with this government. The Treasurer is not driving economic policy, and the government likes to make it up on the run. And that's what we're seeing here with this bill. Now, is this government incompetent, or are they trying to hide something from the Australian people? I, a little of column A and a little column B, Senator Cadell suggests to me. I, I note in their appearance before the inquiry that the Minerals Council of Australia, who broadly support this bill and have committed to net zero by 2050, they said that the ACU market is an important part of the repurposed safeguard mechanism. They also said that the technology to help electrify their mine sites won't be available until late 2020 into 2030. Now, this policy, the, the, this, the implementation of this policy means that those projects have to start offsetting right now, like as soon as this bill passes, as soon as it receives royal assent. Well, they're not going to. If the technology is not there to actually enable them to deliver it, then what's going to happen? It's going to drive these businesses out of this country, and they're going to start shifting their projects offshore. They're going to start shifting their operations offshore because we're in we're an unstable place to be able to invest and, and run your business. Now, the policy needs to be implemented so that competition is not affected and leads to leakage to other countries. If it does. If it does hit the $75 price, it will certainly add to costs overall for industry. I mean, you basically just buy this policy, you're actually setting the price. The market will just lift to that price. I mean, that's just basic economics, that's just basic supply and demand, and you're setting the price. This is a dodgy tax. During the inquiry, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry confirmed business would pass their, their higher operating costs under the safeguard mechanism onto, onto consumers. And when questioned by my colleague, Senator Hughes, the Chamber said, this is an unfortunate consequence of the safeguard mechanism, but we believe that to achieve the emissions reductions targets, there will necessarily be some additional costs associated with it. Potentially, some of these costs will be passed on to consumers. Well, that's what's going to happen. Consumers are going to face increased costs as a result of this bill. There is no doubt about that. So let's stop this charade that Australian families will not be impacted with even higher costs of living pressures. I mean, that's the biggest issue that Australians are facing right now, the single biggest issue that all of us no doubt hear, and if we're not hearing it, then we're not listening. The biggest issue is the rising costs of living and how difficult it is for families households to make ends meet. And all this bill is going to do is increase the cost of living pressures on families. And while doing that, not actually make a difference in terms of the objectives of this bill, which is ultimately, presumably, to drive down emissions. Now the CEO of Origin Energy has said that electricity prices will jump by more than 20 per cent from July the first. Mr Calabria, or the Origin CEO, has said that 44 gigawatts of new renewables, 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines and 15 gigawatts of firming generation will be needed to meet Australia's 43 per cent 2030 emissions target. That's what they said in the Fin Review on the 9th of March uh, this, just this year. And on Monday, the Australian newspaper reported that the Greens had struck a deal with the government that would ensure that there will be no new gas or coal projects. Well, is that what this means? Why are you not being up front with us? Why are you not coming in here, giving us some foreshadowing what those changes actually are so that we can have a proper debate on it? We don't know. The Greens know because they're the ones that have done the deal. Greens leader Mr Bant claimed that he delivered a huge hit, he said, a huge hit to, to fossil fuels. Well, no doubt the inner city boffins in Mr Bant's Melbourne electorate will be toasting the end of coal and gas industries. However, the folks in electorates like Aston will know that they are the ones that are really going to pay the price for Labor and the Greens Alliance. It's going to increase cost of living. Now, Mr. De Mr Bant has delivered a huge hit to Australian families. A huge hit to Australian families. This is yet another broken promise from this Labor government. Labor alone 
is responsible for making our gas sector uninvestable and, and worsening the gas supply crisis. And I look forward to Senator Brockman's uh, contribution on this. We had a little chat in the back room there about his, what he's going to be talking about, and he's going to really focus in, he told me, on this issue in relation to what it's going to mean for the gas industry, in, 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 particularly in Western Australia. And I look forward to his contribution. Now, in capitulating, capitulating to the Greens' demands on the safeguard mechanism reforms, Labor has sowed the seeds for not only the next energy crisis but indeed the next economic crisis, one that will far exceed the current crisis that we're facing in its severity. The Labor Green Deal is a hard cap on economic growth, a hard cap on new industries and a hard cap on jobs. Labor's new carbon tax will increase the price of everything from food to fuel at a time that households are already struggling to make ends meet. Now, just this afternoon or this evening, I, uh, uh, I was reading through the West Australian News website and I was interested to read comments from uh, Premier Mark McGowan in relation to this new deal that's been done. And he said, that all the advice that he has is that it doesn't impact our gas projects because their direct emissions are currently offset by their low emissions projects. Now, I'm pleased that Premier Mark McGowan has optimism on this bill and his assurance that the Scarborough gas project in Western Australia won't be affected. I'm not sure quite how he has that confidence because Mr. Minister Bowen's media release says that new gas fields supplying Existing liquefied natural gas facilities will be treated as new facilities, so they, will, so they are given international best practice baselines for the carbon dioxide in their new fields. For these fields reservoirs, CO2 emissions, best practice is zero, zero, given the existence of low CO2 fields and the opportunities for carbon capture and storage. Now, I'm wondering how the Premier of Western Australia has confidence given that the Senate hasn't even seen the amendments accepted by the government from the Greens. The Premier is trying to save face here to re and, re and reassure industry in Western Australia that they're not being treated like fools by this arrogant government that's happy to moralise about climate change but happy to leave their ashes behind. However, I look forward to seeing Premier Mark McGowan's valiant efforts to protect the Scarborough gas project from Chris Bowen's Minister Bowen's uh, federal Labor. This is simply another example of Labor's government policy that is anti-WA. This is an anti-WA tax. This is an anti-WA tax. This bill is bad for Western Australia. It's bad for Australia. Another dodgy deal with the Greens that will hurt Australians. Another sneaky tax that will hurt the Australian economy. Another example of Labor stooping to the inner city lefties and leaving the rest of Australia out in the cold. Another bill that doesn't do anything to help hard-working Australians but, but to make ends meet, but will only drive up costs. I want to echo the comments of my fellow Western Australian in the other place, the member for O'Connor, my good friend Rick Wilson. He said, his electorate has already taken a hit from Labor's radical plan to, buy and to ban live export, and now they will take another hit from this terrible legislation. And I quote from him: "The impact on Western Australian consumers, farmers, and most importantly the householders who are going to be paying more for their electricity and gas and paying more for their food when they go to the supermarkets. I proudly stand here today, and I do as well, opposing this bill." opposing this particular piece of very bad legislation which seeks to impose a new carbon tax on the Australian people. Thank you, Senator. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Safeguard Mechanism Amendment Bill and I acknowledge my colleagues, Senator Waters and Senator Faruqi, who have spoken with such passion on this issue this evening um, and in front of my speech. I associate myself with their remarks. I was put here in the Senate by South Australians to get real action on climate crisis. The decisions we make in this parliament will above all impact on young Australians and on those not yet born. Young people who are acutely aware of the climate crisis yet do not get to vote for their representatives. 
and we must keep this at the forefront of our minds. On that note, I would like to start by reading some words from a letter I received this week from a young South Australian high school student, Anjali. We, the youth, are set to inherit a future plagued by the consequences of today's climate inaction. The science has been clear for decades. We have to reduce our emissions, and yet all we've seen from our government are inconsistent and inadequate policies. In South Australia, young people are experiencing heat waves, droughts, bushfires, with increasing consistency and severity. And as we're seeing the impacts of climate change in this country and around the world, the only progress the Australian government is achieving is expanding fossil fuel projects. Angeli continues, young people are tasked with changing the future, yet our government is dragging us back into the past. Our world is at stake. And while the fear we feel is overwhelming, it reminds us of how deeply we care. We care because we know climate change is already causing widespread inequality, displacement and hardship. We care because we want a future where we can breathe the clean air, drink the clean water and enjoy the beauty of our planet. We care because we know that the generations of today have a moral responsibility to protect our planet for the people of tomorrow. We are not willing to sit back and let the earth continue down a path of climate catastrophe, and it's our duty to demand action from our leaders. Our government, in acting immediately and ambitiously, has the power to change the course of history. Our future depends on it. Angeli is right. Scientists have been warning us about the climate crisis for decades, with little action in response from governments, a lost decade of inaction by those in the LNP. The, great, the latest IPCC report handed down last week was a sobering read from the world's leading climate scientists. The report's final warning, as they wrote, makes it clear that there is very little chance of keeping the world from warming 1.5 degrees, despite this target being agreed by most countries across the globe under the Paris Climate Agreement. The report also noted that every increment of warming and every action we take to reduce that, that warming really matters. As a social scientist, I know how essential it is to listen to the science. Australia is the world's third largest fossil fuel exporter. Per capita, Australia's emissions are the highest in the OECD. As a country, we therefore have a moral responsibility to act. We in the Greens have been arguing for months that we need to listen to the science and stop new coal and gas. This undoubtedly needs to happen. But as Adam Ban has said, on this issue negotiating with Labor is like negotiating with a political wing of the fossil fuel industry. Despite the government's resistance, we Greens have achieved significant improvements to the safeguard mechanism. They will make a difference. The Greens have stopped many of the 116 new coal and gas projects from going ahead, and we've secured a hard cap on pollution. Pollution will now go down, not up, and the coal and gas corporations can't buy their way out of it with offsets, dodgy or otherwise. We've secured a pollution trigger, which for the first time in history means that the remaining new coal and gas projects will be assessed against the hard cap for their impact on the climate and can be stopped. We have derailed both the Beetaloo and Barossa climate bombs, and we've also wiped out many dodgy offset projects which will bring us much closer to a future without coal and gas. This bill, with the Greens' changes, represents a step in the right direction. It's a step in the right direction for First Nations people and their commitment to protecting their country. It's a step in the right direction for Anjali, just 17, begging us to give her a safer future of the kind that most of us in this place have enjoyed, and which millions of people across, across the planet now do not, because of fossil fuel. Up to 50 million people in Pakistan have been displaced, as Senator Faruqi described. That's the population of Spain or Canada. 80 per cent of them are women, people of colour and First Nations, especially on the front line. The crisis we face is huge. It is an emergency, and we are on a final warning. 
We know that we have a lot more to do to safeguard, safeguard the future of our young people, people like Anjali, like the children of Pakistan and the world, along with all the children and grandchildren of those in this place, including my own, the latest little Geordie. We are in the fight of their lives. The Greens will stand shoulder to shoulder with scientists and climate activists in this fight. We will stop all new coal and gas projects. This is our next fight and we must win it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, we all agree that credible action towards creating a cleaner environment and safer world is vital and is truly the most important issue of our generation. But killing our economy to do it is a complete fallacy. And to pretend that you're doing this for future generations is condemning them to a life of poverty. Now, I was lucky enough to attend COP27 in Egypt last year, and one thing was abundantly clear that the transition to zero emissions, net zero emissions, is happening. There's no ifs or buts about that. But it's about how we get there that's important. And I've done a mountain of work, and, and more than any of the Greens, I promise them that, in looking to how to do this. You know, it is a fact that all countries have been slow to act, but that's the very nature of a transition. And especially a transition that's as big and as difficult as the one we face to achieve when we are aiming to decarbonise our economy, which must be the objective. The globe at some point in time will reach net zero, ideally sooner rather than later. However, net zero does not mean zero emissions. Under this proposed bill, the government wants to expand the safeguard mechanism to cover 215 of Australia's biggest emitters and force them to cut their emissions by five, almost 5% 5 every year. And for those that cannot meet this, they must either buy carbon credits or pay a fine. In other words, a carbon tax. However, there are some industries that are key to the Australian economy that will continue to produce carbon dioxide regardless of the developments of technology, regardless of whether they use green energy. Take, for example, the production of cement, which I think everyone in this place will, will know is a vital component of the building construction industry. The very building we're in is built with it. The production of cement, about two-thirds of total emissions, result from the process of calcination. That's a chemical reaction that occurs when raw materials such as limestone are exposed to high temperatures. Often these industries have been at the forefront of reducing their emissions through reducing their energy mix, but still not, will not be able to meet the government's mandated re reductions. This means businesses such as those in the cement industry will be forced to either buy an exorbitant amount of carbon credits will constantly pay a carbon tax or, worse, leave the Australian economy. If we plan on continuing to build and grow, the production of cement will be part of our future for a long time, which is why our investments in technologies such as carbon capture and storage, blue hydrogen, healthy soil technologies will be vital to get to net zero. Even the Grattan Institute's chief executive, um, uh, Energy Executive Tony Wood has warned that this carbon credit scheme is flawed, saying that taxpayers will be forced to fork out billions of dollars to compensate high emitting companies if the price of carbon spikes above a proposed $75 per cap. And we all know that that $75 cap is a floor, not a ceiling. With the price of carbon offsets subject to changes according to supply and demand on the market, the federal government may be forced to buy carbon credits at a price above the cap to then sell off at a fixed $75. Make no mistake, this is a flawed bill, as it will only result in carbon leakage occurring, as the government forces Australian businesses and industries out of the manufacturing business and into the importing business, 
which will only serve to prom promote and result in carbons, carbons emitted offshore coming into Australia. Carbon leakage occurs due to costs related to climate policies, forcing businesses to transfer production to other countries with laxer emission constraints. And this means countries such as China, who is the number one producer of cement and the number one emitter of carbon dioxide, India, who is the number two producer and the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide, and Vietnam, who is the third largest producer of cement and 17th largest emitter of CO2. And their economies are going to pick up this business that this government is forcing out of Australia. Remember, reducing emissions is a global effort. You can't simply push the problem offshore and make it someone else's problem. The issue with this bill is that it will promote carbon leakage, meaning the globe will actually be worse off. Yes, Australia will reduce its emissions, but that is simply because the government will be driving businesses um, into the ground, forcing them, the jobs and the emissions offshore. The reality is that technologies to achieve net zero are on the cusp of being commercially available and only by investing in the development of these technologies will we be able to reach this goal. The net zero transition provides Australia with an abundant opportunity. Because the fallacy of net zero has been conflated with zero emissions, the common debate around emissions reduction has been tarnished by this government's political opponents who see either or do not understand or willfully ignore the fact that in a net zero future there will still be emissions generated. All the government wants to do is flood Australia with wind and solar and ignore other zero emissions generation and storage technologies. The government must prevent carbon leakage occurring by implementing uh, something along the line of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Despite the EU's faults in their mechanism and their absurd penchant for radical and unattainable energy policies, at least they recognise that they need to prevent carbon leakage from occurring. Because without a mechanism like this, Australians will suffer. The government needs to be honest with the Australian people that the road to net zero will be incredibly hard and incredibly costly. We know this, and there's no two ways about it. But there are technologies, Australian technologies, that are worth pursuing and worth backing to get into reducing emissions. However, ARENA and the CEFC only seem bent on backing Chinese companies in doing this, not Australian companies. What we do not need is the government making the transition even harder and even more costly through poor policy. As we've seen, power prices are already going through the roof, despite the Prime Minister's 97 uh, times that he would reduce power bills by $275. Tonight we've seen the government's deal with the Greens will only make the transition even more costly and even harder. Energy sources such as gas, which would be crucial in the transition to achieving net zero, um, will be absolutely trashed, as will our economy in that process. The Prime Minister himself recognised this, saying last month that, and I quote, gas in particular has a key role to play as a flexible source of energy, providing peaking power today and continuing to provide firming and backup power. However, we've seen loud and clear this government like to say one thing, then do another. Remember when they promised not to touch super? Well, they did that anyway. Remember when they promised cheaper mortgages? Well, we've all seen that they lied on that too. Remember when they promised an aged care pay rise but then failed to deliver that? I could go on about the list of broken promises. But the point is that this government continues to say whatever they would to get a deal done and then fail to deliver. The Australian energy market operator is already forecasting gas shortfalls from winter this year to at least 2026. Gas shortfalls mean higher power prices, blackouts and, a, and the, an increase in the cost of living for Australians. Those that can afford to turn on their heating will be paying higher prices. 
gas shortfalls also means an increased risk for energy insecurity, which will stifle investment and increase costs. We know that new gas supply is needed to help avoid the forecasting shortfalls identified by the ACCC and AEMO to put downward pressure on prices, and this amendment will prevent this happening. And let's not forget, energy insecurity equals national insecurity. The two are intrinsically linked. And by failing to secure our energy security, the government is failing to secure our national security. Make no mistake, when the, Greens agree the, when the government agreed the Greens amendment, they agreed to higher power prices and an increased cost of living. Importantly, in the medium term, gas will and should serve as an important firming fuel as we bring more renewables onto the grid, and right now no better firming technology exists. The AEMO's 2022 I ISP states that we need to treble the firming capacity from dispatchable storage, which includes hydro and gas-fired generation, to firm renewables. And as I've said before, anyone who starts talking about renewables without talking about firming isn't serious about bringing down emissions. If they start talking about batteries as the answer to firming, then they doubly do not know what they're talking about. And the government's answer to the question, how do we treble the firming capacity, is to hamstring our best firming source available right now. JP Morgan's 2022 annual energy paper explicitly states that countries that reduce production of fossil fuels under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace them, face substantial economic and geopolitical risks. If energy transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generation methods we have before we have a replacement for it. Despite Labor claiming before the election that they conducted, and I quote, the most comprehensive, comprehensive ever done for any policy by an opposition in Australia's history since Federation, it is clear that they have absolutely no clue and absolutely no idea on how they are actually going to drive down power prices. Make no mistake, life is getting harder and harder under the Albanese Labor government. I cannot, in good mind, support such a flawed and poorly designed bill, and I ask the Senate to vote it down. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Australia, and particularly Queensland, I speak on the safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2022. Here we go again. Once more, the Labor government is putting a Liberal national climate policy on steroids in a race to see how quickly both of them can destroy our beloved country to appease their globalist masters. Chris Bowen and Anthony Albanese are building in this bill on the safeguard mechanism that Malcolm Turnbull and Greg Hunt introduced in 2015. This bill establishes a new form of carbon credits, or more correctly, carbon dioxide, dioxide credits, or more correctly, a carbon dioxide tax. Naming them Safeguard Mechanism Credit Units, or SMCs. You might ask, what is an what is a safeguard mechanism credit unit defined as? Is it nine cow farts worth? Ten burps? The entire concept of counting carbon dioxide emissions is a scam. It's a fraud. While we can poke fun at the scam, the lack of detail in this bill is incredibly serious. Do not let the title fool anyone. The definition of a safeguard mechanism credit is not in the bill. If the parliament passes this bill, We'll just have to trust the minister or some bureaucrat to tell us later. The biggest producers of goods in this country will be told to cut their production of carbon dioxide with the amount not defined in the bill. It may be 4.9 per cent a year. And if they don't, they'll be forced to buy undefined carbon dioxide credits, an undefined carbon dioxide tax. I use the word producers deliberately. This bill will apply to companies in this country that actually make something, what's left of them. Because they've been forced to buy carbon dioxide credits, these companies will be forced to make less of the things they make 
and be forced to make them more expensive. It doesn't matter what fancy scheme the government wants to dress this up as, it is a carbon dioxide tax. It's a tax on production, and we all know that whenever we tax something, we get less of it. So take a look around at everything you have right now, your phone, your house, your car. If you want a new one in the future or more things for your children, too bad. The Labor government has decided Australians have too much already, and what's left will only be for the rich who can afford it. The Greens will smear and label me again for me simply telling the truth. Yet I believe that we should come to Parliament to make Australia prosper, not force unnecessary scarcity to appease the sun gods and the climate carpetbaggers. That's the general rule that should be followed for a prosperous Australia. Look, do what's in the national interest. Let's look at the globalists. This legislation is not in Australia's interest. Gutless politicians are doing it all to satisfy unelected, unaccountable foreign organisations. All of Australia's climate legislation has abundant references to satisfying our international commitments, including the Kyoto Protocol, the UN's Kyoto Protocol, the UN's Paris Agreement, the UN Agenda 21, UN 2050 Net Zero, and so on and on and on with the UN World Economic Forum Alliance. The creators of these international agreements are unelected and unaccountable. These foreign bureaucrats believe the prosperity of Australians should come second to their desire to transfer wealth from our people into the hands of predatory billionaires. Don't be fooled. While this supposedly green pipe dream dresses itself as virtuous, the billionaires of the world have untold amounts invested in wind, solar, batteries, green hydrogen and other scams on which they demand a return. Having predictably failed in the free market, they must now hijack international organisations to pressure governments into the forced uptake of their failed investments. With such large amounts of money at stake, the billionaires can afford to buy guns for hire at many different levels. The Teal Independents, Monique Ryan, Allegra Spender, Zoe Daniel, Kylia Tink, Sophie Scamps and Zali Stegel all peculiarly made submissions to the consultation paper for this bill, arguing it should go even further. Did they declare their conflicts of interest, their clear conflicts of interest? Collectively, the Teals received millions of dollars from Climate 200 for their election campaign. Climate 200's principal donor, Simon Holmes of Court, has massive investments in wind, solar, battery and hydrogen scams. He, along with many other climate billionaires, will benefit hugely from this bill's passage. It seems the Teals' calls for transparency don't apply to them and donations aren't dirty if they come from sugar daddy and carpetbagger homes of court. Equally in this debate, I hope Senator David Pocock declares the same conflict of interest that rises from Climate 200's donations to his campaign, making him a teal. This bill allows the climate billionaires to harvest taxpayer money through their scams like carbon capture, locking up productive farms and other cons. What schemes will be entitled to harvest taxpayer money? What will be the criteria for being accepted? What integrity checks will be in place? Nothing. Some years ago, Europol was quoted stating 95% of Europe's carbon dioxide trading is tainted with corruption. Nothing in this bill has the answers. We just have to wait for the minister or a bureaucrat to tell us later, after the Senate has passed the bill, giving them the incredible power. We do know that the new safeguard mechanism credits will be defined as eligible international emissions units, meaning they will be able to be traded overseas, globally, as even the Australian Financial Markets Association noted during consultation, there is no good reason for making the credits internationally tradable, other than perhaps helping the globalist billionaires to suck the country dry. The carbon dioxide credits whitewash. Let's look at that. There are too many problems with this bill to fully address in just 15 minutes. We can't let that time pass, though, without acknowledging one of the greatest exercises in political whitewashing this parliament has seen, the Chubb Carbon Dioxide Credits Review. Australian National University environmental law professor, law expert, Professor Andrew McIntosh, said Australia's carbon market is a fraud on the environment, suffers from a distinct lack of integrity and is potentially wasting billions of dollars in taxpayers' money. In response to this scathing criticism of the integrity of the carbon dioxide credit system, Energy Minister Chris Bowen rushed to appoint a panel to review the integrity of carbon dioxide credits. 
An independent panel, supposedly, yet how independent can a government-appointed panel really be? People will be shocked. The government-appointed, yet somehow independent panel, claimed there was nothing to see here. It made a few superficial recommendations and gave the carbon dioxide credit industry a great big fat tick. As McIntosh responded on 9th of January 2023, quote, the review panel acknowledged the scientific evidence criticising the carbon credit scheme, but says it was also provided with evidence to the contrary. Yet it, and I'm continuing the quote, yet it did not disclose what that evidence was or what it relates to. The public is simply expected to trust that the evidence exists, end of quote. That's, a, that's an environmental uh, professor seeing right through this. What are they hiding? The Chubb review was a complete sham designed to give a scam-filled industry a green tick of health to pave the way for this bill. With Ian Chubb's whitewash review conveniently in place, Labor has given itself permission to rush this bill through, while the scientists who originally raised the integrity issues scream that none of the protests have been addressed. Chubb has repeatedly taken money from Liberal National and Labor Greens federal governments to peddle unfounded, false and scary claims. He's a paid gun for hire to push the government line. Next, let's consider the fact, the fact that we are already at net zero. Why do we need a carbon dioxide credit scheme anyway? As I explained to this chamber in September last year, Australia is already at net zero. Where's the confetti, the streamers, the champagne, the celebrations? Taken directly from clause four of the Paris Agreement, and as Assistant Minister McAllister in the debate on the climate change bill said, quote, Net zero is a balance between human production of emissions and removal of those emissions by environmental sinks. End of quote. Our country has so many forests that Australia already sequesters or sinks three times more carbon dioxide than we produce. Then when you consider the fact that the, we're entirely surrounded by oceans, it, it is even more so. Even to people foolishly believing Australia needs to carry out the net zero kamikaze mission, on net zero, we're already the world's heroes without doing a damn thing. So let's have a look at the delegated powers. While the entire concept on which this bill is based is flawed, the way it operates seems to be even worse. The safeguard mechanism crediting Amendment Bill 2022 is a shell containing little detail about how the largest producers, manufacturers and resource companies will be regulated. Instead, the bill places huge power in the minister without a touch bureaucrats in the Canberra bubble left to later fill in the detail. To my colleagues in this chamber, I urge you to please think carefully about the process this bill implements. This isn't a vote on some companies cutting production 5%, 4.9%, 5%. That number is not even in this bill. It's another ministerial power to decide. This is a bill to give the minister a blank check on who this policy will apply to, how much they will be forced to cut, and how quickly they will be forced to do it, and much, much, much more. While some people may consider the current proposal reasonable and proportionate, this nearly unlimited power will almost certainly be abused in the future. Almost all of this policy will be made via legislative instrument, an executive dictate from the minister. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Senate granting this wide open power over some of the most significant changes to our economy is unconscionable. The design of this bill to minimise parliamentary scrutiny, the deliberate design of this bill to minimise parliamentary scrutiny is a spit in the face of the, parliamentary, of the parliament, a spit in the face of democracy, and a spit in the faces of the Australian people who you, are meant to serve in this chamber. Well, let's think about the consultation. Predictably, we can assume that Labor will wrongly assure us they have consulted widely on this bill. Just like we saw the Treasurer wanting to start a conversation about tearing down the economic fabric of our country, Labor's consultation process is a sham, designed to give them cover for doing whatever they please. To consult, means really actually listening. Labor has no intention of listening. 
Numerous stakeholders noted the staggered release of the draft bill, the legislative instruments and the Chubb review. Combined, these steps limited the ability to consider the implications of the proposed reforms. I ask, how can Labor claim to have consulted when many of the detailed operational elements of this entire policy are contained in legislative instruments which do not yet exist? How could anyone be consulted on those legislative means? That's not unusual for Labor. The bill is unfounded. It is damaging. For Australia, it is suicidal. And it is we, the people, who will pay. One Nation opposes this bill, and if passed, will work to unwind it and tear down the global climate scam that drives this bill. I want to make a couple more comments. Basic questions. Why are China and India not doing what this Labor Greens Teal Poker Coalition government is doing? Why is Russia not doing it? Why are we punishing Australian families and, and employers and workers? Why can the other countries have the benefit of our high quality coal and gas, hydrocarbon fuels, yet we cannot? Think about the primacy of, en of energy. It's in everything. We're killing our productive capacity and our children's future. Secondly, the cost of the Labor Greens Teal Pocock Bill are extraordinarily high. Why are we punishing Australian employers and families? And remember that primacy of energy. That will see, see prices skyrocketing continually. Thirdly, there's no justification in science for cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. No empirical scientific data, no logical scientific points to back this up. I've asked them, and they've, they've repeatedly run. No specific quantified effect of carbon dioxide from human activity. None at all. There's conclusive, overwhelming evidence from two global experiments that overwhelmingly prove that cutting carbon dioxide from human activity has no effect. In 2009 and 2020, we had global recessions, almost depressions, and the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued increasing, despite dramatic cuts in carbon dioxide from human activity. It's pointless. Nature alone determines the level of carbon dioxide. Humans have no effect. So let's ask the fourth question. Why are we following in the footsteps of the crooks. The father of global warming was senior UN bureaucrat and oil billionaire Maurice Strong. He morphed it into climate change, climate apocalypse, climate breakdown. He was involved in the UN food for oil scandal. He was involved in corruption in the water, water systems of Western United States. He exiled himself in China, running away from the American police. He formed the UN's climate body that is really a political body. He is director and founder of the Chicago Climate Exchange, aiming to make billions of dollars trading carbon dioxide credits like Al Gore's company, Generation Investment Management. The whole thing is a scam to make billionaires richer, and you in Labor and you in the Greens are following the footsteps of a crook, Maurice thank, Strong. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, as we approach 11.30pm uh, in the evening, I would like to start by just addressing the perhaps very few Australians who are, are listening to, to this uh, uh, late uh, after dark edition of the Senate. Uh, uh, we are still broadcasting, I see there, out to the Australian people. And if you are listening out there, um, I could hazard a guess that you're probably struggling to sleep and perhaps you're hoping, hoping that uh, putting on the Senate can, can help fix your insomnia and get you to bed. Uh, and if you are struggling to sleep, I think right now, and I think a lot of Australian families who are, who are struggling to get to bed would be up at night, uh, awake, uh, worrying about how they're going to pay the mortgage this month, worrying about uh, when the energy bill is going to turn up and will there be enough on the credit card to pay that, and worrying that the next time they go to the uh, go to Coles and at the self-serve checkout, and uh, are they going to get the transaction declined? Funds not available on the little screen. That's what a lot of Australians are worried about right now. And I wish I wish I could tell you and assure you. Uh, to those Australians are listening tonight that uh, we're up late, we're up late working for you trying to, to fix these issues. I wish I could say that uh, you know, we're up discussing and debating legislation that could uh, help, help uh, put you at ease and at least provide some uh, relief to the cost of living pressures you're facing right now, keep you in your home, uh, keep the mortgage paid, uh, make sure you don't fall behind on those bills. But we're not doing that, unfortunately we're not doing that. Uh, the, the government, and it's all its wisdom, is devoting all of this time uh, tonight, uh, all of the taxpayer dollars it costs to run this place uh, late into the evening, 
uh, to debate a bill to actually make things worse for you. Sorry, I don't want to keep you up any later than you should be, but, but there's no doubt that this, these measures here are actually going to make things worse, not better, uh, for people struggling with the cost of living. They're going to make people worse because this amounts to a, to a new tax on doing business in this country. Uh, I just want to start by briefly explaining what the safeguard mechanism is or what, the, what these reforms are to the safeguard mechanism are intended to do. What they will do is take 215 businesses around Australia and effectively tell them all that you have to reduce your emissions by roughly 5 per cent a year. And uh, to do that, you'll have to pay money. You'll have to pay money to invest in new technologies to do that and or buy these things called carbon credits, which are a complete scam. But those carbon credits at the moment go for about $70 a tonne uh, in New Zealand. In, in Europe, they're over $100 Australian a tonne. And the government, in their changes here, is setting a cap on the price of those at $75 Australian a tonne. So we'll probably end up paying around that $75 a tonne. The government is saying that they want to reduce emissions over the next uh, seven or eight years, so 2030, uh, by 205 million tonnes. So it's a very simple maths. Uh, get a calculator out, 205 million tonnes at $75 a tonne, that's a $15 billion hit. So we're, 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 we're debating tonight, and almost certainly this will eventually go through because of the stitch-up, sell-out deal uh, the Labor Party have done with the Greens, selling out workers, selling out jobs to the Greens. Uh, it will go through and, and it will be a $15 billion extra hit. Uh, to the bills and costs of, that Australians are already facing today. Um, those 215 businesses I mentioned they include our, our major airlines, Qantas and Virgin are included. So if you're planning a holiday to get away from the stresses of uh, uh, trying to pay the bills, that will become more difficult. It includes uh, major public transport uh, entities. Uh, so those costs uh, will go up. It also includes our last two oil refineries. Why is the government putting a tax? on the, uh, the two oil refineries we've got left in this country. Two of them left. Uh, and uh, a tax goes on them too uh, through this. And so that will make it harder, of course, for us to uh, maintain our fuel security and also put upward pressure on those petrol prices as well. But before I go into a bit more detail about the costs of this, I want to focus on something that very few people actually do discuss in this debate, is exactly what will be the corresponding benefit from this legislation. I mean, what, 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 like we're going to have all these costs, so a $15 billion extra hit to the Australian economy. Very simple maths, $15 billion. The government won't release its modelling because it obviously shows some pretty dark and uh, uh, concerning uh, conclusions about the impact of the cost. But we, we know it's roughly $15 billion cost. Where's the benefit? What, what's the benefit? I mean, is anybody able to, in this debate from the government or others, to say how much, how much will the temperature of the globe fall by this, this legislation? How much will it change? How much coral will re regrow on the Great Barrier Reef? How many bushfires will be avoided? We do hear that. We've heard contributions saying Tasmanian devils are getting burnt and these horrible things, which are terrible and tragic. But how is this particular bill going to stop those Tasmanian devils uh, dying? How will it do that? It's, it's, what did we say? It's 205 million tonnes we're going to abate over several years. The world produces 30 gigatons of carbon a year. <laughs> and we're, we're, debating, uh, we're debating here a bill for 205 million tonnes and we have this ridiculous uh, level of uh, uh, superiority thinking that somehow all these things we're discussing here, staying up late at night, we're saving the planet, apparently. Because I hear that from others. Apparently in this little room here in Canberra, we're going to save the world. It's just absurd. <laughs> it's just total megalomania uh, on stilts. Uh, none of these things are going to happen by this change. None of them. And, and if, if anyone just wants to turn on a TV and see what's going on around the rest of the world, they're certainly not taking equal and proportionate action to what we're doing here tonight to cut their carbon emissions. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, the Biden administration opened up hundreds of thousands of hectares of land to drill oil in Alaska. That happened. So they, you know, the Biden administration says they're doing all these things, they're putting all these subsidies. They're not putting a carbon tax on. They're not doing that. Uh, and uh, uh, they're at the same time opening up massive swathes of Alaska. Uh, for oil drilling. That's what they're doing. In the UK, they're opening up the North Sea uh, for more oil drilling. Uh, again, you know, no, no, no restraints, no restrictions, go for your life. In Germany, the Greens Party, the Greens Party are in government, they've actually got the energy ministry, uh, they're reopening 24 coal-fired power stations. In fact, they're ripping down wind turbines to expand coal mines in Germany. <laughs> uh, and we're here putting a new tax and impost on Australian industry. Well, we're fools, absolute fools. And then, of course, of course, China, China, which is the world's largest 
a meter of carbon emissions, about 30 per cent of those 30 gigatons come from uh, China. Uh, they, are, they announced plans the other week, just the other week, that they will, they will build 104 gigawatts of coal-fired power stations this year. You know, a, a good-sized good coal-fired power station is about one gigawatt, so, so they're, producing, they're, they're building two coal-fired power stations a week in China right now. We're going to debate this for about a week. And while we are debating this bill to cut 205 million tonnes uh, from little old Australia's carbon emissions over seven or eight year, years, China will have built two coal-fired power stations. <laughs> and they'd be about 20 million tonnes a year. So over the next 10 years, those two coal-fired power stations that we've been built in this week will be as much and completely offset all of the changes that we have done and all the effort we put it in. And China's just going to get rid of it in a week for us. One week. One week. But, but we are going to save the planet, just little ourselves. We have this power. We're going to do this. But let's look into the details. That's the, that's the, I don't know where the benefits are here. Maybe someone can explain to me you know, exactly what benefit the world or any Australian will receive from this, but it doesn't seem apparent. Uh, what, what is apparent, what we do know, is this $15 billion cost will be paid by businesses all around Australia. Again, very few people have pointed out that this is a massive hit uh, to those Australians who... Uh, don't live in the places where there are big buildings. Uh, this, this, this list of 215 businesses is not fair and equitable across the country. Guess how many businesses of those 215 are in Sydney? Guess how many? Biggest city in Australia? Big, big amount of carbon emissions, lots of transport, lots of concrete and steel. You, know, you tend not to, in, in a country town, if you want to go and get a good view, you walk up a hill. Uh, in the city, you get an elevator made out of steel with a, a pull-by cable made out of steel and a building made out of concrete. All those carbon emissions embodied in that, and you go up the top of that building to see uh, the town. Those in Sydney, of those 215 businesses, one. One. Wow. <laughs> one. It's, uh, it, and it, it, that, that business actually, Senator McKenzie, you'll be interested to know, it's actually a, a plastics manufacturer which mainly produces polypipe and tanks for the rural industry. <laughs> so we'll still pay the bill for that. Even that little business in Sydney there, well, Quinos, will still you know, provide very important services to agriculture. Um, but really the big impact is in the, in the bush. 84% uh, 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 of those 215 businesses are in regional Australia. 84%. Only 30% of Australians live outside capital cities in regional Australia. But 84%. Why, why, does, why is the Labor Party and the Greens uh, conspiring to put a hit on regional areas of this country? Is it because they don't really have a lot of seats in those areas? So they're, not, they're not exposing their own. I mean, the, the, the Greens have nothing, of course, out in the regions. The Labor Party a few, uh, but not many. Uh, uh, and, and so the little old Greens here, they're not going to put any costs on their own little businesses in their own inner city areas. Uh, they get off scot-free. But the 84 per cent of businesses that make money for this country, the mines, the gas fields, they get hit. 63 coal mines get hit. 22 iron ore mines. It's not just, not just coal. 22 iron ore mines get hit by this. 35 gas facilities. And I want to just point out, just to my West Australian colleagues, this is someone who mentioned this before, it really is an anti-Western Australian policy. There's more Western Australian businesses on this list than there are from Queensland. Uh, it is a big hit. And where are the Western Australian Labor senators? Completely and totally sold out to Canberra. They're all Canberra-based senators. They're not representing Western Australia. They're representing the interests of Canberra and the inner city Greens over here on this side of the town. Why is Western Australia? They already pay a lot of GST. They already pay a lot of income tax to prop up this budget. And now they're being asked to pay the lion's share of the carbon tax from the Western Australia too. Now, why is this? There's a bit of a quirk here, and I'm running out of time, but there's a bit of a perverse quirk here, right? So these 215 businesses, how do they get picked? They're the businesses that have more than 100,000 tonnes of what's called scope one emissions. And if you're a business in inner city areas and you use a lot of coal-fired power, like uh, I've got this new sticker here, if I can use a bit of a prop here. Uh, I've got a new sticker here on my laptop. It says proudly powered by Aussie coal. It's cheap, reliable, and it works at night. Uh, and, and those businesses in the city, they'll be running off coal. They'll be running off coal-fired power. You know the emissions from those coal-fired power stations? Don't get counted towards your emissions in this list. Wow. So if you're in the city and you're connected to the grid, which is 70% coal in eastern Australia, you, you, don't get, you don't get hit. So all the banks, a lot of the banks, two of the four big banks would be over the 100,000 tonnes because they run big data services, use a lot of coal-fired power to run them. They're exempt. They get off. <laughs> banks get off. They get off. But, but, but little old poor Western Australian mines who tend not to be connected to grids, 
and have to use have to use diesel because they're remote, so they've got to use diesel for trucks. They often have to use diesel to run their, their crushing plants uh, and blending facilities. They all have to be done through diesel-fired power. That gets captured under this perverse and ridiculous scope one definition. And so that's why you end up with all these Western Australian businesses. They get penalised for being remote. The, the further away you are from the big lights, the more the tax you'll pay under this safeguards mechanism from the Labor and Greens party. How, how is this being allowed to go through in this parliament when it is those people who live out in the camps, away from their families, who are paying the bills of this nation? It is their hard work, their loneliness, which is funding all of the largesse here in this chamber. And what do we do to show gratitude to them? Here's a big new tax on your futures. Here's a big new tax on your towns. We won't, we won't impose it on ourselves, but we'll put it on your businesses uh, as well. Now, all of these things I've gotten through most of my speech, all these things are what was bad about it before the Labor and Greens deal. Before that, this was already bad. That's why we're opposed to it. All the businesses out there are being angry with us for not supporting a carbon tax. Well, I don't know if they've been noticing politics for the last couple of decades. We are against carbon taxes. We've always been against them. We went to the election against them. And I'm not copying any rubbish from the Labor Party. They got some kind of mandate. They got fewer votes than we did. More people voted for the Liberal National Party last election than the Labor Party. Now I get it. There's a system we've got. They form government, whatever, right? But they have no mandate. <laughs> they have no mandate for their policies. We also have a mandate to represent the plurality of Australians that voted against carbon taxes at last election, and we'll keep fighting for them in this chamber. That's why we're against this today. That's why we're against it tonight. That's why we'll be against carbon taxes tomorrow. And I tell you what, we'll be against them when we come back to power at some point uh, in the future, and we'll rip up this piece of legislation. It will go. It will go. It won't be there. So all those businesses crying out for certainty, the only certainty you've got is if you can make sure you bring down the cost of living for Australians. Of course, this bill will increase uh, the living costs for all Australians. It will increase power prices. It's going to lead to gas shortages and potentially blackouts, thanks to the sellout to the Greens. Uh, and when that happens, when that happens, the, the, the Australian people will be angry. They'll be staying more of them. will be listening to the Senate at night because they won't be able to sleep. And they'll be pretty angry. And you know who they can blame? They can blame this terrible Labor government who is not doing it, lifting a finger to help them right now. Not a finger. Where is the legislation from this government to help with cost of living? Where is it? There is nothing. And all we're doing is putting more and more costs on the backs of the Australian people. And eventually we'll have another election. And they'll have, they'll have the opportunity to decide whether this government has helped them and made their lives easier over the three-year term they'll be in power or whether they're not. And we'll be there saying, hey, look, why don't we get rid of these stupid taxes and, and get down your cost of living? That might be a good idea. And I'll keep fighting for that common sense. I'll keep fighting for Australia. And I'll definitely fight against these things which just make the lives of Australians, especially regional Australians, much, much, much harder. Yeah. Senator Rice. President, 43 years ago, I left a second year climate science lecture, having just learnt about the greenhouse effect. I remember being shocked about how serious it was and thinking the world needs to do something about this. And it was my passion for taking action on climate that began my journey to this place. 33 years ago, in 1990, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published their first assessment report. I reread the summary of the 1990 report tonight and felt a combination of really angry, really sad and incredibly frustrated. How is it that we are still arguing about the need to stop mining coal and gas and oil? The capture of governments by the fossil fuel lobby over the last three decades has been truly mind-boggling. The donations, the revolving doors from mining executive to members of parliament and back to being mining executives, the control of the media, the conspiracies, the merchants of doubt. In 1990, the IPCC was quite explicit about the extent of the heating, protecting, predicting a likely increase in global mean temperature about two degrees Celsius above that in the pre-industrial period by 2025. We are completely on track. And they were explicit about the impact of that heating. Let me quote how they summarised some of the impacts. They said that the changes of climate would have an important effect on agriculture and livestock 
noting that there may be severe effects in some regions that are least able to adapt. They said that changes in drought risk represents potentially the most serious impact of climate change on agriculture, that losses from wildfire would be increasingly extensive, that the most vulnerable human settlements are those especially exposed to natural hazards, e.g. coastal or river flooding, severe drought, landslides, severe windstorms and tropical cyclones. They noted that the most vulnerable populations are in developing countries, in the lower income groups, residents of coastal lowlands and islands, populations in semi-arid grasslands and the urban poor in squatter settlements, slums and shanty towns, especially in megacities. They noted that a 30 centimetre sea level rise projected by 2050 would threaten low islands and coastal zones. Now, one metre rise by 2100 would render some island countries uninhabitable, displace tens of millions of people, seriously threaten low-lying urban areas, flood productive land, contaminate fresh water supplies and change coastlines. And that all of these impacts would be exacerbated if droughts and storms become more severe. Coastal protection would involve very significant costs. Rapid sea level rise would change coastal ecology and threaten many important fisheries. Reductions in sea ice, they noted, will benefit shipping but seriously impact on ice-dependent marine mammals and birds. That was all researched and written 30 years ago. It's like a crystal ball, isn't it? That's the power of science. That's why we must listen to these prescient scientists and take action. 30 years ago, the IPCC noted that emissions due to fossil fuel combustion amounted to about 70 to 90 per cent of the total anthropogenic emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere. So they proposed some recommendations as to what the world should do that are still echoing down through the decades. They said that industrialised countries should adopt domestic measures to limit climate change by adapting their own economies to limit emissions. And how to do that? Top of the list, efficiency improvements in conservation and energy supply, conversion and end use, and the use of cleaner, more efficient energy sources with lower or no emissions of greenhouse gases. Fast forward. Last week, the IPCC's latest report landed. It was uncompromising because you can't argue with physics. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, we must massively fast track climate efforts by every country and every sector and on every time frame. And Guterres proposes an acceleration agenda with specifically no new coal and the phasing out of existing coal by 2030 in the rich countries and 2040 in all other countries, ending all international funding, public and private funding of coal, ceasing all licensing or funding of new oil and gas, stopping any expansion of existing oil and gas reserves and shifting subsidies from fossil fuels to a just energy transition. The 30 years plus of climate science and the code red report from the IPCC in the last weeks is the context that we are considering this legislation in tonight. 30 years plus of science warning us of what was and is still to come. And now we are at code red. So this so-called safeguard mechanism is nowhere nearly enough. It still allows a massive amount of coal and gas, new coal and gas, carbon bombs that the world cannot afford to burn. We have known that we've got to get out of the burning of coal and gas and oil for over 30 years. There are no excuses left. There is no more arguing to be done if humanity and the rest of life on this planet are to have a fighting chance. And we here in this place are amongst the ones who have the power to take action, the power to protect our livelihoods, our homes, the sovereign lands and totems of our first peoples, our wildlife, our well-being. So many people feel despairing and helpless and hopeless in the face of the climate crisis, feel that there is nothing that they can do that will make a meaningful difference. We here 
haven't got that excuse. We here can make laws to ban new coal and gas, which would make a massive difference globally, because we are the world's third biggest exporter of fossil fuels. We are the world's second biggest exporter of coal. We are the world's biggest exporter of gas. Senator Scar. We yeah, I'm obliged to uh, draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Bring the bills. Thank you. We have quorum. Push the bells off, Senator Rice. Thank you. As I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. We have the power. In the face of the enormity of the climate crisis, this legislation is pathetic. It should go much further, but it's a start. And one thing I've learnt in my almost nine years of being here is that we Greens are still building our power. So we don't yet have the leverage to get all the outcomes that are needed for a healthy future for us all and the planet. We have to negotiate as hard as we can, using the power we do have through being in balance of power, and then we take what we can get. We live, of course, with the cognitive dissonance of knowing that you can't negotiate with the climate that the time for urgent action was way before now, that the planet is literally burning. But in deciding whether to vote for something, when we've got as far as we can go, we have to ask ourselves a simple question. Will this legislation be a step forward or a step backwards? And the answer is this legislation, now amended with the changes negotiated by the Greens, is a step forward. There will be a hard cap on pollution. Under this legislation, pollution will actually go down. And we expect that with this hard cap, 
About half of the planned coal and gas projects won't go ahead. Half of those dirty coal and gas projects, like the fracking of the Beetaloo Basin, won't go ahead. That's significant, because every tonne of carbon we can keep out of the atmosphere makes a difference. And we've got a climate trigger so that if that hard cap is going to be or is being exceeded, then legal action can be taken to stop it. Coal and gas companies won't be able to buy their way out by buying dodgy offsets. Yes, those offsets will remain. Many of them will have more integrity, but I'm no doubt that many of them will remain being dodgy. But even those will cost the big polluters a lot. So the cost of polluting the planet, the price of coal and gas, the price of coal and gas on global markets will go up. And that's a good thing. That makes renewables more competitive. The way to keep energy prices down to generate jobs for a healthy economy is to invest in renewables, not to keep on propping up the dinosaur, dirty industries, planet-destroying industries of the past. In my first speech in this place, I said that my agenda for my time here was clear. I want to be able to look my grandchildren in the eye and tell them that it was during my time in the Senate that Australia turned the corner and legislated to begin the shift to a zero carbon safe climate economy. We are not there yet. The Labor Party is still captured by the coal and gas industry. The Liberals and the Nationals are so delusional about the reality of the climate crisis that they are totally irrelevant. So it's clear that the only way that we're going to achieve the climate action that's needed is to elect more Greens. So I ask people to not give up hope. As Antonio Guterres said, the climate time bomb is ticking. We do have time to defuse it, but it will take a quantum leap in climate action. We shouldn't have to be fighting as hard as we still are now for a healthy future, but that's our reality. So that the fight for that quantum leap continues. We are coming after all new coal and gas, all carbon pollution. We will fight together with the community with First Nations peoples. We will fight in the parliaments. We will fight in the community. We will fight with communities around the world. The countries of the global south, who stand to be amongst the most impacted people in the world through no fault of their own. We are taking a step forward with this legislation, but we have still got a very long way to go. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Queensland did not vote for this. Queensland did not vote for this at the last federal election. It did not vote for this, and as a Queensland senator, I will fight tooth and nail against this, because my voters, the people who brought me to this place, to whom I owe a deep moral obligation to represent their best interests, did not vote for this because it is not in their best interests. And Queenslanders, and as we've heard from my colleague Senator Canavan, people in Western Australia, communities in Western Australia, are going to be two of the major jurisdictions that suffer because of this legislation, this irresponsible legislation. It is easy. It is easy for people to be sanctimonious and stand up in this chamber and talk about the economy incurring costs, people potentially losing their jobs, when it's not their costs and it's not their jobs. It's not their jobs that are going to be lost. It's going to be the jobs of Queenslanders in regional Queensland, in regional Queensland and the jobs of Western Australians. They're the jobs and communities that will suffer. And they did not vote for this legislation. They did not vote for this legislation at all. Earlier this evening, we heard Senator Waters from my home state of Queensland gloat, gloat with respect to the negotiations that the Greens had with the Labor Party. And she listed, I think it was about a dozen amendments that were made which will make this legislation worse and have a greater negative impact on the people of Queensland. And Senator Waters actually gloated about it. And I'll, I'll run through a, a few of the Senator Waters' achievements because certainly I will remind voters in my home state of Queensland at the next election, I'm sure Senator McGrath will as well, Probably. as I'm sure Senator Brockman will, 
the people of Western Australia, the costs which have been imposed upon those people, upon those communities, by those Greens, in particular in the Labor Party, you should know better, upon communities who do not vote for these changes, did not vote for these changes. The first point Senator Waters of the Greens gloated about was half of the 116 new coal and gas projects would not be going ahead. And she gloated about that at a time, at a time of record high commodity prices, when this country has very high rates of debt coming out of the COVID pandemic, and we need those projects to go ahead to produce the revenue streams to address that debt, to provide essential services for, for Australians, Senator Waters gloated over the fact that half of those projects will not go ahead. Half of them. Second point Senator Waters of the Greens gloated about was the legislation of hard caps, hard caps on emissions. She gloated about that. She also gloated about the pollution trigger, which, in her view, will make it extraordinarily difficult for any new coal or gas project to actually be approved. Gloated about that. She gloated about the fact that the Beedaloo Gas Basin project, with billions of dollars of potential revenue for this country, it will be derailed as a result of the Greens' negotiation with the Labor Party. So she gloated about the end of the Beedaloo Gas Basin. She also gloated that the Barossa gas project had also been derailed. She gloated about that as well. Number six, she gloated over the fact that any new offshore gas field would have to be net zero in order to proceed, even if it was feeding gas into an existing plant. And she gloated about that because why? Why did she gloat about that? Because she said effectively that meant those new offshore gas fields would not be drilled and would not be exploited. Seven, she gloated about the imposition of an independent audit with respect to carbon credits. She gloated that a quarter of those carbon offsets potential available credits, noting that under this mechanism any carbon offset credits have to be sourced in Australia. She gloated that about a quarter of them would be stuck up in audit processes and procedural processes and wouldn't be available for offsets. She gloated about that. Number eight, she gloated about the fact that the Industrial Research and Development Act would be amended to ban any new investment in coal and gas. So she gloated about that as well. Number nine, she gloated that under the Powering Regions Fund there'd be no investments in any new gas projects. She gloated about that. Number ten, she gloated about the fact that the National Reconstruction Fund would not be able to invest in any new oil and gas projects. Gloated about that. And she gloated about a few other things as well, but at the end of the day, I got tired of listening to the gloating. I got tired of listening to the gloating, and I reflected on the fact. I reflected on the fact that before the last election, those sitting on this side of the chamber, now sitting on this side of the chamber, warned, warned that the election of a Labor government would effectively mean a power-sharing arrangement between the Greens and Labor, and that's exactly exactly what we have, and we're now seeing the fruits the fruits of that power sharing arrangement. So what do we have? Senator Canavan talked about the costs and benefits of any policy, and from my perspective, that's the first thing you do. You look at the costs and the benefits of any policy. And in this case, we're imposing a, in effect a carbon tax on 215 of the largest emitters in this country. But they're not emitters. They actually are job providers. They're employers. They produce they produce revenues of revenue streams for the Australian government and also for the state governments. They also provide market opportunities for medium-sized businesses, small businesses. They also provide a, uh, a centre of gravity for many regional towns in my home state of Queensland. They're not just emitters, but that's the whole problem with this policy. It just sees those major industrial complexes as emitters. That's what they're seen as emitters. This is a policy which doesn't see the big picture. In terms of benefits, what benefits are we going to see from this policy? Then it's not going to make any change whatsoever. It won't make any change whatsoever to the position of the world in terms of decarbonisation. In fact, in many, in many contexts, it will actually make things worse because some of those emitters will, over time, they'll close up, they won't do it with a bugle in their hand. They won't be broadcasting it. They'll do it quietly because they'll know they simply can't economically justify staying in this country. And the thing is, 
The thing is about capital, and this is the difference, the fundamental difference between the position of capital and the position of workers. Capital can move. It can move overseas, it can be invested in other jurisdictions which don't have this sort of scheme. It can move across borders. It just looks for the best place to be invested. But it's the workers, the workers who can't move. They don't have that choice. Capital has that choice. And capital, as history shows us again and again, people who own capital will exercise that choice. They will exercise that choice. And, and it's the decisions which are being made around boardrooms all over the world which will determine, which will ultimately determine, and in my view prove, that this will be a failed policy. And there's no one in this chamber, once this policy becomes law, which it comes into effect, there's no one in this chamber who will be able to change those decisions. Those decisions will be made, they'll be made on a commercial basis, and that capital will move to jurisdictions that doesn't have these taxes and doesn't have this system. Simple as that. And at the same time, at the same time, we're actually hamstringing our own economy. We don't have nuclear power in this country. We don't have nuclear power. So if you had a choice to build the next facility, the next major industrial complex in a country which had nuclear power, as opposed to a country which didn't, where would you build it? You'd go to the country with nuclear power. Why wouldn't you? It makes no sense to do it otherwise. If you had a choice between investing in a gas project for example, in Papua New Guinea, just three kilometres north of Australia, three kilometres north of Australia, the most northern point of Australia, three kilometres north, or investing in Australia, where you've got essentially this scheme under the safeguard mechanism, where are you going to invest the capital? You invest it in Papua New Guinea. Why wouldn't you? Plenty of oil and gas in Papua New Guinea. No one needs to invest a dollar of capital in this country. They can just go three kilometres north, invest it in Papua New Guinea. And of course, of course, when these large emitters move offshore, close, close their doors in Australia and move offshore. We've entered in a free trade agreement, and I believe in free trade agreements. We've entered in a free trade agreement with a whole host of countries, I think with countries now representing approximately 86 per cent of our trade, and they'll simply do the things which they would have otherwise done here, and it'll be imported to this country under free trade agreements. How could anyone compete? How can you compete? Where's the level playing field? when you're trying to compete against countries that don't have this sort of system? Where's the level playing field? There is no level playing field. And at the same time, on the very same day we're debating this, we approved a national, so-called National Reconstruction Fund, which, with $15 billion of borrowed money, is looking to invest in manufacture when we're just making it more and more difficult, more and more difficult from a cost perspective to have manufacturing in this country. Now, you don't have to believe me Madam Acting Deputy President, you don't have to believe me in relation to the impact of this policy. You just need to read some of the reaction. First, I want to talk about the cement industry. And I've had a look at the Cement Industry Federation's submission to the Safeguard Mechanism Reform Consultation Paper, and it makes for very sobering re reading. Very sobering reading. And let me quote from it. The Safeguard Mechanism. What is at risk? Proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism will result in significant carbon leakage across the $2.2 billion integrated cement manufacturing sector unless immediate action is taken to address trade exposure. Around 70 per cent of scope one emissions arise from the calcination of limestone that is unlikely to be avoided or reduced with existing technology in the next decade. So what they're telling us there, what they're telling us there is that this industry in the utmost of good faith, simply cannot meet the targets, this arithmetic target of 5 per cent, approximately 5 per cent, 4.9 per cent a year, to 2030. It's not possible on the basis of technology. Not possible. And as they say, I quote, a technology pathway exists for scope one, carbon capture, use and storage, but will not be in place until at least 2035. And then they say, unless trade exposure is addressed, there will be a strong incentive for producers to increasingly move towards an import model. Increasingly move towards an import model. What's that mean? The end of domestic jobs and they'll move the businesses offshore. That's what an import model is. I quote, at the expense of domestic production and associated employment. End quote. You've been warned. That's the cement industry. You've been warned. And what's the gas industry say? Let me quote. 
from the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association. And as I said, they've got choices. Three kilometres north of Australia is Papua New Guinea, with a lot of oil and gas reserves. Let me quote, Australia's oil and gas industry says the changes in the safeguard mechanism ignore the central role of natural gas in meeting Australia's climate goals. Australia needs to produce more gas to support decarbonisation across the economy and meet energy demand, as called for by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and Australian Energy Market Operator. New gas supply investment needs policy and regulatory certainty, but instead the Labor-Greens deal creates additional barriers to investment, further diminishing the investment environment and adding to the growing list of regulatory challenges facing the sector. So at a time when this country needs more gas, all of the policy parameters being put in place by the Labor-Greens coalition is effectively driving the gas industry to invest less capital in this country. All the pol policy parameters being set by this government are in fact pulling the levers in the opposite direction, pulling the levers in the opposite direction, providing disincentives for the gas industry to provide more supply. It makes absolutely no economic sense whatsoever. We actually need more gas, we need more baseload energy, we need that firming power, but the government's policies, whether or not it's putting a cap, a price cap, on, uh, on what gas produce, producers can supply, or whether or not now it's through the safeguard mechanism we're actually sending the policy signals to the gas producers to do the complete opposite of what we need them to do. Let's look at our aluminium industry. We've looked at the impact on cement. We looked at the impact on gas. Let's have a look at the aluminium industry. And I quote from an article that was in the Australian Financial Review, March 15, 2023 written by Jacob Grieber and Peter Kerr. And this points to the fact that whilst Labor has set $600 million aside for direct grants to help companies invest in technology to meet tougher emissions reductions, Rio Tino actually estimates that it needs to be $6 billion over the next 10 years. So the government has set $600 million for our energy-intensive trade-exposed industries to adapt Rio Tindo, who actually owns as many of those facilities as anyone in this country, says you will need $6 billion. Where's the extra $5.4 billion coming from? I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to explain it to the workers in Gladstone. You'll have to explain it to the workers in Gladstone. So, Madam Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, the people of Queensland didn't vote for this and those on this side of the chamber will fight this every day to the next election. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, as, as was foreshadowed by my good friend and colleague, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, earlier, I, I plan to spend most of my time in this place tonight. And we have ticked over midnight. Senator Scar took us over, over the midnight hour Which as we continue to debate uh, this this very, very economically damaging bill, but it's particularly economically damaging on uh, my home state of Western Australia. Now, for those listening, a few facts that should be on the table. A few facts that should be on the table about WA and the gas industry. Western Australia has the highest domestic gas consumption by industry of any state in Australia. Highest gas consumption by business of any state in Australia. Highest household use of any state in Australia. Highest exports of any state in Australia. Western Australia. Highest exports of any state in Australia. And this last one should be unsurprising when you've heard those three first three points. This last one should be under, uh, unsurprising to everyone who's listening tonight. It's also got the lowest price. It's also got the lowest price of any jurisdiction in Australia. And one of one of the Great ironies, one of the great ironies about this whole debate is we've seen those opposite, the government, in late last year, emergency session of parliament, brought everyone back from right round Australia, cost of millions, to pass emergency legislation about gas, to secure gas supplies and bring down the price. They've lauded it in this place. They criticise us constantly for not backing their terrible, terrible legislation, and we didn't back it. 
We didn't back it for the simple reason that we knew it wouldn't work. We knew it wouldn't do what the government says. In fact, we knew it would make the situation worse. We knew it would drive up energy prices and drive down gas supply. It would also damage our international trading relationships, particularly with key partners like Japan, who have invested in our gas industry, particularly in Western Australia, over decades in order to secure reliable energy supplies for their own domestic use. And the Labor government, recall parliament, panic move, you know, training wheels on move from a new government uh, to cap the price of gas and give the minister extraordinary powers to potentially divert contracted gas from overseas markets to Australia. I mean, extraordinary damaging, extraordinarily damaging legislation that the government put in place there and had exactly the opposite effect, exactly the opposite effect of the one they claimed it was going to have and still claim it's had. I mean, that's the, 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 the most hypocritical thing about this is, is that they still claim that it's driving down the price of electricity when everyone who's getting their bill everywhere across Australia knows it's actually driving prices up. It's restricting the supply of gas and driving prices up. And now we see this, this government, which is claiming to want to drive energy prices down and, and, uh, and get gas supplies into the market domestically, is yet again taking out a baseball bat and wielding it against Western Australia's fabulous gas industry. Uh, you know, the Greens, of course, belled the cat on this issue. They, they talked about the 116 projects. Half of them won't be going ahead. Half of them won't be going ahead. As my good friend Senator Canavan pointed out, a full 30 per cent of the projects that are covered by the Labor Party safeguard mechanism are from my home state of Western Australia, a full 30 per cent. And guess what? So are a very large percentage of the businesses on the Greens hit list. The Greens deal with the government that sees these gas industry developments under threat uh, by the Labor-Greens deal. And a very large chunk of them are in Western Australia. And these are not, by any stretch, small projects. I I'm not going to go through the entire list. I don't think I'd have enough time because there's just so many under threat. The numbers here are staggering. We've got projects like Scarborough, 3,200 3, jobs during construction, 600 ongoing jobs, $11 billion of investment in my home state of Western Australia. Just think about that for a moment. Think about that. Think about the, uh, the Browse project, 1,800 construction jobs, 720 jobs ongoing a $30 billion investment in the West Australian economy. Now, out of all these projects here, the Spartan Development, Cruz LNG, Scarborough, Janst Compression Project, Whitsia Stage 2, Gorgon Stage 2, etc., etc., etc. I've only got through the first half dozen. 50% of them, according to the Greens, according to this deal that's been stitched up behind closed doors that we're only finding out the details of in dribs and drabs. We haven't seen the amendments yet, as my good friend Senator O'Sullivan pointed out. We hear in dribs and drabs that under the deal that Labor and the Greens stitched up behind closed doors, fully half of these projects are not going to go ahead. Fully half of these projects are not going to go ahead. And at the same time, the Labor Party claims to want to get domestic gas flowing and get prices down. How can you square this circle? How can any reasonable Australian listen to those completely contradictory points of view coming out of the mouths of Labor Party ministers and not know that those on this side know for sure that this is just a sword of Damocles pointed at the heart of the gas industry right across Australia, be it in my home state of WA, be it in Queensland, be it in other states that should be getting their domestic gas flows flowing 
for their own domestic use. Uh, there's some misconceptions in Western Australia about the origins of the uh, gas that's available for domestic use in Western Australia. It's often claimed by the Labor Party as being of their invention through the gas reservation system in WA, but it actually wasn't. It actually goes back to the 1970s when the Sir Charles Court Liberal government undertook a take-or-pay agreement with the North West Shelf Project. That take-or-pay agreement through the then State Energy Corporation, the SEC, which many West Australians would remember very well, effectively underwrote the extraordinary cost of developing an, a relatively unproven resource in a, uh, in, a, in a very, what was then a very fledgling industry for Western Australia. And that take or pay agreement provided the backbone for the pipeline to be built, provided Order. the... Senator Pratt, do you really think that it's comparable the take or pay agreement for gas from a state energy organisation and the Labor Party's ludicrous decision to invest in projects, take equity shares out in small R&D projects right across Australia. If you do, I don't really think you understand economics. That take or pay agreement was the fundamental backbone upon which the entire West Australian gas industry grew and developed over time and has turned, as I said, into one of the great industries of Western Australia. Yep, people think about iron ore first, uh, but as a very, very close second in, and in many ways uh, an even more important part of the Western Australian economy is the WA gas industry. It's so important because it's based not just on providing cheap, high-quality gas into the domestic market in WA, as I said, the highest dom gas use in Australia, the highest household use in Australia. Third point, highest exports in Australia. WA is the gas export state, and countries rely on it. And not just any old countries, not just trade, um, uh, important trading partners, but key allies. Key allies like Japan rely on Australia to have provided a stable foundation for their own energy systems and to base their uh, economic growth, progress and development on. And it, it, it goes as no shock, no shock to anyone in this place that the Japanese government, and this has been publicly seen in the media, uh, the Japanese government was livid with this Labor government's decision late last year to not only put a cap on the domestic price of gas, but also to give the minister extraordinary powers to force gas into the domestic market and away from legitimate export contracts. That is a sovereign risk of the highest order. A sovereign risk of the highest order. But just before I end, I do want to get to this. I mean, this deal done behind closed doors between the Greens and the Labor Party. But how do the Greens talk about the government? Do you, do you know how they talk about you, Senator Gallagher? What did Nick McKim say? We have been in negotiations with a corrupt, ecocidal government of a petro state. That is how the people you just did the deal with, Senator Gallagher, talk about you. You are the corrupt, ecocidal government of a petro state. Now, I disagree with that. I mean, that's just ridiculous. But these are the people you're signing deals with. These are the people you are sacrificing the jobs of Western Australia to. These are the people you are sacrificing the economic growth of Western Australia to. These are the people that you are selling us down the river with. I mean, it, it's... It, Order. Order. We're, we're coming on to around 12.30 at night. And I, I'm, I am just shocked, shocked that as we sit here debating this, we have no idea about how these amendments will work. But what we do know, because the Greens have told us, the Greens have told us that they, this deal they've done with you will kill 50 per cent of the businesses, 50 per cent of the projects on, on the list. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they've got that information 
from Mr Bowen. Order. I'm assuming they've got that information, maybe from the Treasurer, maybe from Minister Bowen. Um, where are they getting? Did they get it from you, Senator Gallagher? Um, they're saying of those 116 projects, 50 per cent are not going to proceed. Thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs across Australia. Billions of dollars worth Order. of investment. Billions Senator, of dollars worth of investment. Senator Brockman, Senator Brockman, resume your seat. Order in the chamber. The senator deserves to be heard in silence. Senator Brockman. Oh, look, I mean, we we on this we we on this side are passionate about it uh, because. It's, it's, it's almost shocking. I mean, you would, you would laugh if you weren't going to cry. You would laugh if you weren't going to cry, because this is real people's lives. This is real people's lives we're putting on the line. These aren't fictional characters. These aren't hypothetical jobs. These are people. A lot of them live in Perth. A lot of them FIFO up to the regional areas. A lot of them live in the regional areas. Um, good construction jobs, high-paying jobs. Great jobs in the oil and gas industry, high tech jobs in the oil and gas industry. And these are the jobs that the Labor Party is willing to sacrifice to the Greens, who call them corrupt, ecocidal, controllers of a petro state. I mean, it's just extraordinary that you, you could even sit down with these, this, this, this attitude. I mean, it's extraordinary. And as I said, this is a government that still claims it's putting downward pressure on energy prices and upward pressure on the supply of gas. Pressure. Meanwhile, what they're really doing is squeezing supplies, hurting foreign investment in this country, talking down a great industry, a great industry from my home state of Western Australia, an industry that is relied upon by our trading partners such as Japan. Taiwan, um, so many other important trading partners of Australia who rely on us having the sovereign stability, the stability of our markets, the stability of our regulatory arrangements that, uh, that, that allow them to know that when they contract to Australia it will be delivered. And all this is being put at risk. And on top of that, you must think about the cost of living pressures this is putting on Australian families. So on top of all that, on top of the, the bad outcome for Western Australia, on top of the job losses, on top of the, all these businesses and projects closing down, you're forcing up costs on a people, on families, Order. on small businesses right across Australia. And I Order. think shame, shame on this government. Shame on doing this deal with a group of people who call you corrupt. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I want to put on the record that we in the Nationals do support action on climate change, despite what everyone says about us being head in the sand, climate deniers, that is not true. The Nationals believe climate change, the climate is changing. I know it. I live in the regions. I'm married to a farmer. I've been flooded. I've been through drought. I see it all the time. I understand, we understand, that we have to adapt. What we don't believe in is hiding the impact of, this, of policies on the Australian people. Mm. And this bill does exactly that. Hear, hear. We need to understand exactly how this measure and the measures in this bill and the agreements with the Greens work with other government policies. Because can I remind you all here today that we have just debated the National Reconstruction Fund. And so many of the measures in the National Reconstruction Fund are going to be impacted by the measures in this bill. 
When introducing the National Reconstruction Fund policy, Deputy Leader of the Government Richard Miles said it would create secure jobs, including uh, superannuation funds, drive economic development. And maybe it would. But this bill cancels so much of what the NRF intended. A classic case of robbing Peter to pay Paul. How does this bill support the objectives of the National Reconstruction Fund? I'll give you one example of concern. So I know the wool industry, and I've talked to them, and the Australian wool producers have been working towards trying to develop phase one wool processing here in Australia. Mm. I 100 per cent support that. Admirable. We used to do it once upon a time. We offshored it when it became cheaper and easier. Understandably. The National Reconstruction Fund was to reshore a lot of those processes. Now, I hear you all going, this bill won't impact on them because this bill only impacts on the 215 top emitters. I call that for what it is. Because while well, this bill impacts the 215 top emitters, the impact on Australian agriculture is hidden. Mm. Because under this bill, what are our wool producers going to be faced with? Are we going to be faced with the Woodsides and the Rio Tintos and the BHPs going, turn your pastures into offsets? Mm. That's the risk we have here. These are the flow-on impacts that no one has considered. Think about what we already do in this country. We first phase cotton, we mill, mill wheat. We've got the largest rice mill in the southern hemisphere in my hometown of Deniliquin. But all that could be put at risk by this bill. The sort of industry I want to see supported by the National Reconstruction Fund is now at risk. If we pass this bill, those hopes are dashed, not because they're in the 215, but it's the flow on impacts. Mm. And this is what Labor are so good at doing. They have very good thought bubbles, very good intents. But they don't look at where the ball ends. Clearly, none of them hang out in the uh, pinball galleries that I hung out with, hung out in in the 80s. Let's look at the hopes of our farmers across Australia, our farmers who largely support net zero objectives. When in government, we on this side promised to get to net zero by technology, not taxes. We promised to ensure our farmers could benefit and not suffer. That's why we always looked at the consequential impacts, not just the implementation. Under this bill, the overwhelming narrative suggests the most likely solution for the 215 covered emitters is to seek at least a substantial part of their emissions reduction via the utilisation of offsets. And while we in government sought to encourage farmers to increase soil carbon, increase biodiversity, improve land and soil management without locking it up and walking away, this bill risks all of that by the simple provision, as agreed to with the Greens, mm. <coughs> that Australian biggest, Australia's biggest admitters can now just effectively buy land. That's right. Because no longer 
according to Adam Bant in his announcement, Australian carbon credit units must be frozen for uh, uh, HIRs. So this mechanism will enable our biggest emitters to offset their emissions by locking up land. You cannot set up a system that works for our nation and works for our economy, whereby the biggest emitters can just buy a farm, mm. chuck a few seeds out and call it offsets. That right. is not good for our country. It's not good for our economy. It is not good for our trading partners either. A massive risk to our sustainable agricultural industries, sustainable agricultural industries, is to have big business buy up and lock up arable land to sow some seeds and walk away calling it offsets. That is the epitome of land use conflicts. Well-meaning farmers will walk away from what has been successful carbon sequestering projects. We can not continue to export our problems. Mm. We are so good at that in this country. <laughs> we have people saying we should not grow rice in this country. Everyone else should grow rice and we'll just buy their rice because we're a dry continent. We're also the most efficient rice-growing continent in the world when it comes to water per tonne. Why are we exporting our problems? Live exports. We say, oh, we'll shut down live exports. But do you know what happens if we shut down our live exports where we have certified animal welfare processes in place. Another country establishes that market That's right. and live exports. That's and that other country, can I tell you, their animal welfare practices are nowhere near up to our standards. We have to stop thinking that we are you know, somehow, the, the, if we walk away from a market, there will create a vacuum that will never be filled. Vacuums get filled and they don't always get filled by better industries. This bill will dismantle an otherwise balanced approach by pricing carbon at $75 for now, let's just put that out there too, for now, we will have a price that is three times higher than what was proposed by the previous Labor government. It's also higher than the carbon price of eight out of 10 of our top 10 two-way trading partners. Mm. It ignores the fact that many of our trading partners and competitors don't have a national carbon pricing scheme. And we've heard from many of my colleagues tonight about the inflationary pressures of this bill. Mm. We've heard about the impact that this bill will have on our energy prices. I also want to highlight, you know, I'm in New South Wales. We've just had a change of government. The new government, one of the first things the new government said was they're going to fast track the Narrabri gas project. Oh. Oh. Good. Cooey. I support that. How does that fit into this bill? How does that fit into the agreement with the Greens who were saying that you cannot have any new gas projects unless they offset their scope. One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, let's just continue. 
all of their emissions have to be offset. Does that mean that Narrabine gas project that's finally got the golden tick? And yes, I admit, golden tick by Labor, not by us. Congratulate Labor. And now it's going to be shot down by Labor under this. You wouldn't read about it. I just really wish that we could look at the impact of these policies on the broader scheme of things. This is not about the 215 top emitters. This is about our economy. Get real. Thank you. Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, De Mr Deputy President. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a disappointing that I have to give this speech at 20 to 1 in the morning uh, because the Labor government want to ram this bill through and avoid any scrutiny and transparency. And they certainly wouldn't want the media reporting on just how damaging and destructive this bill will be to the country of Australia. It won't be long before we'll end up the way we started as a convict colony, enslaved to uh, you know, ideas and um, regulations imposed upon us by other people in the world uh, that is basically going to destroy business in this country. I mean, it effectively, what this bill does, it wants to get big companies to reduce their emissions by 5 per cent per year until 2030. Uh, the only way you can really ever do that is through offsets, because it's impossible not to produce carbon uh, dioxide if you're running power. So if you're going to buy offsets, you're going to have to either buy offsets offshore, which means money is going to go offshore, or you can actually move offshore which means that money, businesses and jobs will go offshore. You can go broke, which means basically people lose their jobs here in Australia, or you can buy offsets here in Australia. Now, the only way you can really buy offsets here in Australia is by buying agricultural land and locking it up. Okay, now, I, I have seen firsthand what that does to the communities in southwest Queensland when you lock up the mulga. You end up with feral pests. You get the, the farmers sell up. They pack up and move to the coast. So those uh, small towns out in regional Australia start to lose people. Then they, they then lose services, and eventually those towns are going to die. And our wealth comes from the regions. So this bill is going to destroy not just industry but agriculture as well. And of course, the irony of it is, is only a few hours ago. Uh, tonight, you know, the, the so-called National Reconstruction Fund was passed, where the Labor government are going to basically spend $15 billion on supposedly uh, rebuilding manufacturing in this country. Now, I have no idea how you think you're going to rebuild manufacturing in this country when you're whacking a penalty tax of up to $275 per tonne on every uh, tonne of carbon that's produced by a, a, you know, a, a prospective Factory. So, uh, you know, this bill is going to be really bad for the Australian economy and, and the Australian country as a whole. And, you know, Labor want to replace, you know, cheap, reliable baseload energy in the, in the form of coal and gas with renewable energy. And, of course, this renewable energy is actually built and constructed offshore. So we are taking away, we're shutting down the things that we have a natural advantage at, all those vast natural resources we have, and we're going to start importing from other countries the stuff that we originally exported, added value to. We're going to end up paying three, four, five, six, seven, eight times more than what we got for it if we are actually able to sell it in the first place, which we won't be doing for much longer because of these ridiculous laws. So, you know. Out there, I'll come back to my hometown, Cogan Creek, cheapest coal mine, cheapest power station in Australia. It's right there in the ground. The coal is owned by the people of Queensland. It only costs the cost of production to get it out of the ground, 
burn it in the coal-powered fire station, and you've got cheap and reliable energy. It is that simple. But yet with renewables, you've got to not just build and generate, you've got to actually store energy and you've got to recycle the energy. So the storage, the storage is humongous. You know, the, the Labor government is spending $224 million on 400 community batteries that power 100,000 people. If you were to do that across the country for the 10 million households, it would cost $22 billion. That's just for storing energy. That is just for storing energy. So we're getting two kicks in the guts out of all of this. Number one is we're going to shut down industry in this country. And number two, any industry that can survive the enormous cost of uh, the carbon credits, et cetera, et cetera, is then going to be forced to pay a, a, a lot more money for renewable energy. So I just cannot see how industry in this country is going to survive. And they won't. They will pack up and move offshore. And all these oil and gas companies, they will go to other places. They will go to other places. Indonesia has heaps of coal. Papua New Guinea has heaps of oil and gas. Okay? They aren't going to stay in Australia with this amount of red tape. I mean, we've already been burdened over the years with you know, six unnecessary state governments that just have their own different laws and regulations, and now we're going to have this particular bill. And of course, it is so typical of Labor to want to sneak this bill through in the dead of night because they don't want any scrutiny. They don't want the journalists who are normally up in the press gallery here listening to the speeches delivered tonight because they don't want it on the record that they are killing this country stone cold dead. And for what? And for what? Just eight years ago, the CSIRO had its own report that said Australia absorbs two billion tonnes in carbon dioxide. Human emissions are 497 million tonnes. Australia absorbs four times more already than what humans emit. So why aren't we fighting when we go over to these international bodies? Why aren't we saying to them, well, actually, we don't have to do anything because we've reached net zero four times over? Why aren't we out there selling, turning this upside down and actually getting these other countries to buy carbon credits off us? Why on earth is Australia, one of the least densely populated countries in the world, paying a tax on an ideology that hasn't even been proven? The whole name greenhouse gas is an oxymoron. Greenhouse is a solid object. It traps convection. Gases don't trap convection. CO2 absorbs incoming radiation as well as outgoing radiation. It absorbs the incoming radiation at 2.8 microns, five times stronger than the outgoing radiation. Don't believe me? Look at the NASA energy budget. It's all there. And yet you people sit here day in, day out, saying that this isn't enough. This bill doesn't go far enough. We've only got 20 years to save the earth or it's all going to come to an end. Well, let's look at some of these crazy predictions. You know, Al Gore said that you know, there's a 70 per cent chance that there's going to be no ice in the Antarctic over summer. Never happened. You know, Greta Thunberg said that in five years' time, which is about two months away, uh, the, the world is going to be past a, a, a cataclysmic climate event uh, from which we can never return. Not going to happen. Tim Flannery said that the dams would never fill again. Never happened. We filled them up numerous times. You know, I'm still waiting. I've, I've got a fatwa out on my good friend Andrew Bragg here that if Fort, uh, Fort Denison hasn't actually halfway underwater by 2030, I'm coming for him. And he knows it. And he'll be sitting up there in his room and he's quaking in his boots. Because he knows, and I will guarantee you, that if I'm still here in 2030, the water levels will not have risen because they've been predicting this rubbish since the 70s. And I noticed Senator Rice was out there saying how 30 years ago she was taught about climate change and greenhouse gases. Well, guess what? Climate change does exist. It's the weather. Tycho Brahe proved it 16, in 1609, him and Johannes Kepler, because the planet moves in an ellipse. Okay? Sometimes we're further from the sun and sometimes we're closer to the sun. That affects climate. 
You know, 20,000 years ago we had an ice age. We've actually been warming for 20,000 years. It's called the Holocene period. You know, there's plenty of evidence of all of this going on. But yet here we are tonight driving our country into the ground because of a fantasy. A fantasy from this side of the chamber that think that women can be men and men can be women and black people can be white people and white people can be black people and gases can be solids and solids can be gases. You're taught in grade eight that material can come in three substances, a gas, a solid and a liquid. A greenhouse is a solid object. It traps convection. Gases don't trap convection. Okay? And of course these over here mock, but they haven't got a clue about thermodynamics because they're intellectual pygmies. And when you get the intellectual pygmies and you cross them with the unicorn farmers, you end up with a catastrophe. You end up with an economic catastrophe that is going to destroy this country. And shame on you. And shame on you that you can't do this in the, in the light of day because you can't face scrutiny. You cannot face scrutiny. And that is the modus operandi of the Labor Party. Ever since you know, the Prime Minister came out and said there was going to be all this accountability and transparency, well, there's none. This is getting rammed through in the last minute with some crazy amendments by the Greens, and they're proud of it. They are proud of the fact they are driving this country, driving this country into bankruptcy. We are going to be the Argentina of the 21st century at the rate we're going, and it won't take long with you guys. It's not going to take long with you guys to drive us into the ground, because you guys have no idea what you're talking about. You're ideological fools, and this bill, this bill, I tell you what, you'll have reversed course on this by 2030. You will reverse course on this before 2030, because we are going to see jobs driven out of this country. I mean, and this is on top of, and you know, as, as we transition from the cheap, reliable baseload energy to the renewable energy, this is on top of the cost of living pressures, because we've got an RBA that's jacked up interest rates by 10%. You know, on the back of all this crazy spending from COVID forced on us by the, the crazy Labor premiers, okay, this is going to end very bad very, very soon. And you know, for you guys to be sitting over there laughing, well, mark my words, the day will come when we look back on you guys and the world, we won't be laughing, we'll be shaking our heads going, why on earth did we let this happen? And you're sitting there all buried in your phones because you know that you can't justify this bill. Because you don't have the intelligence nor the integrity okay, to actually explain this bill. You cannot explain how sticking a tax, sticking a tax, a carbon yes, tax Sorry, on Senator industry Rennick. for a point of order. Point of order. Um, Senator Rennick should be directing his remarks through the chair and not directly across the chamber. Thank you for that guidance. Through the chair, and of course I should have gone through the chair because silly me to think that the other side would not be so fragile and brittle to have to get pe pe petty. To have to get petty. Okay? Hey? And that's because they can't handle the fact, Dep Mr Deputy President, that they don't want to be scrutinised. They can't explain how sticking a tax on industry for a gas that, yet again, we were taught in grade eight, it's called photosynthesis, it's plant food. Who on earth would come up with this sort of idea to tax something that's a natural part of the environment? Who would do that? Only a party that doesn't care for our children's future or our country's future, and all they are going to do is empower other countries, other countries that, you know, will end up taking us over one way or the other, if they want to. I mean, why they'd bother coming here? I mean, they take one look at the people in power at the moment and they'd run a mile. Who would want to come to this country? Okay? And yet, you know, and the other thing is, this, this is what I love about Labor policy. It is so inconsistent. They're out there skiding about how they've got a high immigration rate, right? They're, they're, they're saying, oh, we've got 300,000 people, immigrants coming in again. 
If you wanted to reduce emissions, wouldn't you actually lower immigration? Wouldn't you lower immigration? And while you're at it, stick a tax on the universities that don't pay tax on all these fees they earn from foreign students. Okay? Why don't you get the universities to pay for all the extra demand from these students as they come in and take houses? I mean, you're going to put this housing fund up. Yet again, more contradictions from the Labor Party. High immigration that puts pressure on the cost of living, pressure on housing. What are you going to do about it? More immigration. Because, of course, they can always then get the immigrants. They meet them at the border and say, vote for us. We're Labor. We're going to look after you. And, of course, it's all false economy stuff. It's all false economy stuff because this party has no idea what they're doing. They don't understand economics. They don't understand science. They don't understand patriotism. They are an absolute utter disgrace. An absolute utter disgrace that has basically got to ram this legislation through in the dead of night. They don't want anyone listening to any speeches because they don't want any scrutiny because they can't answer the questions. That they are sticking a tax on the Australian people because other people on the other side of the world have said so. You don't answer to the Australian people. You're a pack of tra uh, you, you don't have any loyalty to this country. Shame on you. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, the Albanese government's, government safeguard mechanism is the most egregious attack on Australian investment, Australian jobs and Australian prosperity. And Australians and our first world standard of living are being sold out by a Labor Greens government so deaf to industry concerns, to the threat to Australian jobs and so determined to impose its extreme ideology that it's willing to sacrifice our most important industries to damage small business and to send families broke. And at a time when cost of living are eroding household budgets at a rate of knots, Prime Minister Albanese and Minister Bowen have signed a dodgy deal with the Greens, Shame. and they're ramming through these laws that just add to this pain. The Labor Party is captive to the Greens, and the Greens are captive to the renewable energy industry. The government's approach to the cost of living crisis is forcing our most productive and job-creating industries to pay a new tax to meet over-ambitious emissions goals. And the resources sector's royalties and PRRT, corporate, payroll and PAYG taxes pay for Australia's first world lifestyle, the public health and education, roads and NDIS. And that, by the way, is 40 per cent of Australia's company tax takes and their employee PAYG take contributes the same proportion. This sector operates to the highest mining, safety and environmental standards in the world. It is the mining industry that employs the environmental scientists that carries out the rehab projects and funds community engagement. Once Australia's golden child, the resources sector is now the whipping boy of an administration consumed by the fantasy that it can tax its way to prosperity. What makes Labor's gas-phobic approach more nonsensical is that even the European Union has laboured gas a green source of energy. And even though Germany is recommissioning coal-fired power stations and the UK is rationing energy even after spending hundreds of billions of euros on decarbonising, Labor somehow thinks Australia is immune from the same economic realities. The safeguard mechanism is not about decarbonisation. It is about deindustrialisation. Yep. It will cripple Australia's resources and manufacturing sector, making our country a worse place. All Labor and the Greens have succeeded in doing is putting a hard cap on future economic growth, because if industries cannot develop in Australia, they will look to move overseas. This safeguard mechanism will export Australian resources jobs and import Chinese-made renewables. Labor talks about transitioning resources jobs to new jobs, but what jobs exactly does Labor propose that will replace mining jobs paid at double the rate of the average Australian wage? I wonder if the CMMEU and the AWU have given their blessing 
this anti-investment, anti-job legislation. This is a government that is so light on business experience that they have no understanding of the incredibly competitive nature right. of the investment dollars in this world. No idea. And what are businesses saying? Well, Bowen Coking Coal CEO Nick Jaws said, it is fanciful to think that reducing our high quality exports in the face of record demand will do anything other than drive up energy and steel prices create a net increase in global emissions and destroy Australian jobs, both in the regions and in the cities. And the president of Peabody's Australian operations, Jamie Frankcombe, said the company was concerned the legislation would, quoting, make the mining industry less competitive at a time when it is integral to providing the minerals and the energy required for the energy transition. It will reduce our cost competitiveness, lead to potential job losses and hurt regional communities. Industry is telling the government that this legislation is a direct threat to the jobs and investment that the resources sector provides, jobs and investment that support regional Australia and drive our economic growth. We warned that a Labor government would have the Greens riding resources policy, and as I've described it before, we have the Greens tail wagging the Labor dog. The Labor Party has never sought to engage the coalition in these discussions. We warned Australia before the election that if Labor were elected, the Greens would be writing Australia's resources policies, yep. and this has turned out to be true. Yep. The coalition highlighted our concerns on a 43 per cent emissions 2030 target well before the election and have not changed from that position. We supported a measured cooperative approach to net zero by 2050 using technology to reduce our emissions, and they were. This latest deal between Labor and the Greens is simply a doubling down on this bad policy. Prices will go up, investment will go down, emissions will be sent offshore and multiply. The Greens' demands on the safeguard mechanism will only worsen our impending energy and gas crisis. Yet the government appears to be driving headlong into these looming shortages. At a time when AEMO is warning of gas shortages, these policy settings will result in investment dollars being allocated to other projects, not here in Australia. And many resource companies have described to me the difficulty in convincing their shareholders and investment boards to continue investing in Australian projects that have increasing costs of electricity, industrial relations uncertainty, approval delays and now a carbon tax on emissions. Right. They describe attempting to tell the government that they can't meet the emissions reductions in these ridiculous timelines and Labor's response is to lift the big stick of penalties higher. Now, this may suit the Greens, considered by their European counterparts to be the most extreme socialist party, but it will be devastating for Australians who have come to enjoy our comfortable lifestyle. Labor have touted the importance of gas as a future fuel source. But the PM, the Energy Minister and the Resource Minister all highlight this. Yet it is apparent they continue to ignore industry and the warning signs the Coalition have been pointing at over the last 10 months. The safeguards mechanism is simply another burden to the gas industry that is already struggling against bad labour policies. Let's list them. Market intervention, NOPSEMA reviews and call-ins, mandatory code of conduct and reasonable pricing provisions, ADGSM reforms, funding environmental lawfare groups and the creation of a new environmental protection agency. AEMO, the ACCC, APIA, gas companies and the Coalition have all been warning Labor that their policies are making the gas market worse. The continued interventions are in fact leading to reduced supply, less investment certainty, higher prices, less jobs. But all of this eventually leads to blackouts and rationing. As APIA CEO Samantha McCulloch said, the Labor-Greens deal creates additional barriers to investment, further diminishing the investment environment and adding to the growing list of regulatory challenges facing the sector. 
or today in The Australian, the safeguard mechanism announcement is the latest example of government action not matching the rhetoric. Just see the trend of cascading interventions in the domestic gas market while the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, AEMO and the government are all stressing the need for new gas supply. This is a government that can't manage the energy market. It is a government that is putting Australian jobs on the line, future investment on hold and Australia's future prosperity at risk. The next budget will be built on the strength of the resources sector, a sector that brings in $450 billion in export earnings in 2022-23, a sector that makes up 13 per cent of our GDP, a sector that supports over 1.1 million well-paid Australian jobs. We know that gas is a flexible, reliable fuel source that is vital for manufacturing, for baseload supply and heating, and yet Labor is bent on demonising this industry. And if Australia becomes an untenable investment location, producers will move offshore, meaning emissions will move offshore as well, not go down. Gas will become more expensive if we are forced to import supply. We don't even have the infrastructure to import gas to the market. Labor has promised a dream to Australians less than 12 months ago, and how quickly that has become a nightmare. It's a nightmare where industry Order. emissions are Order. exported from Australia to higher-emitting countries, where jobs are created in China and India and lost in Australia. It is beyond arrogant to suggest that winning government with the lowest primary vote in decades gives you a mandate to completely upend Australia's way of life in this matter and for no guarantee of better environmental outcomes. Prime Minister, I urge you to abandon this headlong, crazy rush to a jobless Greens-led future and instead encourage businesses to operate in the most cost-effective, efficient and sustainable manner possible. Families, business owners, workers and shareholders rely on strong resources and mining companies operating with confidence and certainty. But Australians must be told the real price of the safeguard mechanism under Labor and the Greens, the real price of investments moving from this country to other jurisdictions, the loss of jobs and the increase in the cost of living. I think that price is too high. So do I. I think that those opposite who are laughing listening to me demonstrate their lack of understanding of how fragile the investment world is. Order. Order. I think that Australians will understand the cost of this policy as they see costs of Order. the Senator cost of Collins. this policy will be real jobs That's for right. real Australians. That's right. That's it is the wrong. increased costs that the BCA members will buy credits, buy offsets and pass them through to Australians in higher costs of living. Right. It is the lack of understanding from those on the other side that means that they have no understanding of how dangerous this policy is. Because these companies are telling me that they cannot get the government to understand that their investment boards are saying we have other options. Of course. We have hundreds of projects that are available in the US for gas, in Indonesia for coal, in South America for copper. They have choices. 
and when their boards are looking at the sovereign risk that Australia is now providing, they are saying that they will choose somewhere else. And Australians are already, in parts of regional Queensland, getting the bad news from small gas producers that their investors have pulled out, that they cannot get investors to underwrite the sort of market intervention that this government has introduced. Right. If you don't believe me, I will give you their names of families who are already feeling the pain of this government's intervention. And for those people, that price is too high. Unfortunately, the rest of Australia is starting to wake up, is starting to see the cost of this Labor-Greens coalition and the devastating impact on Australian investment, Australian jobs, Australian taxes and Australian lifestyles. Thank you. Senator McDonald. Well, Senator Little. Thank you. Well, I've actually worked in one of those global companies that packed up and went somewhere else right. amid operating uncertainty. And it was a very fast action, and in your own state of South Australia, Senator Grogan. This bill will damage Australian industries, threaten thousands of Australian jobs, and particularly have an adverse impact on some important industries in my home state of South Australia. The industries Order. I've actually worked in, I've Senator had a Little. very, very diverse Order. career. I can talk with some credibility Senator on Little. how easy Senator it is Little, just please to do take that. a for a moment. Senators, I'll ask that you remain in silence as uh, Senator Little continues her speech as she has the right to be heard. Thank you. Senator Little. Thank you. The Coalition supports action on climate change, but with a sensible transition to net zero emissions, which protects Australian jobs, our towns and our regions, yes, careful management is required to ensure Australia's industries progress while remaining strong and prosperous. Businesses directly targeted by this legislation believe this will, for them, drive up the cost of energy, destroy jobs and stifle or even kill foreign investment. In short, it will damage prosperity. We live in a global economy and with that the reality businesses can go elsewhere if the numbers don't stack up. Because unlike the Australian Greens and the Albanese Labor government, they are not driven by ideology. Reducing carbon emissions is important. This does nothing to combat the global problem of emissions. In government, the coalition met and exceeded Australia's Kyoto targets signed Australia up to achieving net zero by 2050, reduced emissions by more than 20 per cent on our 2005 base level and was well on track to beat Paris Treaty commitments. Words are important. These 215 companies are not just emitters. They are employers, contributors to local, regional and the national economy and contributors by way of wages and taxes so that Australians can maintain our standard of living, though fast eroding. Under the coalition, emissions reductions were driven by the Emissions Reduction Fund, which supported voluntary action by landholders, businesses and communities. In contrast, Labor's changes to safeguard mechanism will force facilities to reduce their emissions intensity by up to 4.9 per cent each year, regardless of whether the technology exists for them to do so. Failure to meet the government's emission targets or purchase the necessary amount of offsets will see a business fined $275 per tonne. This idea presents unacceptable risk and, in fact, risks Australia's sovereign manufacturing capabilities. Something we have been hearing from Labor is so important to it and to this country. In this time of uncertainty, even fools know that higher costs in productions will be passed on and impact along the supply chain, and eventually it will hit everyday consumers. Labor's claim that its safeguard mechanism policy mirrors the coalition's is misleading. There has been insufficient assessment of the impacts of this reform. It is not equitable for Australian industries, and there is no detail on costs. The safeguard mechanism first introduced by the former coalition government has been working for years 
providing a system to cap emissions while still encouraging the economy to grow. The coalition's was an approach that appreciated each business was different, needed time to change to comply with it and to invest in the technology needed if indeed it existed. It was an approach that understood the realities of operating businesses by backing them to develop the technology. But this is a blunt instrument that penalises business and imposes more taxes. The former coalition government laid out a plan to achieve net zero by 2050 without new taxes. It supported a carbon trading system that rewarded businesses that voluntarily reduced their emissions. It provided a plan to create incentives and support businesses that made the transition to net zero. What is proposed here is a tax, as only Labor knows how to do so, effectively tax, tax and more tax. As if higher and rising energy prices and significant labour shortages are not enough, now businesses have to contend with this tax and compete against producers in other countries where regulation is almost non-existent, where there are lower wages and production costs. We rely on trade with others. We are an open economy. Pricing carbon at $75 a tonne means Australia will have a price that is three times higher than the one set by the previous Labor government, and it could rise to 100 a tonne by 2030. It is also much higher than the carbon price of eight of Australia's top 10 two-way trading partners. Many of our trading partners and international competitors for key industries, including alumina, cement, copper, coal, gas and iron ore, do not have any national carbon pricing scheme in place at all. This legislation delivers them even greater competitive advantage. Neostar, Symec, Santos, Hallett Concrete, Adelaide Brighton Cement and Kimberley Clark are company, companies operating in my home state impacted by this legislation, to name some. It would also have an immediate and direct effect on the towns of Wyala, Port Pirie and York Peninsula. Change always has consequences, both intentional and unintentional. I've actually been contacted directly by companies who are concerned about the ability to remain competitive and are working through very real scenarios that include the prospect of shutting up or moving out. The sovereign risk is also very real. These are businesses with long histories that make decisions on the basis of opportunity cost, on sunk costs and on economic reality. In this time of economic instability, through rising costs and changes in regulatory environment, this could not be happening at a worse time. It risked the jobs of thousands of Australians. Yes, real jobs. We've seen tonight the Australian Greens celebrate what they say will be the shutting down of, of projects in coal and gas. There is little regard for workers, families and communities who rely on the coal industry that employed 46,000 people in 2022. The Australian gas industry supply chain directly employs 165,000 Australians. They too won't be joining the Australian Greens as they celebrate. You know who else won't be celebrating? Try the producers of concrete and mortar. That's the materials for the bridges we need built, the pavers we walk on and the houses we live in. What, we, what they see is cheaper imports of cement and other masonry products flooding into the Australian market, products manufactured offshore where there is no impost on emissions in effect increasing global emissions while crippling Australian businesses. This legislation means for cement industries there is the very real prospect of importing a critical ingredient called clinker. By manufacturing it here, at least they get to control the quality, compressive strength and, and the setting pro properties of that cement. Or they buy products from overseas where there is less control. These are the decisions they'll have to make. Adelaide Brighton Cement is one of, the, of one of Australia's largest cement, lime, concrete and masonry producers with its base in my hometown of Adelaide. It has other production plants around the country. It is a company employing almost 2,000 people on a full-time basis in SA with a total gross value of $515 million to the state. Around the nation, Adbury employs over 11,000 people and provides 
total gross value to the Australian economy of $3.1 billion. It has been implementing strategies to reduce emissions, but expects this 4.9 per cent annual decrease in emissions by 2030 will place their company at risk and make them less competitive than overseas importers. It is, in effect, being now punished for almost totally converting its plants to gas rather than coal and for making significant inroads in the use of lower carbon alternative fuels. Another company is Nearstar, a global multi-metal business employing 1,300 people in Australia, more than 800 people at its Port Piri plant in South Australia and another 500 at its Hobart plant. Real people, real jobs. Nearstar Port Piri is meeting the global demand for metals that are critical to the world's decarbonised future. Zinc, lead and copper are products particularly in demand for the production of things like batteries and cabling and other components for electrical products. Just like Adelaide Brighton Cement, Nearstar has worked on lessening their carbon footprint. It says the time frame is unreasonable. You'd know that if you worked in the industry or consulted it rather than consulting your union masters or the Greens. The fact that the Port Piri site uses pyrometallurgical processes means it is hard to abate because the technology is not there yet. These are very real issues and are amplified and articulated clearly in submissions to the Senate Standing Committee on Environment and Communications looking at the implications of this bill. The Business Council of Australia warned you heard the South Australian examples, I'm sure. The president, they're going through you. The uh, Business Senator Council Grogan. of Australia warned the emissions decline rate for industrial facilities of 4.9 per cent annually will be challenging for many industries. And we know that's code for the costs will be passed on. Again, in my home state, the forestry industry is worth $1.4 billion in revenue. You want more houses? It takes 17 trees on average to build a house and the industry supplies your toilet paper and cork. They will be impacted by this. The Australian Forest Products Association argues this is being implemented too quickly without due consideration of the consequences and possible outcomes. This Albanese government has already hit Australian households with high costs of living and is determined to hit them again. Their carbon tax will lead to more expensive building material costs and don't you know, in the middle of a housing affordability crisis, higher transport and fuel costs in response to rising energy bills and higher food costs as supply chains respond to the reality of these changes. What we do know is that producers of cement, steel and aluminium are large employers and hard to abate sectors. They know what's coming from this. They have told us. The coalition understands Australians want action on climate change, but those same Australians deserve to know the cost to them under Labor's plans. Where is the evidence of impact on the Australian economy? Where? Where is the Treasury modelling? Where is it? Where is the modelling on the carbon cre credit market impact? Not there. Haven't seen it. There are too many risks outlined by people who run the businesses that this policy is intending to impact and too many unanswered questions in Labor's climate policy. Not good for you, not good for businesses you rely on, not good for your purse or your hip pocket. But how much during this time of great uncertainty and high costs is something you are yet to find out. Too many issues, too little information to even consider supporting this bill for South Australians, for Australian industry and for Australians. It must be no. Senator Chandler. Thank you. This morning, I should say, to make a contribution on the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Bill 2023. And in my first speech to this place um, almost four years ago, I spoke about a number of different things, but one thing I was particularly passionate about and still am particularly passionate about. Uh, is the opportunities that has been provided to my home state of Tasmania as a result of strong coalition governments and the detriment to my home state when it is led by 
Labor Green minority governments. And I made many references in that first speech to uh, the time in the period of 2010 to 2014 when Tasmania was led by a Labor Green minority government at a state level and, to an extent, at a federal level, um, and the impact that we saw of that on, on my home state. Industries were being shut down. Um, unemployment was absolutely through the roof. More people were coming to Tasmania um, than sorry, more people were leaving Tasmania than were coming to um, our, my, my home state. And, and that was a result, um, President, of the Labor Green minority government and their job destroying policies that they implemented upon Tasmania. And I'm very sad to say that tonight, uh, this morning, with this bill, history is repeating itself because this is the week where the Labor government has stopped even pretending to be on the side of jobs and investment and announced that they are just on the side of the Greens. Uh, yesterday, sorry, um, given it's almost 1.30 a.m. I should say the day before yesterday, uh, we had the Albanese government's new policy on this safeguarding mechanism announced by the Greens leader in a Greens press conference. This is a week in which the Labor Party's entire agenda is predicated on doing deals with the Greens. In an election campaign, <coughs> Labor goes round telling Australians that they're not like the Greens, that they know the Greens are job destroyers, that they know the Greens hate many of our key industries and want to shut them down. But when they get into government, the first thing they do is go and get into a back room with the Greens and tell them that they're on the same team here and what do you need to give us, or what do we need to give you in order for you to let us ram legislation through this parliament? And that is exactly what happened following the last election, and that is exactly what is happening with this bill that we are debating here in the Senate right now. The Labor government wants to pretend that they are in support of manufacturing. Yet they're doing deals with the Greens that are going to make it harder and more expensive for manufacturing businesses to operate in Australia. They want to pretend they're on the side of the mining industry, but then they do a deal with the Greens to stop new mining ventures and put huge pressure on existing ones. The Greens are openly boasting about how Labor has done a deal with them to stop new mining projects and gas projects. How many jobs is that going to kill off? What impact is that going to have on cost of living for Australians? How much more expensive is it going to be? Um, is it going to make our energy prices, which we know are already skyrocketing under Labor? Like I said in my opening remarks, coming from Tasmania, I know all too well, and Tasmanians know all too well, the damage that is done to an economy when Labor and the Greens team up. Entire industries like the forestry industry are completely decimated. A generation of tradies will pack up uh, and move to the mainland because there wasn't enough work in Tasmania, as was the case historically. The Labor Party sent a message to business that their priority was staying in power with the help of the Greens, and the result was businesses packed up or went out of business, were forced out of business by those job-destroying policies of the Labor Green government. Now, if you genuinely want to send a message to Australian workers in mining or in forestry or agriculture or aquaculture or manufacturing or any of the incredibly important industries to our economy, that you support them, the absolute last thing you would do is a deal with the Greens. And yet, that is exactly what the Albanese Labor government has done. And of course, it's not just one deal. We've already seen on numerous occasions Labor going to the Greens and giving them exactly what they want in order to push legislation through this parliament. What happens the next time Labor goes to the Greens for help rushing a bill through the parliament or rushing a bill through this place? Well, we know the Greens will ask for more concessions. Another set of businesses will all of a sudden find the government has thrown them under the bus to get the Greens support. We've already seen this happen with the forestry industry. At election time, Mr Albanese claimed to be a big supporter of the native forest industry. He said, I will take up the fight against the Greens to protect your job. Hmm. What an absolute joke. Absolutely. 
He's not taking the fight up to the Greens. He's doing deals with them. He did a deal on the reconstruction fund with the Greens to prohibit native forest logging being supported. Now, if the Prime Minister was a big supporter of the native forestry industry, as the Prime Minister claimed, why would you do a deal with the Greens to exclude that industry's involvement in a fund like this? As the Australian Forest Products Association said, Australian industry and Australian jobs should never be used as a Senate bargaining chip. It's a slippery slope which can only end in tears for our economy. It is time to start staring the Greens down. Well, far from staring them down, it is the Greens who are staring down the Labor government. And it's the Labor government which is backing down and giving the Greens what they want. That is why this parliamentary week started with the Greens holding a press conference announcing that they had got what they wanted from the Labor government. We're going to see this pattern over and over and over again throughout this term of the parliament. Labor ministers and Labor members are going to go out and announce a bill pretending that they are backing Australian workers and backing Australian families, knowing all the while that when the bill comes to this place in the Senate, when we get in here, they will be giving the Greens what they want. Yeah. Deal. Now, when it comes to climate policy and reducing emissions, the government of Australia is just really going along with whatever the Greens want. The people of Australia expect the government to do whatever it can to keep energy prices low. Labor knows that. That's why they deliberately misled the public by promising to cut power bills by $275 a year, a promise they've already broken and clearly never intended to keep. It's also the government's job to make sure that job-creating industries are supported to continue employing Australians. But here, with this legislation tonight, this morning I mean, we have the Greens and the government making it more difficult for some of our biggest industries to keep employing Australians into the future. And what's worse, President, is that this is a hypocritical government. They've gone around, telling the, around the world telling other nations how bad Australia allegedly was under the previous government, even though the facts are that we reduced emissions by over 20 per cent on our 2005 base level. We outperformed nearly all other countries. And of course, while Labor has been going around the region telling everyone how bad Australia has been, what they're not telling other countries is that the Chinese government is operating dozens of new coal-fired power plants every year. The Labor Green Safeguard Mechanism policy turns a mechanism that was working well to support business to invest in new technology to a punitive tax which will put a wrecking ball through the Australian economy. Businesses that are already whacked with huge energy price increases as a result of this government are now going to have a new carbon tax to pay. Labor is determined to make Australian business uncompetitive. The $75 carbon tax is significantly higher than the carbon price of eight of Australia's top ten two-way trading partners, putting our industries at a significant disadvantage. Many of our trading partners and international competitors for key industries do not have any national carbon pricing scheme in place at all. Our exporters will struggle to compete in these markets against lower cost rivals. That not only means less export revenue, but less investment and fewer jobs. Australian businesses are at risk of closing down after being rendered uncompetitive by Labor's policies and the Greens' policies that we are seeing enacted here through the Labor government tonight. This economic activity will relocate overseas in markets with no climate policies and high emissions intensities, in many cases more than double the emissions of Australian companies. And what does that mean? Well, it means that Australians are going to lose their jobs, the businesses that employed them will shift overseas, and Labor and Green politicians will be bragging about what a great job they've done in cutting emissions. And of course, when those jobs shift overseas, perhaps to places like China, which is dramatically increasing its emissions, not cutting them, the environment will be worse off because they have no interest in cutting emissions. And the other major impact, of course, is going to be on Australian households. Under the Albanese government, families are getting hit with skyrocketing power bills, grocery bills, mortgage bills and rent payments. This government promised that it would cut the cost of living, but they've done the complete opposite. And now they want to make it worse. Because when you put new taxes on business and increase their costs, they have no alternative but to pass those costs through to the consumer, which is going to mean even higher prices 
directly caused by the government for food and for energy and for Australian-made products. And this is a tax that fundamentally will end up hitting all Australians in the hip pocket. So in summary, President, um, like I said, this has been a very sad week for Australians. This is a week in which the government's entire agenda has been surrendered and predicated on dirty deals done with the Greens. You had an election campaign. Labor went around telling Australians that they weren't like the Greens, that they were going to be better than the Greens, that they weren't going to shut down key industries because of the Greens, and yet we are in this place now debating a piece of legislation as a result of a deal with the Greens that is going to do exactly that. Absolute shame on this government. Absolute shame. Thanks. Uh, Senator Scarl. President, I've been prompted um, by suggestions from those opposite that uh, I feel obliged to uh, bring your attention to the state of the chamber. Thanks, Senator Scar. Ring the bell. <laughs> you get a little rest. Thank you. Senator Cadell. Um, yeah, I, sorry, Senator Cadell, I did call you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. And I'm sorry to everyone who has to come at 1.30 in the morning and hear what I think is a very mediocre speech uh, that I have written. So it's <laughs> no, no. So uh, what we're looking at tonight, this safeguard mechanism, is uh, more about deindustrialisation than it is anything about decarbonisation. And it's more of an attack on businesses and their ROIs than it is on any CO2. So, for too long, Labor governments have taken our country's industrial might for granted, assuming that it would always be there. But the reality that industrialising will have disastrous consequences for our economy and the way of life. Now, what we're looking at is there are some good ideas. Let's clean up the economy. Let's do these things. Let's, let's clean up some emissions. But the way we're doing it is overkill. And I think at 1.30 in the morning, a bit tired, a bit emotional, there's always a time for a really bad, bad analogy, either like a dog one or something like that. So I've been watching on the Facebook ads as I've been going through, and there's these salt guns with laser sights to kill flies. I think that's a really good idea, get these little salt guns, hit a fly flying through your thing. I think Labor's had this good idea on emissions. We're going to get rid of emissions. We're going to get this salt gun. But they've got a real shotgun. 
and they're going to blow it through the wall. They don't care who they get on the other side. They don't care what they get around it. They don't care of the consequences, the unintended consequences. They don't see through what their actions can really do other than what they want it to do. And what this is going to do to Australia is devastating. What it's going to do to my home in the Hunter Valley, what it's already doing. We've had Orica, one of the, one of the companies that came to us in the phase, and I raised this the other day, Orica who produce ammonium nitrate. They're one of the few people who do it in Australia. They're up against a big problem where Russia, of all things, uh, has an anti-dumping appeal against them at the moment. Russia, even with their 35 per cent tax, has an appeal has won an appeal against their anti-dumping laws. They flame off gas. They do all this overseas and they dump their ammonium nitrate in Australia. And Orica are trying to compete with that day by day. And what are we doing? We are sitting here making it harder for them with this. Part of this bill is the grandfathering clause. We've talked about all sorts of things here, but specifically as we go forward, there was going to be an exclusion for contracts that were already ready entered into under the safeguard mechanism, which was great for Orica. They had until 2029 under their contracts. So they invested. They went and they put money into the Kuragang Island Walsh Point plant in Newcastle, and they made it one of the cleanest, best, most efficient plants for ammonium nitrate in the world. It's not cheaper than Russia because Russia just has gas everywhere. They can do what they want. But it was efficient. It was clean. It was good for the world. But now, under this plan, they're going to grandfather contracts for two years. So the certainty they had for uh, six years is gone. They have that for two years. I've got my plan in the Hunter Valley. It's there. People will stay employed. They will stay there. But the, the plan for the expansion of Gladstone, to make Gladstone a low emitter, to make Gladstone world leading, is gone. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to, need to see the slow deindustrialisation of Australia because of this. As we heard my great friend and colleague Senator Macdonald say, money is transportable. It goes, can go where it goes. It goes to the return. It doesn't care where it goes. And all we will end up exporting is our jobs and our pollution. When we go through all the things we want, no one's talking about reducing demand, reducing lifestyle, reducing that as part of this bill, but all we will do is reduce the things we are reliant upon. It's a very good lesson I heard the other day is sovereignty is the ability to make your own decisions based on safety. And what this bill does is signs away our sovereignty. We won't be producing things, we won't be making things, we won't be doing these things, so we'll become reliant on others. Not friendshoring, not onshoring, we'll be offshoring. Now, how we go and what that does. And I quote the Prime Minister, who promised in the election, a future made in Australia. We will rebuild our proud manufacturing industry and build a future made right here in Australia. Because that's what he wanted to do. We've had a bill here today talking about the National Rebuilding, uh, Rebuilding Fund where we want to go off and do more manufacturing. But this bill takes from it. We are taking with one hand and giving, giving with another. It is a waste of taxpayers' funds. It doesn't make her efficient. I don't know. But <laughs> what we really want to do is be consistent across our policy, and this is not. This is not something that promotes manufacturing. It is something that takes jobs away. It, we don't know what it is. It is a policy bubble. It is a thought bubble of government that had not a bad idea. Let's clean up our economy. But we're taking a baseball bat to jobs. We're taking a baseball bat to workers. And we can sit here and we can shout and we can talk across the chamber, Madam President, but what this is, what this really is, is it is, it is a step too far. We sit here and what we want to do is create a better world. And we've heard Senator Faruqi here talking about the 50 million displaced in Pakistan. Nothing will change because of this. We are offshoring to China the same pollution in a less efficient way. There will be more pollution. If you look at the calorific value of Australian coal at 62,000 kilojoules, we will burn dirtier coal in dirtier plants to produce the same thing. That's the worldwide solution on this. Australia and some Brazilian coal is the cleanest and most efficient in the world with low sulphur. And what we will do is replace it with dirtier, 
worse coal. That's the sum total of this policy. People talked about all sorts of things. I know Senator Farrell today talking in the manufacturing is talking about holding closing and forward closing. Well, I just want to say we've seen this before because the last time the Labor government was in power and brought this up under Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, the policies we passed in this place led to the end of the automotive machine, led to the beginning within February 5, 2008, Mitsubishi, the first to jump ship. February 5, 2008. Order. Mitsubishi. Order. And seeing Order. the first, seeing the first thousand man, uh, people lose their jobs in automotive plants, and that shift away from manufacturing from that point has always had negative effects. Without a strong, well, Mitsubishi. This is exactly what I was saying, Senator Shikani. Thank you for that. Mitsubishi was where it all started under Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister Rudd. Without a strong manufacturing sector, we risk losing our ability to develop these new technologies and products that keep us at the forefront. Furthermore, this deindustrialisation will have also serious implications for our national security. Without a strong manufacturing sector, we will become increasingly dependent on other countries for all of our essential goods and services, leaving us vulnerable to supply chain disruptions and other risks. So what can we do to prevent this deindustrialisation? We are standing here and we are being shouted at for these things. We don't stand up and say this is bad for the sake of bad. No one here is saying we shouldn't go for a cleaner economy. What we are saying is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Order. It, it is Order. Senator Cadell, just sit, sit down for a moment. Not um, senators, not only is it disorderly to call out across the chamber, but most of you are not even in your seats. Uh, Senator Cadell. Senator Cadell, please continue. Thank you. Now, if we look at one specific thing, and I want to talk about concrete. Concrete is one of those engineering marvels. Rocks, sand, cement, fly ash and water all mixed together to give you something very hard and very durable. It may be. Nearly every footpath and every shared cycleway you walk or ride down is made of it. Every curb, every stormwater drain away from homes and most pipes, culverts conveying stormwater with concrete. Most dams use concrete. Many homes in suburbia have a concrete slab for a floor, and if not, they use concrete products in their home. Maybe you don't own a house, but you live in a high-rise. That's concrete. Schools and hospitals, made of concrete. Well, what about engineering marvel that the Federal Coalition funded the Pacific Highway? Millions of cubic metres of concrete on the Pacific Highway funded by the previous government. Every road and tunnel, concrete. You want to get across that river? Concrete bridges. Concrete is everywhere. The most consumed product in the world behind water is concrete. The Cement Concrete and Aggregate Association of Australia says about 30 million cubic metres of concrete is produced in Australia a year. That's enough to fill the MCG to the brim 18 times. But not only is it a wonderful building product, it is green. It is recycling fly ash and slag that would otherwise be waste. Amazing product. But the concrete industry in Australia will die under the spill. We will be exporting all of our. It will be. We'll export all our raw materials. We'll be importing fly ash. We'll be uh, putting lower emissions or lower amounts of fly ash in concrete, making it less durable. All of our infrastructure will last for a shorter period of time because we have worse concrete. It is that simple? The consequences of what you are doing aren't just what you want them to do. Yes, there will be less emissions in the world, well done, but there will be less jobs. We talk about people getting up and say per capita Australia has higher emissions than anyone or anyone else in the world. By GDP we do not. Many of our Pacific Island partners who don't have a high GDP sit there and have a crack at us perform less than us by GDP. We have a high emission per capita because we produce a lot. We bat above our average on so many things. We aren't doing things overly badly, but we should always try and do things better. And I am sure there is somewhere between where we are and where this bill takes us where we could all be happy. We don't want to drive anyone back to the Stone Ages. We don't want to do that sort of thing because we have a country, we have a planet we all want to protect, but 
We on this side we have people we want to protect. They are the people that live in our country, the people that live in our suburbs, the people that live in our states. And this doesn't take that into account. It's not enough. And sure, we can have a crack about the deal done with the Greens to do that. You know, if hypocrisy has a colour, it is green. <laughs> These people yeah. sit yeah. here and they say that they want to put extra housing and look after housing, but every Greens councillor across Australia votes against every DA. They say they want emissions and power, but they want, don't want nuclear. That will give all the power we want with no emissions. That's right. They are not a party of solutions. They are a party of problems. They don't want to solve anything because you know then it. they are irrelevant. You know it. The Greens are irre irrelevant without problems, and you are empowering them. They are an entitled child that you are supporting. They are your entitled child. And that is, that is what is wrong with this. They're your naughty toddler. Well, and that's why we're going on. Everything, it, it doesn't matter what it is. There is a party in here that you are doing deals with that wants to point out the problems but not the solutions. And now we have sat there and we've empowered them on this and we're going down this path and there'll be no coal and there'll be no, there'll be no iron ore coming from Western Australia and my home in the port of Newcastle, we've already seen the $200 million that was set aside to help diversify that port for containers disappear in a puff of Minister King magic. But what do we give them? What do we give them? You know, we do. We can't give them. I love to give them concrete minutes. Through you, Madam President, I, I take that wonderful comment by uh, Senator Ciccone. Concrete would be great to give them, but we can't even give them that. We are going to become, in the words of Paul Keating, the new banana republic. But and you want that. And the problem oh, yeah. is, once we make the bananas, we won't have any way to ship them because we won't have the roads made out of concrete to ship them there. So. As we go forward, as we look at this trigger, as we go to the next policy that was being delivered by you guys, let's just have a conversation. We, you know, I sit there in the uh, NFR and I was able to say I thought the bill had a lot of redeeming qualities. I didn't go and take the mick out of it just for recreation. It just wasn't far enough and it was a conversation that we had and I thank Senator Ayres at the time for giving me some briefings on that. This one I can't and I'm sure that some of you over there that are just saying, yeah, this might be going too far, especially with what you've done to the Greens. It's, we have a responsibility not just to our parties, we have a responsibility to this nation more than That's anything right. else. That's right. And this isn't good policy. We will sit here and we'll be laughed at. We, I don't, through you, Ms. Madam President, oh, to yeah. Senator Brown, we don't, you'll love this, I can't wait for the interjections. We don't want to sit here in three years' time or in four years' time, sit there in four years' time and say we were right now, we've got to fix it. Let's fix it now. Let's get it fixed. The worst thing we want is to be sitting in four years' time with an economy in trouble, with all these things going on, with nothing being built and saying we told you so. We owe more than that. Thank you. I thank you. Senator Cadell, Senator Nampajika Price. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this morning I rise to speak on this Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Bill of 2023 as a proud Territorian with a visceral connection to the land and, of course, the environment. I would argue that few people in Australia truly do care more about real action on protecting the environment than those of us who live in regional and remote parts of Australia. This country is full of natural wonders. Some of the best in the world are right here in our backyard, and we're all truly blessed to call this great land home and say that we're all Australians. And though all Australians can be proud of it, Northern Territorians in particular can be extra proud of the vast and diverse landscapes that the Territory has to offer. Our Territory at 1.4 million square kilometres is home to some of Australia's most iconic natural wonders. We have tropical rainforests, rugged mountains, wetlands and deserts, home to a rich variety of flora and fauna, many of which are found nowhere else on the planet. From the Kakadu National Park filled with mangrove swamps, floodplains, 
incredible bird life, animals including huge saltwater crocodiles and breathtaking waterfalls, we in the Territory truly understand the importance of the environment and, of course, its protection. For me personally, from Uluru, a now iconic landmark with cultural significance to my people, the Warburi people, near my current home of Alice Springs in the south, all the way to the Tiwi Islands in the north, where I spent the earliest years of my life, the natural beauty of the Territory's environment is, in my opinion, unparalleled. It's a vast landscape that I was lucky enough to live on and explore as a child. From the very beginning of my life, I formed a connection with this country that will last my lifetime, as did so many other Australians. For many Australians, including many that I'm related to, the landscape is much more than something to appreciate and wonder at. It's their home. It is their culture. It is their livelihood. That is why I and countless others are so concerned with its protection. And it is why I'm glad to be part of a coalition that supports real action to make a real impact on protecting our natural spaces. In the Territory, we know that we can work towards a cleaner future. We can work towards an environmentally sustainable future. We can work towards a future where our children and our grandchildren can see the wonders that this country and indeed this planet have to offer and appreciate them in full. But I'm a realist, and though I love the land, I know that any debate on this action must be done against the backdrop of the very real impact that decisions made in this building have on people in their day-to-day -day lives. This work must be done while accounting for the cost, financial and otherwise, that our decisions will have on the everyday Australian who simply wants to put food on the table. We know that as people become more financially secure, they begin to care more about their environment. Once the interior is taken care of, people look to the exterior. As Bjorn Lomberg, Danish author, environmentalist and social scientist said, only when we get sufficiently rich can we afford the luxury of caring about the environment. Lomberg believes the climate change, a problem that we can solve without abandoning our economic prosperity and without abandoning billions of people to poverty, and that, quote, yes, we should act on climate change, but we need to do it intelligently. And we need to do it in a way that is fair and just for everyone. And I agree, which is why, for me, it is important that any action on climate change must be measured, be responsible and, at bare minimum, doesn't cause harm to Australians. It is important to me that we enable the conditions for Australians to thrive so that, secure in knowing that they and their families have the essentials, they can turn their attention to protecting our rich natural environments which is exactly what the coalition did for the near decade it was in power. While in power, the coalition met and exceeded our target commitments while improving the economy and making life easier for Australians. Take note. The coalition met and exceeded Kyoto climate targets. The coalition made a commitment to reduce our carbon footprint in a reasonable, achievable time frame. The coalition reduced Australia's climate emissions by 20 per cent on our 2005 level. Despite the climate fear-mongering and anxiety-causing rhetoric, the Green left, the coalition was working and achieving real results while maintaining a strong economy that benefited Australians. The coalition government had a plan a plan to set Australia to net zero by 2050 without new taxes. 
The same can't be said for Labor. Labor's carbon tax, even if it is in the guise of a safeguard mechanism reform, is just another attempt to undo a balanced effort by the coalition and, in doing so, to try to score cheap political points through their typical virtue signalling and posturing. It will inevitably, I believe, lead to phrases like climate denier being hurled at anyone who points out the very real impact their policies are having on Australians. But the truth is you can absolutely care about the environment. You can absolutely be concerned about the potential impacts of climate change. You can absolutely care about our environment and still call bad policy bad policy. So let's call it what it is. This is bad policy. It's bad policy for the economy. It's bad policy for the environment. And most importantly, it's bad policy for the Australian people. This is a hidden tax on all Australians at a time when the cost of living is skyrocketing, at a time when energy prices are skyrocketing, at a time when many Australians aren't sure how they're going to afford the cost of filling up the car next or to be able to take the kids to school. The worst part is Labor can't even provide the evidence that this tax will even have any impact. In a move that shocked absolutely no one, Labor failed to get Treasury to model the impact of its policy before pushing it on Australian industry. In a move that will shock absolutely no one, <laughs> Labor is trying to tax their way to prosperity. The Australian people deserve to know the impacts of policy. But in their usual style, the Albanese Labor government is keeping the Australian people in the dark. Like with so many other policies and grand visions of their new Australia, they don't want to reveal the details. Mm. They just want to rush through with good vibes and how about how good they're all being. They're going to rush it through with the promise of the warm and fuzzy feelings that accompany delusions of saving the planet with half-baked policy ideas. It is a huge concern that I know I share with many other members in this chamber that we are being asked to vote on a bill without all the information we need without all the information that the Australian public need and, more irregularly, without all the information that the Australian public deserve. But, as I say, this Labor government don't care much for giving the Australian people the information they deserve. In many cases, as I think may be the case here, it is because they know that should they give Australians all the information, all the facts, all the stats, the Australian public will say no. I know this is a position that many of my colleagues hold, and frankly, I think it is a position that some in the Labor Party must hold too. I think they share the concerns of me and my coalition colleagues. I think they're also worried about the lack of detail we're being given and the potential consequences it could have on Australians. I think. Many of them share my views that while action to protect our environment is important, it is more important that we make sure whatever action we take doesn't add to the struggles of Australians. But they won't speak. Oh no. <laughs> They're happy to tow the party line. And so the Labor Party continues to push their agenda without properly informing the Australian public before the election. Many Australians warn that if you vote Labor, you'll get the Greens. <laughs> vote Labor, get Greens. But they were laughed off. They were told they didn't have to worry that Labor wouldn't do the work of the Greens. We were told by Albo that he wouldn't be held accountable to the Greens, that he wouldn't capitulate to the Greens. Oh. But here we, are, here we are, not 12 here months are. later. And each way Albo's done it again. He said one thing, he's done another. Labor promised that the coal sector would not be subject to harsh restrictions, but hey, here we are. Labor promised that the gas, gas sector would not be subject to harsh 
restrictions, but here we are. Uh, the PM told us that Australia deserves a leader who takes responsibility, wow. but here we are. He's given in. He's capitulated. He's given Adam and his merry band their way again. And in doing so, in capitulating to the Greens' demands on this Senator mechanism Nath, reform, Labor uh, has paved the way. Please resume your seat, Senator Nampajipa Price. Um, Senator McAllister. Um, Acting Deputy President, I just wanted to draw your attention to the standing orders that require us to use proper titles for people here and in the other place. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Nampajimpa Price, please refer to Mr Bant by his correct title. Apologies, will um, do so. Rookie mistake. Um, where was I? <laughs> and in doing so, in capitulating to the Greens, demands he's paved his way not simply for another energy crisis but an economic one too. Because life hasn't been hard enough for Australians, because the cost of living hasn't gone up enough for Australians because their energy bills weren't high enough already. Labor and the Greens is responsible for making our gas sector uninvestable and worsening the gas supply crisis. Labor and the Greens will be responsible for driving up the cost of everyday goods and services because of this capitulation. Labor, will never, Labor never tried to engage the coalition on this reform, instead turning to the Greens and giving them exactly what they wanted. And we have heard in this chamber the joy from Green senators that they were able to contribute to that rising cost of living through their efforts in pushing for this bad policy. Labor, by capitulating to the Greens, continue to add pressure and struggle to Australians. Traditionally the party of the worker, at the last election the tables turned and the Labor Party became the party of the more fortunate Australian. The Labor Party became the party of those who once again used the words of Bjorn Lomberg can afford the relative luxury of caring for the environment. It is not a bad thing indeed. It should be the goal of everyone in this chamber to work towards an Australia where we can all afford the relative luxury of caring about the environment, but hidden taxes like this bill will deliver are not the way to do it. So today I suggest that we all turn our attention back to the worker, to the Australians, out of necessity, but be more worried about how they will heat their homes this winter and that they are about climate change. Oh, sorry, this winter, than they are about climate change. And think about the impacts this bill will have on them. I suggest we turn our minds to the countless Aussies who will struggle in energy poverty throughout this year and years to come because the, mo the cost of the decisions we make here becomes too much for them. I suggest that we return to the measured and balanced approach that the previous coalition government had worked to achieve. This reform adds a cost that will be passed on to consumers, to small businesses, to households already struggling, and for that reason I cannot support this safeguard mechanism crediting bill of 2023. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Safeguard uh, Mechanism Crediting Bill 2022. And if only this bill, if only this bill was just a harmless virtue signalling uh, policy move by the Labor Party in this dirty, shameful deal with the Greens. But it is, it is economic vandalism of the worst possible kind. And there is nothing safe about this bill. And as colleagues have described, this is the green tail wagging the Labor dog. And I was just, I was appalled to hear Senator Waters and other green uh, senators in this place tonight boasting, boasting about this secret deal they'd done and how smart and how clever they were. How smart and how clever we are. We are going to be absolutely <laughs> destroying the Australian economy, destroying Australian jobs, and why? Yeah. Well, why are we here at, after 2 a.m. pushing this piece of legislation through that is probably one of the most consequential pieces of legislation to impact the Australian people? 
and you are here feeling smart and smug and smiling and laughing about what you are knowingly about to do to the Australian people. And I just say shame on you all, because you will come back in this place. Oh, we didn't realise it had caused all this problem for the Australian people. Well, if you do secret dirty deals, you make sure the Senate can't scrutinise important bill like this. You haven't done the modelling. You haven't been able to tell the truth to the Australian people about what this bill is going to do. Well, shame on you, because this, like the cashless debit card, you, sh you pushed through this place. You did a dirty deal with others in this Senate chamber. And we've, we've heard this week the consequences on the lives of Australians of ideologically pushing something through that you haven't modelled, you haven't checked, you haven't consulted. And you should be ashamed of yourselves, because Order. none of this, none of what Order. you are about to do to our nation, is remotely necessary if you had done things properly. And you do it on the uh, on the basis that you want. You know, you're saying that it's going to be protecting the economy. That this new Labor's tax is the guise of a safeguard mechanism reform. However, it will do nothing for the environment, as you have heard from so many colleagues on this side of the chamber this evening. But the sad thing is you don't have to kill our economy and kill jobs in this country to look after the environment. And I'd like to share with those in the chamber today what actually it looks like when you look after the economy, you make good policy, you consult, you collaborate, not just in this, in this place but the other place. You consult, you model and you work out the best balance between our economy, between jobs and also between the environment. So let me share with those in the chamber here and if there is anybody listening at 2am uh, on this important debate. But you can, you can look after jobs, you can keep down the cost of living, inflation and interest rates, and keep uh, unemployment low. You can do all of that while still looking after the environment. And that's exactly what we did in government. And we reduced, and we reduced carbon. So if you want to know what good policy likes, let me share some of these uh, facts with you. In government, the coalition found the balance that needed to be done between reducing emissions to reach a cleaner future while also ensuring Australia remains strong, prosperous and independent. While we were in office, we grew the economy by 23 per cent in our nine years in office. We signed Australia on to achieving net zero by 2050, and we had a clear plan to do so, which was focused on technologies and not taxes. And we absolutely did that. We reduced, we on this side of the chamber, reduced emissions by over 20 per cent on our 2005 base level, putting Australia on track to beat our Paris Treaty commitments. To beat our Paris Treaty commitments, which very few other nations were on track to do. And that is lower than any year under the previous Labor government. Between 2005 and 2019, we on this side of the chamber, when we were on that side of the chamber, reduced Australia's emission faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the United States. We met and we exceeded Australia's Kyoto targets by nearly 500 million tonnes. Our technology-driven long-term emission reduction plan set out a credible pathway to net zero by 2050. Again, technologies, not taxes, and it was working. So we did all of that on track to meet our, our carbon reduction plan while preserving our existing industries and creating more jobs here in Australia. We established Australia as a leader in low emission technologies and we were positioning our regions here in Australia to prosper at the same time. This decade, the government that we led invested more than $22 billion in lower emission technologies, driving over $88 billion of total investment to reduce emissions while still growing the economy and creating jobs across Australia. 
Our approach to reducing emissions has been more effective than almost any other nation in the world to reduce emissions and keep growing our economy. Today, Australia's emissions are more than 100 million tonnes lower than when Labor said they would first be under Labor's previous carbon tax. But that's not all we've done in government when we were in government. Australia's investment in renewable energy continued to break records, with renewables now making up almost one third of our energy mix. And that happened under a coalition government, not under your side. Australia had under us the world's highest uptake of roof solar, with one in four homes with rooftop solar panels. Across governments and the private sector, over $40 billion was invested under our government in renewable energy since 2017. In 2020 alone, under our government, Australia deployed more renewable energy than in the six years of the previous Labor government. We did it under our policy, technology, not taxes. The coalition government invested in big projects, including Snowy 2.0, one of the largest pumped hydro projects in the Southern Hemisphere and the Tasmania's Battery of the Nation pumped hydro. The Coalition Government's Green Bank hit its $10 billion investment milestone, supporting more than 26,000 emission reduction and energy efficiency projects across Australia. We also made carefully considered and targeted investments in transition projects to support our renewables coming online including investing $84 million in microgrids for our remote communities. But that's not all we did. That is not all we achieved. The coalition government led the way on waste and recycling. We wanted to see less waste going into our oceans and landfill and more reused and recycled. No longer are we exporting plastic, paper, tyres and glass waste. And that was not done under a Labor government. That was done under a coalition government. The coalition government's $280 million recycling modernisation fund is driving a $1 billion transformation of the waste and recycling sector. Our plan significantly increased recycling rates here in the nation. They tackled plastic litter improved battery recycling and halved food waste by 2030. Again, that was done under a coalition government which kept our economy strong and Australians in jobs. The Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is a global tourist icon, a unique ecosystem and a wonder of the national world. It contributes about $6.4 billion a year to the Australian economy and support 64,000 jobs. We were committed to protecting it, and we did. In the coalition, you might hate to hear this, and I can hear you're all laughing and cackling at this, but I'll tell you what, we Order. are absolutely Order. proud on this side of our, our achievements. You can talk down Australia and you can laugh and cackle Order. at 2.15 in the morning. Senator but I Reynolds, tell you what, Senator Reynolds, we delivered. Senator Reynolds, resume your seat. Order. I know you don't want me to uh, take breaks like this to call for order for obvious reasons, but I can barely hear Senator Reynolds, so order on my right. Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. And no wonder those opposite don't want to hear the truth. They say and they talk constantly that we on this side don't care about the environment. We don't care about climate change. Of course we do. And let me, if you would like, I will happily repeat these statistics for you if you didn't hear them because you were too loud. Between, okay, we'll go back. Let's go and have a look at our emissions reduction. Between 2005 and 2019, we reduced Australia's emissions faster than Canada, Japan, the United States and New Zealand. We met and exceeded, we did on this side of the chamber, our Kyoto targets, and we were on track to meet our Paris targets where most other nations in this world were not. They talked about it. We were actually doing it here. And we did not need to kill the economy through your, carbon, your new carbon taxes. So, 
Not only uh, were we doing a lot on recycling and waste and land care and protecting the Great Barrier Reef, we also protected our, our environment. We safeguarded our wildlife for future generations by investing $6 billion for threatened species, habitat restoration, marine conservation and environmental projects, including, for example, uh, Senator Reynolds, resume your seat on the point of order. I rise Senator to Senator Henderson. Reynolds for taking a point of order when she's giving such an excellent speech. But the interjections from, from senators opposite are completely unacceptable. Could you please ask them to desist? It's disorderly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, it is difficult to hear. Senator Reynolds, please uh, cease your interjections. Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> and it's not surprising those opposite are trying to drown out what I'm saying, because this is the truth that you try to hide Senator day Polly. in and day out. The fact is, uh, so, so if you didn't hear that, Senator Henderson, I'll say it again. We invested $6 billion for threatened species, habitat restoration, marine conservation and environmental projects, including projects, for example, $74 million dedicated to koala recovery and conservation. This investment reinforced our uh, support uh, for a threatened species strategy that, puts, that has put vulnerable plants and animals on a far more sustainable path. Maintaining and expanding our protected areas on both land and sea was one of the best ways we could look after our natural, natural environment, and we did. The coalition government expanded Indigenous protected areas covering more than 104 million hectares and declared two new marine protected areas in the Cocos Keeling Islands and Christmas Islands. These marine parks are twice the size of the Great Barrier Reef and are home to thousands, if not millions, of native species. We also achieved more than 90,000 hectares of weed control over 3 million hectares of pest animal control land. We invested over a billion dollars in land care. Uh, which include land partnerships to protect our threatened species, restored wetlands and improved soil health and farms. And Landcare delivers practical solutions on the ground in partnership with local communities and environmental groups. But yes, there is more, and I only have two more minutes. Uh, bushfire recovery. The coalition government allocated $2.8 billion to recover the $2 billion National Bush Fund Recovery Fund. $200 million was invested to help native wildlife and their habitats recover from the devastating impacts of the 2019-20 bushfires. The coalition government invested uh, additional support to our national parks, for example, including over, that includes $233 million in upgrades to parks, including Uralu, Kakadu, Christmas Island, Boradee and National Park. Our coalition government protected our oceans by increasing our marine park coverage to cover now around 45 per cent of our oceans, and that was done by the coalition government and not by the Labor, previous Labor government. We restored seagrasses, mangroves and salt marshes and supported marine life conservation while creating hundreds if not thousands of Indigenous uh, employment jobs in those parks. We invested over $200 million in environmental restoration fund to help improve the water qualities of the Yarra, the Swan, the Canning, the Torrens, the Brisbane, the Georges, the Hawkesbury and the Nepean rivers. So we have demonstrated over nine years of government and we did it through two, over two years of a pandemic. You can be a good, responsible government. You can respect this parliament. You can look after the economy. You can look after the health of Australians. You can maintain jobs. You can keep down pressure on uh, cost of living. Uh, you can keep uh, control of inflation and interest rates. And you can also look after the environment. And you can also put the Australian economy on a sustainable uh, carbon reduction strategy. But this, Thank but you, this is deliberate. Reynolds. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Uh, are you Order, yes, please. Senator Henderson. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I would ask you if you could again please remind senators opposite that they are being most disorderly in the way are they, they are continually rudely interjecting during Senator Reynolds' speech. I would ask you to bring them to order. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Henderson. I note that the chamber at present is relatively quiet, and I call Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I rise to make my contribution to the Safeguard Mechanism Bill 2023. Uh, and, uh, uh, Deputy President, I, I, I have to say I do agree with the point of order just raised by Senator Henderson, and it is quite disappointing that. Uh, Labor centres continue to, uh, to interject, um, to reflect on coalition women in this place uh, after what we have seen uh, over recent years, and particularly over recent, over recent days, and perhaps some of them are a little tired and emotional on the other side, Mr uh, sorry, uh, Deputy President, but, um, but, but, uh, but uh, uh, Pre Deputy President, yeah. So, so, order, Senator, order, um, order, Senator, Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, order, Senator Colbeck, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, and I note that they're all very, very chatty and they want to talk over uh, the coalition speakers, but not one of them is prepared to put their name on the speakers list and actually stand up and defend this terrible legislation. They're all there; they're very chatty. They want to. They want to uh, reflect on uh, colleagues across the chamber, um, which I find a bit odd in this uh, environment where we've just had a review of behaviour in the parliament uh, and they come in here and uh, completely disorderly. They disrespect the chair. Uh, they're not prepared to uh, comply with the chair's directions with respect to orderly behaviour. Um, and it really is, uh, Dep Acting Deputy President, really quite a sliding doors moment that we're seeing here today. I think a real sliding doors moment. Uh, we spent most of the first part of the day uh, debating a piece of legislation that the government said was designed to promote manufacturing in this country. We spent all day. We heard that all day from the minister at the table that this was about putting downward pressure on energy prices, about promoting uh, manufacturing in this country, about reviving manufacturing in this country. If I recall what uh, the minister at the table was saying correctly, and I think I do, I think I do reflect on, uh, and, I, and I don't think I'm uh, verbaling you. you. You were very persistent in your comments, uh, Senator Farrell, even though you're not in your seat, uh, and interjecting in a disorderly manner. You were very determined to continue to put the, the fact across to the, um, the chamber that the government's policies were about reducing energy costs. Uh, that was a very persistent point that was made. But then we move on to this piece of legislation. It's almost like we've been in two parallel universes. We spend the morning talking about building the, the manufacturing sector in this country, and then we come to a piece of legislation that will increase energy prices. We move to a piece of legislation that will actually increase energy prices, diametrically opposed to what was being said in the debate this morning. A real sliding doors moment that we're seeing here in the parliament today. We don't know the full details of this legislation yet because the government hasn't tabled its amendments to the legislation based on its deal with the Greens. Now we know, uh, and I've experienced it plenty of time in uh, my time in politics, but also uh, living in Tasmania, how bad a Labor Green government is, particularly when they're doing Labor Green deals. We saw, and Senator Chandler mentioned it earlier in the day, when we had a Labor Green government in the lead up to the 2014 state election, that four years in the lead up to the 2014 election in Tasmania, how devastating it was for the Tasmanian economy. And it was only the election of the Hodgman Liberal government in Tasmania that turned the Tasmanian economy around, where we now lead a whole series of indicators nationally for our economic performance. Uh, people are coming back. The economy is growing. Economic confidence remains high. That's what you have when you have good economic policy, Acting Deputy President. And I think that's the, point, the key point that we should be reinforcing in contrasting the two pieces of legislation that we talked about today. If you have good economic policy, your economy will be strong, industry will grow, manufacturing will grow. In fact, as it did over the last three years of the coalition government, and by a significant amount. 
because of our modern manufacturing policy, which Labor has dumped in favour of the legislation that was passed today, which I don't think will have any real effect in growing manufacturing, quite frankly. And then this evening we have, and this morning we have this piece of legislation that will put prices up and that will, that will damage our economy, that will damage our businesses. And how do we know that it will damage our economy and damage our businesses? Well, because they said so, because they've told us. They told us through the committee process. And I start with the cement industry. And we heard earlier from their submission, from Senator Scar, their submission to the Senate inquiry, how the technology that's required to meet the requirements of this bill doesn't exist. It won't exist for 10 to 15 years. So what will that industry do? That industry will move towards an import industry. It will move towards an in import industry. Uh, and I've seen uh, during my time here, but also prior to coming into politics in the construction industry, the issues that we've had with imported products, steel from China, for example, uh, on occasion cement from China, I don't want to see the high quality, high standard cement that's manufactured in this country that goes into all our, our buildings, into this wonderful building, uh, our homes. I don't want to see those standards threatened by imported product. I don't want to see our jobs exported to China. I don't want to see that happening. And, I, and, I, and it's not just about those that are working directly for Cement Australia, which is 20 minutes south of where I live. Uh, at a place called Railton in northwest Tasmania. What about, so, so it, it is about the plant workers, but it's also about the main maintenance workers. There's a railway that provide, dr brings the cement from Railton to Devonport to the silos there. There's the port workers that support two ships. Two of the 14 ships that are registered on the Australian coastline service the cement industry out of the northwest coast of Tasmania, taking that cement to the rest of the market. So it's negatively affecting on the capacity. If that capacity goes, if there's no need for cement from Australia, that capacity goes, less ships on the Australian coastline, less Australian maritime workers, less Australian railway workers, less vessels on the coastline. And of course, what will happen? The emissions will be offshored and the jobs will be offshored. Now we've heard from the other side through their interjections on a number of occasions that this is our policy. It's not our policy. They're taking a program that we put in place and turning it into a tax policy. That's what they're doing with this measure. They're increasing taxation and they're increasing costs on business. And the deal with the Greens makes say make make it worse. And that's been again demonstrated by comments only over the last 24 hours or so that indicate what the real issues might be for particularly, particularly the energy sector. So what did the energy se sector say? So only yesterday, off the back of the Greens, Announcement. The energy producers say Labor's 11th hour safeguard mechanism shake-up provides concerns that changes would damage prosperity and make it harder and more expensive to reduce emissions. So what does that mean? Potentially harder to reduce emissions, which is what the government says the whole intent of this legislation is about, but it's going to cost more which means higher energy costs. So a direct contradiction, contradiction to what we heard this morning when we were debating the legislation in relation to building the manufacturing sector. Because we know, we know, Acting Deputy President, that when it comes to manufacturing and any business or industry in Australia, the fundamentals are the fundamentals. Energy costs 
are one of the fundamentals to a competitive manufacturing and industry sector in this country. Sensible labour costs are fundamental to that. And we've already seen the Labor Party take the industrial relations net uh, framework back to what it was prior to Keating and, and, uh, and Hawke. So they say they're doing one thing. They, can, they continue to say they're doing one thing, and yet all the time they're doing something else. They promise to lower energy prices. They're delivering higher energy prices. And the commentary from, the, from industry continues to reinforce that. On Monday, an $18.7 billion deal to take over Origin Energy. And what did R. Blair Thomas, chief executive of the um, private equity business that took that business over, say? Government's moves to control energy prices are a mistake that would backfire and drive up prices for consumers, putting the whole energy transition at risk if public support for decarbonisation wanes. Their own actions, their own actions through this legislation and particularly the deal with the Greens is putting their whole strategy at risk because they promised Australians lower energy prices they are clearly delivering higher energy prices, a broken promise. We've talked about that plenty of times in this chamber. But the other effect it has is that it's actually cut the value of the origin gas business. So they're diminishing the value of business in this country. A number of my colleagues have said, quite rightly, how fluid investment is. Investment will flow to the place where it can get the best return and best value. And with legislation such as we're seeing here today, the global investment market, and again we had a conversation this morning about attracting more investment. We've heard during question time about the desire to attract more investment to this country. It's important that we do. But the government's decisions that it is making, the legislation that's bringing to this parliament, are acting directly opposite to what their stated intentions are. They say one thing, they do another. Promise lower energy prices, deliver higher energy prices. Promise more gas, they've effectively placed a gas on the cap market, on the cap on the gas market with the mechanisms that they're putting in place through this legislation. How do we know that? Because the Greens are out there boasting about it. There is nothing worse for this country, I can tell you, I've seen it in my home state of Tasmania than a deal between Labor and the Greens. It means bad news. And I'll finish with the forest industry. I was at the forestry dinner just before Christmas when the Prime Minister promised the forest industry that he would look after them. He would look after them. And of course, in two pieces of legislation today, we've seen them excluded by the Labor Party based on their deals with the Greens. And of course, the Greens will tell you that they want to move to a plantation-based sector and there is a significant plantation-based sector in this country and it's extremely important. But the prejudice against native forestry, I have to say, is completely unfounded. Because it doesn't matter on which value you look at the, forest the native forest industry, it's better for the environment than the plantation sector. Better for biodiversity, better for water quality, uses no chemicals, it's better for carbon storage. So on any value, on any value, if you look at the science, if you genuinely look at the science and not some of the hocus pocus that comes out of the ANU here in Canberra, any value that you look at in relation to the forest industry, the native forest sector is better than the plantation sector which is where the government's trying to drive the, sector, the industry at the moment. Now, the, the plantation industry is extremely important, extremely important, but you don't get high-quality furniture-grade timber out of the plantation sector. You don't get the special species that you, we grow in Tasmania, uh, in Western Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, out of the plantation sector. And the best quality timber is slowly grown timber with some age. And that's best produced by a well-managed native forest sector, which we have in this country. 
the best in the world, sustainable, harvesting less than 0.06 per cent of its available area every year, highly sustainable. And so, for a whole range of reasons, this is bad policy, it's bad legislation, and worse, because it's done through a deal with the Greens, it should not be supported. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Bill 2022, and I regret to say, like my colleagues in this debate tonight, as I rise at nearly 20 to 3 in the morning in this so-called family-friendly parliament that Labor promised—this, of course, is another broken promise. I rise to say that this is a bill, if passed, which will destroy our competitive advantage, will drive jobs offshore, will destroy investment confidence and will bring this country to its knees. This is a bill which demonstrates that Labor and the Greens, in this dirty, rotten deal, could not care less about the average Australian. The average Australian who has been hit so hard with skyrocketing cost of living under Labor, who is battling to pay the bills, to put food on the table, to fill the car with petrol, keep the heater on. This is a bill which shows all Australians that Labor is all about slogans and not about substance. And I, like some of my colleagues in this debate tonight, I am also convinced that there are some Labor members or senators who don't believe in this bill because they know the damage that this does to manufacturing, this does to our important industries, this does to the construction sector, this does to jobs, particularly blue-collar jobs. History is going to judge this Labor-Greens dirty deal as a very bad deal for our nation. Just as I believe this Albanese Labor Greens coalition will be judged as a very bad government for this nation. Australians and I, the people of Aston, this is ricocheting every single day in Aston. The people of Australia will never forget the price that they pay under Labor. The price of broken promises on interest rates inflation, wages, mortgages, power prices. Let us not forget that Labor, when in opposition, promised on 97 separate occasions that it would reduce Australians' power bill by, on average, $275 a year. What a laughing stock. What a joke. Broken promises on superannuation, franking credits, even a school's funding increase, which was promised but has now been delayed, much to the disgust of the Australian Education Union. So I say to the people of Australia, you will always pay more under Labor. Do not risk Labor. And I say to the people of Aston, look at this basket case of a government. Look what this government is trying to do now. I mean, this is such a disgrace that we are talking about amendments to this bill that senators opposite do not have the courage to present to this Senate. What is going on? Why can't we see these amendments? The Greens are over there earlier in the night boasting about how their deal, their amendments, is going to stop half the gas and coal projects in this country. They think it's wonderful as they bring this country to its knees in partnership with the Albanese Labor government. This is a disgrace. 
that Labor and the Greens have done a deal. We are here 20 to 3 in the morning, and we do not have access to the amendments which form part of the proposed legislation before the Senate. What is going on that Labor will not allow us to scrutinise these amendments, will not allow us to debate them, will not be transparent? Where is Labor's integrity? Where is Labor's accountability? Where is the scrutiny? And where are the amendments? In capitulating to the Greens' demands on the safeguard mechanism reforms, and we know that because they've been boasting about that here and in their press conferences, but Labor senators opposite haven't had the courage to hand over their amendments, which, which is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it before. Labor has sowed the seeds for not only the next energy crisis but the next economic crisis, one that will far exceed the current crisis in severity. The Labor-Green Deal is a hard cap on economic growth. <coughs> the Labor-Green Deal is a hard cap on new industries. It is a hard cap on jobs. This is de-industrialisation, not decarbonisation. This is what the experts have warned the government about. Labor's capitulation could put to an end new mines of any kind, including those which are for, um, critical for new critical minerals that will be needed for renewable technology development across the globe. I mean, that is extraordinary. I mean, we are a resource-rich nation Critical minerals are critical to our future, and the mining industry is now just existing in this country with its back to the wall uh, with a government that clearly has no interest in seeing a future of mining and resources in this country. Uh, this is going to do irreparable damage to the energy market and penalise consumers. And let's not make any mistake, Acting Deputy President, this is a jobs-destroying carbon tax. And as the Australian reports on the front page this morning online, uh, this Labor government has been caught out deceiving and manipulating uh, and not telling the truth about what this will do. Whitehaven, New Hope, Bowen Coking Coal and Peabody Australia have all condemned Labor's 11th hour safeguard mechanism dirty deal with the Greens. Uh, they are concerned it will make it harder and more expensive to reduce emiss emissions. This is climate policy gone mad. Gas producers have warned the Prime Minister that this so-called climate policy, which forces 215 emitters to slash emissions by nearly 5 per cent—215 or 212—I um, can stand corrected on that—by uh, nearly 5 per cent each year until 2030 presents such a sovereign risk that this creates uh, a real risk to Australia's energy security, including for vital international partners such as Japan. I just want to uh, reference, as a senator for Victoria, uh, let's have a look at what this safeguard mechanism will do in Victoria uh, to some of the companies that are being targeted. The first one, and one that I spoke about this morning in my speech on the National Reconstruction Fund, another reckless Labor policy, is Viva Energy's Geelong refinery. They're one of the top emitters that are being targeted by this policy. Australian Gas Networks, Ausnet, of course Virgin and Qantas our two major airlines, Oceana Glass in Dandenong, Esso in the Gippsland Basin, Beach Energy in Lang Lang in southwest Victoria, Liberty One Steel at Laverton, Mo Mobile Altona Refinery, the Opal Australia Paper Mill at Maryvale, Alcoa Aluminium in Portland, 
Quenos Altona Manufacturing, Melbourne Water, because of the emissions when it comes to treatment of sewerage, TT Line, V Line, CSL Australia, a global biotech powerhouse, Blue Scope Steel Western Port. There are some of the companies on the hit list uh, in Victoria which will be badly hurt by um, this obscene policy. And I just want to dwell on Viva Energy's Geelong refinery. This is a refinery that we backed to the hilt when we were in government through measures such as our fuel security package, which ensure, ensured that Viva was prepared for any emergency, increased our onshore diesel stock holdings and locked in jobs of our fuel-dependent industries such as our truckies, our farmers, our miners and tradies. We invested also through ARENA some $22 million uh, for uh, the country's first hydrogen refuelling facility. Uh, we've backed Viva every step of the way, including uh, many of the 700 workers, uh, most of whom are covered by the Australian Workers Union. And yet um, this is a refinery which is critical for Victoria and Australia's energy security. It supplies over 50 per cent of Victoria's and 10 per cent of Australia's fuel. Um, it can process up to 120,000 barrels a day. It manufactures petrol, diesel, LPG, jet fuel, avgas, bitumen, specialty solvents and also low aromatic fuel to support the federal government's petrol sniffing prevention program. And, and yet uh, it now wants to build a gas import terminal, which is capable of importing half of all of Victoria's gas at a time when we know there is a gas crisis in this country. The Daniel Andrews state government in Victoria refuses to give Viva the consents it requires, and also the gas cap legislation passed by the Albanese government has created enormous uncertainty for Viva. Uh, so while we backed Viva every step of the way on the watch of the Deputy Prime Minister, the missing in action member for Carayo, um, this is a very large employer in his electorate. Uh, he has never once stood up and fought for Viva on these really important issues, on keeping energy prices low, on ensuring that they have um, industrial harmony and not the horrendous collective bargaining laws which are coming their way, and now, of course, in relation to this uh, horrendous policy, uh, we've not heard an absolute peep from the member for Carayo. So, like Senator Reynolds, she gave a wonderful uh, outline of our work um, on taking strong action on climate change. The safeguard mechanism under us was working well for, for years as a system to cap emissions while the economy grew. But now what is happening is Labor is changing the purpose of the scheme from one that stops emissions by encouraging businesses and backs technology to a scheme which penalises businesses and increases taxes. So the government is determined to, Australia ta to see a, uh, Australia tax its way to so-called prosperity a plan that history shows will fail. This climate policy, along with Labor's other climate policies, will put a wrecking ball through the economy. Despite the strongest economic headwinds in decades and having already whacked businesses with higher energy prices, Labor now plans to hit them with a carbon tax. By pricing carbon dioxide at $75, Australia will have a price that is three times higher than what the one set by the previous Labor government, and it is set to rise to $100 by 2030. Labor is determined to make Australian businesses uncompetitive. The $75 carbon tax is significantly higher than the carbon price of eight of Australia's top 10 two-way trading partners, putting our industries at a significant disadvantage on the global stage. Australian businesses are at risk of closing down after being rendered competitive, com, uh, uncompetitive and thousands of jobs are at risk. This is a hidden tax which will hit everyone. 
Uh, as I say, this is absolutely dreadful policy. This constitutes a true betrayal of the Australian people, including blue-collar workers across this country. The government could not care less about manufacturing, about construction, about mining, about resources, about energy security. This bill must be rejected, and if it passes, we will fight it. We will fight to, to, to reverse it, this terrible legislation every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to contribute to the debate on the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023. Coalition does not support this bill, surprisingly, not because we don't support action on climate change, but because this bill is a dressed-up version of the carbon tax, which we all know is bad policy. A carbon tax is bad for the economy and bad for the environment, two very good and realistic reasons for not supporting this bill. Australians know we need to balance our country's need to reduce emissions. We know we need to work towards a cleaner future for our children and grandchildren, but we also know we need a strong economy. We want Australia to stay strong, prosperous and independent, and we know this can be achieved if we balance both priorities carefully. During the nine years the Coalition was in government, our economy grew by 23 per cent. And while our economy was growing, we were also building our environmental credentials. During our term, Australia met and exceeded our Kyoto targets. We signed up to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, and we reduced our emissions by more than 20 per cent on the 2005 level. This put Australia well on track to beat our Paris Treaty commitments. But in just 10 months, the Albanese Labor government has rejected the coalition's balanced approach to economy and environment, and now Australian households and businesses are paying the price. This bill is a ruse. Labor is using a safeguard mechanism and calling it reform when it will really commit Australia to a carbon tax we've already rejected. Questions at the recent Senate estimates hearing show the government has not assessed the impacts of this policy. Major reform like what is proposed here needs consultation and should be explained so Australians know its impact before being committed to policy. Labor claims industry supports this reform, but many of the industries covered by the safeguard mechanism have expressed concerns about it. Just yesterday, the Chief Executive of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Andrew McKellar, asked the government for assurances for businesses that energy affordability and supply have not been compromised by the deal Labor brokered with the Greens to get this bill the deal that Labor brokered with the Greens to get this bill through. Mr McKellar added that business remains concerned about access to affordable and reliable energy supply. And AIG Group Executive Innes Willow said the changes proposed in this bill will need further scrutiny, while Minerals Council of Australia's Tanya Constable said, we want to make sure there are no project closures. We want to make sure that we're retaining jobs for Australians and jobs in the regions, and we don't see projects going offshore to place like places like Indonesia and Russia without any net benefits to Australians." End quote. This bill has been rushed and Labor is trying to push it through in this last sitting week before budget, but we need a measured <coughs> approach when we're talking about such important factors as our economy and our environment. The safeguard mechanism as we know it has been working well for years, operating as a system to cap emissions with our economy while our economy grew. However, Labor now wants to change the scheme from one that stops emissions through encouraging businesses to cut their emissions to penalising businesses and imposing a carbon tax. The Coalition had already mapped out a plan to achieve net zero by 2050 without imposing any new taxes. We supported a carbon trading scheme that rewarded businesses who voluntarily reduced their emissions. Instead of imposing the big stick approach, our method incentivised businesses to transition to net zero. Australians don't need another tax. This climate policy destroys the hard work we've put in to build the economy and at a time when we're already feeling the pinch from cost of living pressures. Labor is pricing carbon dioxide at $75 per tonne, a price three times higher than what was set by the previous Labor government, which the public rejected at the time. And worse still, that price is set to rise to $100 per tonne by 2030, less than seven years away. This decision making will have severe impacts on Australian businesses and make them uncompetitive as they struggle to operate against international rivals. 
The proposed $75 per tonne carbon tax is significantly higher than the carbon price set by eight out of Australia's top ten two-way trading partners, which puts our industries at a disadvantage. Many of our international competitors and trading partners in key industries like alumina, cement, copper, coal, gas and iron ore don't have any national carbon pricing schemes at all. Our exporters will struggle against rivals offering the same products at lower prices, which not only reduces profits from exports but means less investment in Australia and fewer jobs. Labor is risking the closure of these businesses due to its uncompetitive policies. For a government that is talking big about making things here, it is working hard to ensure manufacturing is taken offshore through this policy. And then we'll be forced to import products we used to, make, used to make here, as well as deal with the increased emissions to ship the products hit back. Businesses and Australian households are already battling to meet the rising cost of energy, and Labor's broken promise of a $275 cut to power bills, but now the cost from this carbon tax will be passed on to them too. In addition, this carbon tax will lead to higher building costs when we're in a housing affordability crisis, higher fuel costs when we're already paying more to drive our cars, and higher transport costs when we're already seeing supply chain issues and difficulty sourcing essential items like food. We all want action on climate change to ensure we don't keep experiencing these floods and bushfires that have ravaged our country, but we do not want that action that is going to put increased financial pressure on Australians who are already struggling to make ends meet. The Coalition does not support this bill or endorse the government's dirty deal with the Greens to force it through. Thank you, Sarah Askew. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And, and before I commence, with the indulgence of the Chamber, uh, a very good friend of mine is running the Ulster Way at the moment, and he's doing a thousand, running 1,000 kilometres over 15 days. Uh, and uh, he's up to day four, and I'm sure we'd all wish him the best of luck. He's raising money for Park Run UK. So, Gav, everybody here in the Senate, including the Labor Party uh, and the Liberal National Party, all wish you uh, the best for that. But, um, so, here, here. So, Acting Deputy President, I'm here to talk about um, this bill, and this bill is about Carbon Tax 2.0. And it's like one of those bad Hollywood movies, those, those sequels you get that never, that never, that never, never as good as, as, as the first movie. And this one, this carbon tax, it's bigger, it's uglier, and it's going to hurt you. It's going to really, really hurt you. So, but, but, but seriously, you know, the coalition, we, we, we know, we, we understand the importance of, of addressing climate change. And, and the previous government, uh, we, we knew we had to work to, to, to ensure that we would reduce uh, emissions so that children and grandchildren and future generations uh, could be safe and prosperous but without the lights going out. And the trouble is, with the new government we have here in Australia, the Labor Green government, with the dirty, dodgy deals they do in the dark, is that the, the Greens are uh, not just the tail wagging the dog, they've picked the dog up and, quite frankly, they've taken it to the pound and they've given it away. So that's how the Greens are treating the Labor Party. We, just, just quite rude. And, you know, the Liberals are national. Sometimes we have what we call creative tension in, in our coalition, but we respect each other. And it is quite clear, Acting Deputy President, the Greens don't respect the Labor Party. Because you know why? Because the Greens are claiming this bill is all their bill. And we'd like to know that, that they might be not... You, exact, exact, thank you, Senator Henderson. Where are the amendments? Now, I, I don't know whether they could be in the drawer here. Oh, could be there's Mitty's there under this folder here. We don't know where, the, there's, where these amendments are. And this is a tragedy, because this Senate, this chamber, is here to review the legislation of the executive. This, this chamber is here to ensure that the executive is held to account. But what happens when the Labor Party and the Greens in, in their coalition, when they get together and they do their dirty deals? And it's really disappointing, but not surprising, that, that the Greens have been dancing and stomping and trolloping all over, trolloping all over 
Australian businesses and those people who work in Australian businesses, the glee, the, the, the sheer happiness from, from, from that side of this chamber that, that they were going to stop businesses from operating. You just go, what planet are you on? That's clearly not on planet Earth. And I'd like to commend the Green Senators in the chamber tonight. This is, they are making an excellent contribution to this debate. Senator and quite frankly, we need Senator more McGrath. Green Senators like Senator this. Senator McGrath, mm. would you take Fantastic. your seat, please? Mm. Considering those on the left have made a point of raising issues around interjections, it is disorderly to interject. And you might feel like cheering, but we are in the Senate chamber. So, Senator McGrath, I look forward to the rest of your contribution. And so, and thank you, Acting Deputy President. Never a truer thing that you've said, actually. And so do the many people who are listening, uh, all three of them. And I think uh, Peter Wilson, hopefully, um, is one of them on his tractor who's um, doing some late harvesting um, uh, up, on, up on the downs. But it is important that there is some accountability here, because what is missing and this is, we should be, should be aware of this for those who are listening, and, and the poor people at Hansard are going to have to transcribe my words, is that why are we here at, at three o'clock this morning? Now, it's not a rhetorical, philosophical question where we can all sort of hold hands and sing kumbaya. Why actually are we here at three o'clock on, on a Wednesday morning? Uh, when, when uh, if you look at the timekeepers, uh, when Senator Canavan spoke, he, he spoke about quarter to 12. Senator Cadell uh, spoke about 1.30. Why are we here? Because Labor and the Greens, as part of their dirty deal done in the dark, is that like a mad bunch of, of, of French Republicans from, from the 18th century, they've got the guillotine out. And they've been guillotining left, right and centre. Indeed, today we, we witnessed a, a, acting deputy president, they actually guillotined the guillotine. So, um, you know, pre-revolutionary France, when, when the revolution was happening, would be going, goodness gracious me, they would have loved to have you there with, you, with your use of, of, of the guillotine. So what has happened is the opposition, the official opposition, has been denied the opportunity to, to adequately and properly test this legislation through the processes of this parliament. And what is interesting, Acting Deputy President, is, is it's not just in relation to this bill. Only on Monday night, only on Monday night, Senator Roberts had moved a motion in relation to a, a referral uh, to a, a Senate committee, and so did my good colleague Senator O'Sullivan, um, um, moved a referral to a, a Senate committee. And what did the Labor ministers do at the table? What did they do? They moved the guillotine. They moved the, the, the question to be put. It stopped the ability of, of senators in this chamber to speak to that particular debate. And, and this is what we're seeing increasingly in this chamber is that we've got this, this power block who are using their power to, to push and to dominate and to restrict the right of this chamber to, to advocately test legislation. So that's why we're here at, at now uh, four past three in the morning uh, doing our second reading speeches, because this is the Labor Party who talked about family-friendly hours. Well, if, if this is family-friendly, God, I'd hate to see your families, because quite frankly, this is not family friendly. And we're going to sit late tomorrow night, because this is another broken promise from the Labor Party. They, they, joke, well, they promise, oh, we're going to have family friendly hours. Uh, no, we're not. We're not going to have family friendly hours. Um, we're going to have kind of gentler politics. It was very noticeable before, by the way, um, um, Labor senators, that when Senator Reynolds was speaking, you, the interjections, were incredibly disorderly, but when Senator Colbeck got up to spoke, you went very silent. It was very, very noticeable, very, very noticeable that, that you are targeting Senator Reynolds, but when Senator Colbeck got up, you went all very, very quiet. Very interesting how you target certain female LNP senators. We know what you're up to. You did it, you did it when we were on that side of the chamber, and now you're doing it again. You do, you're focusing, McGrath, and that is shameful. Sorry, sorry. Seat. Thank you. You may return to your speech. If I could find my space in the speech, it would be brilliant. Um, so, 
Well, I was talking about um, the fact that, that, that Labor obviously like to, 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 to target uh, Senator Reynolds, uh, which, which is disappointing, but also the fact of, of the dirty deal done with, with the esteemed members of the Green Party who are contributing to this debate at the moment. And that is, that is what is really sad about this, because you promised to the Australian people that you would you would have transparency. You promised that you would be accountable. But guess what? You haven't been transparent and you're not accountable. And guess what? You are breaking promises. And this bill is another example of one of your broken promises. Because what this bill will do is that it will not keep the lights on in a range of businesses. And if those businesses, if their lights go out, it, it means that Australia hurts. And when Australia hurts, it means that the people who sent me here and sent the people here on this side of the chamber, we know they're going to hurt because of this bill. We know they're going to hurt because of your broken promises. This is the Labor Party who promised 97 times before the last election they would cut your power bills by $275. Now, Acting Deputy President, that's not happening. Power bills are actually going up by more than $275. Power bills are going up between anywhere between 25 and 40 per cent, depending where you live. This is modern Australia under the so-called caring, family-friendly Labor government. They are not caring. They are not family-friendly. And try, goodness, goodness me, try and get them to say uh, the figures 275 or 275 or 572. They will not say that figure in this chamber because they know that they lied before the last election when they made that commitment because they're not going to deliver on that commitment. And we also know, we also know that when it comes to the stage three tax cuts, because we know that this bill is actually about carbon tax 2.0. And we know that Labor love taxes. The bigger the better. Giant throbbing taxes that come after you. Taxes that wedge you in the playground and that drag you to the toilets and flush your head down the dunny. That's what this is about. It is a giant throbbing tax that's going to hurt Australians. Carbon tax 2.0. But, but it gets better or worse because uh, we are here on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia um, on, on this side of the chamber, and that is the stage three tax cuts. We, if we all know you're going to ditch them because you know why you use such measly, weasley words when we ask you questions about it in the Senate. You know, we, we hear from ministers, oh, we've, it's our intention to do this, we've got no intention to do that. You're going to ditch them. Another promise you've broken, because this government is a tricky government. It is a government that's been characterised by its ability to make grand-sounding promises and bring in, in bills with grand names. But in fact, this government, at its heart, is about breaking promises and it is about taxing Australians. And, and that is wrong. That is wrong. Because we believe taxes should be cut. Because we believe that the money that Australians earn is better in their pockets rather than in your pockets. Because, quite frankly, you will, um, you will waste it. And, you, and that is wrong. Now, what we've got to consider is when it comes to the Greens, and when it comes to, to their approach to, to energy in this country, is that, for example, in the last 24 hours in Queensland, 70 per cent of, of our electricity was generated from, from black coal, 5 per cent from gas, 11 per cent from solar, 2 per cent hydro and 4 per cent wind. Now, the deal that you've done with the Greens is, is terrifying. And it's actually going to really hurt Australia. And this is, this is, I'm, they're not partisan talking points here. The deal that you've done with the Greens will hurt Queenslanders. And, will hurt, and, and they, will hurt, they will hurt Queenslanders. And, 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 and sadly, the um, Labor senators are laughing at this because, because they think it's funny when people get power bills that they can't afford. They think it's funny where people are pulling their kids out of sport because they can't afford their registration fees because of the cost of living crisis in this country. And your priorities are to bring in this bill. Your priorities are to waste the Senate's time on this bill instead of dealing with the cost of living crisis in this country. So, yes, I am going to be passionate about this and I will be partisan about this because we will hang this bill around your neck and we will remind you, Paul Keating style, like a 
like a crown of thorns every Senator day to the next McGrath. election. Senator that this McGrath, bill, I will pull you up. Yes. You are to use former Prime Minister's titles in your speech, no matter how passionate you are. So I draw that to your attention. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating, that Prime Minister who wrecked this country by bringing in the recession we had to have. That guy, oh yeah, that guy who the current Treasurer did his PhD on, oh heaven help us. So yes, I'm passionate about the cost of living in Queensland because families in Queensland are pulling their kids out of sport because they can't afford them because of the cost of living crisis happening on your watch. And, and, and what we see from the Labor senators is laughter. And that is shameful. That is shameful that, that the Labor government thinks it's funny that families in this country are struggling to make ends meet. And so, Acting Deputy President, <laughs> Labor have done a deal with the Greens. The Greens, who, who want to stop the coal being dug up, want to stop the gas being pumped out, they don't want to build any uh, hydro power stations in Queensland. So where is the power going to come from? So, so power bills are going up at the moment. But the greater challenge actually is, uh, as a greater challenge, is that where will the power come from in the future? So the deal you've done with the Greens means that, that Australia is actually turning its own electricity supply off. So when families want to turn on, on their TV, they won't be able to because there won't be any electricity coming out of that, 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 that power switch. And, and that is a tragedy, that this bill is actually about short-term thinking, about doing a deal with the Greens, rather than a bill that improves on, on the work that was done by, by the previous government. And as, op as an opposition, we always will want to work with the government where we can make legislation better. That is our role and that is the role of this chamber. But it is sad and unfortunate that the Labor Party government have seen fit to do a secret deal with the Greens behind closed doors. Behind closed doors. And, and you, will reap, you will reap what you have sown with that because the Greens are not the friends of Australia. They are not the friends of, 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 of those Australians who make this a better place. The Greens are only the friends of themselves, but you're in bed with them, so good luck. Senator McKenzie. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise this evening, this morning, to speak about the government's so-called Safeguard Mechanism Amendment Bill. And I rise very proud, in particular, of the National Party senators who have risen throughout this debate, putting on the record the very real lived experience of those the men and women and those communities that have sent them all to this place, because they come from the places that will bear the brunt and the negative impacts of this bill. And those opposite don't like to hear about the communities we represent. They don't want to know what's popular in the cities isn't is going to negatively impact those of us in the regions, but every one of the National Party senators made intelligent, thoughtful contributions born of lived experience, and they have done their job here in putting on the record tonight the impacts that this legislation will have on their people, on our industries and our communities, and I'm very proud of them. I say so-called safeguard because, regrettably, there are no apparent safeguards in this bill for the parts of Australia that are likely and most likely to be impacted by this Labor government's dirty deal with the Greens and their drive to reach an emissions reduction tar target of 43 per cent uh, below 2005 by 2030. I refer to the explanatory notes attached to the bill which cite the nationally determined contribution update commitment that Australia has made to the global emissions reductions and the Labor government's updated NDC under Article 4 of the Paris Agreement of the UN. What is not mentioned, of course, in the update is that one of the first acts of this Labor government upon gaining power was a decision to strip out a commitment of our government that we made 
to measure the economic and social impact of our NDCs periodically and independently and rigorously as part of our nation's decision to see what are those uh, when we have made those ambitious targets, who are impacted, what are the socio-economic impact, and therefore what will the government in charge as we head towards net zero responsibility be to those communities and those industries. The stripping out of this addition to Australia's NDC was done deliberately, it was done secretively, and in my view with a cynical disregard for the people who live outside our capital cities. This bill will require Australia's 215 largest emitters to reduce their emissions by 4.9 per cent every year to 2030. Of the 215 facilities penalised, 84 per cent of them are in regional Australia and 88 per cent are in sectors that are critical to our economic prosperity. I mean, it beggars belief, but not surprise. These are enterprises that support the agriculture, the construction, manufacturing, transport, logistics and resources extraction sectors, enterprises which together underpin our nation's wealth, which keep our GDP growing, that help pay for our universal health care system, our world-class way of life and standard of living, our roads, our defence forces and our public education system. There was no mention in Mr Bowen's second reading speech to the regions, not one mention, despite 84 per cent of the impact being felt in the regions. But why are we surprised in this chamber? Because you don't care. You don't represent them. And you actually couldn't give a damn about the impact on the most vulnerable communities in this nation as you strive to fulfil an urban um, centred policy ambition. Instead, we heard another fable that this bill would result in the Australian electricity system becoming cheaper through the deployment of renewable energy. You defy the laws of physics and try to suspend the laws of economics since you've come to power. But unfortunately, there will be a reckoning for this government and for the people of Australia uh, by this suspended reality that you try to weave. The lived reality of Australian families and businesses is that under your government power prices are going up, no matter how much Senator Farrell tried to talk about downward pressure with his hands today in his contributions. The fact is they're going up, up, up and up. You cut the regional accelerator program, which was modelled on similar support programs put in place in the EU to support regions during decarbonisation of the European economy. This was the first down payment to assist the most vulnerable communities during the move to net zero. But you cut that. That was one of your first decisions in your October budget. And here you are penalising regional communities again. This mechanism will cover industries such as steel and aluminium manufacturing transport and included Woodside's North West Shelf Gas Project, Chevron's Gorgon Gas Project and Port Kembla Steelworks. The mechanism includes Qantas, Virgin, Rex at a time when tourism and aviation is just getting back on its feet and a time when airfares are already skyrocketing, particularly to our regional communities. Guess what? Australia Post's captured in this mechanism. It's going an existential challenge to its operation through technological change. How do we know what will drive Australia's post-future rationalisation? The minister um, is, was contemplating earlier this evening around the conflation of two issues. Well, you've, you've captured Australia Post. Your simul what is going to be the implications for Australia Post? Are they simultaneously going to stop delivering letters in a, an effort to reduce emissions? Are the posties going to take up scooters instead of vehicles? I mean, seriously, what is the impact of your decisions? You don't want to talk about it. No one on the other side of the chamber has talked about the impact of this. It is much broader 
than we've been led to believe. Australian companies like Blue Scope Steel have already conceded that this bill impedes the viability of their manufacturing capability onshore. No one's listening. Cooey over there. Construction industries like aluminium, steel and cement have few options for abatement, yet are left to bear the brunt of financial burdens imposed under this government's wider emissions reform. The Cement Industries Federation, in their submission to Safeguard Mechanism um, consultation paper, said, and I quote, around 70 per cent of Scope 1 emissions arise from the cal calcination of limestone that is unlikely to be avoided or reduced with existing technology in the next decade. A technology pathway exists for Scope 1 carbon capture use and storage, but won't be in place until at least 2035. This is not fantasy football. These are facts from heavy industry that actually build this country, build our roads. You want to build houses, you want to um, construct cities, you can't do it without the cement industry. And they've got no mechanism for abatement until 2035. But you don't want to hear it. We are careering towards a, a, a crash of ideology and reality. In the transport industry, major rail haulers, operators like Horizon Pacific National will be targeted. CEO Andrew Harding agrees that these reforms have a structural flaw and the risk is again the opposite of the intent of the bill. More freight will be pushed back onto road, off rail, as a result of this bill, pushing the emissions per tonne of product moved up. A pattern is developing with the government at contradictory policies. On one hand, it wants more affordable social housing and a renaissance in our manufacturing sector, and on the other, it introduces measures that make raw materials more expensive and power more expensive, and places impulse on industry that make them more unviable or invite companies to move offshore. On one hand, it wants more sovereign capability and on the other hand, it's taking away our natural advantage to access of reliable and inexpensive power. In the end, the cost of these reforms will ultimately be passed on to Australian households and therefore ultimately Australian workers. And this will hang around the Labor Party because it won't be the Greens that pay for this Labor, because they don't represent the workers. And I know you're having an internal fight about which union is supporting which political party at the moment. It will not be the Greens who represent the most affluent white-collar workers in the country. It will be Labor Party who actually has their legacy as the party of the workers further trashed as we see jobs move offshore in the opposite of the intent with which you brought this bill to parliament because of the deal you have done with the Australian Greens. As companies scramble to find ways to reduce their emissions over coming years, households can expect higher fuel costs, higher energy costs, higher waste disposal costs, higher building costs, higher transport costs, higher costs for groceries and other goods they buy. This is absolutely the worst time for the government to introduce a bill such as this in an inflationary period. Every single time this government hasn't had an opportunity to make the right decision to put downward pressure on cost of living, to put downward pressure on inflation, they've made the wrong call every single time. And it will be Australian families and the most vulnerable in our communities, and I argue regional Australians in the main, who will pay for this um, ambivalence. The government's clear intention is to phase out coal-fired power stations as quickly as possible, but without the transition technology, especially gas needed to supplement renewable projects to support the transitions. You've been crippled by the Greens. It's insanity. No one else in the world is doing this. It's like you all need to go back to year eight and understand the laws of physics and economics. You are making decisions that defy it. 
Everyone in this chamber is mo accepts moving to a net zero position and accepts Australia doing its role in that global task, but not until you've got a substitute, which is exactly what you're doing. You're being held to ransom by the Australian Greens, and it will be Australian workers that pay. Robert Gottsleitzen, reporting in The Australian, quoted today's revelations from the CSIRO chief executive, Larry Marshall, who was speaking at the Australian Davos Connection Leadership Conference in Brisbane. This is not some right-wing radical. This is a CSIRO chief executive. And we have had enough of CSIRO reports quoted to us on this side of the chamber over the last number of years to back up any number of Labor and Green um, ideological requests. But you, I'm begging you to listen again to the same CSIRO that you quoted back to us, who said, without gas in the mix of electricity sources, the target of zero emissions by 2050 will cause widespread power shortage, said CSIRO Marshall. Samantha McCulloch, Chief Executive APIA, states the safeguard mechanism changes strengthen the need to back carbon capture use and storage, which you steadfastly refuse to do, even though the International Energy Agency has said the only way the globe gets to net zero is through the technologies of carbon capture and storage and nuclear. Not, not the National Party saying that. It's the same international agencies and experts that you quote back to us, but you're very selective about what you listen to, to the Australian public's detriment, I fear. While the United States is supporting cover uh, CCUS and Britain is also now investing in it, the Albanese government cut funding for carbon capture usage and storage by $250 million in the October budget. In simple terms, the Albanese government is driving us to try and achieve a renewable nirvana with both hands tied behind our back. Finally, it remains a leap of faith that the proposed offset and crediting system, which we know has been subject to manipulation and fraud, won't be manipulated. No one is commenting on that today, how it's somehow going to become gold standard. We fervently hope on our side of the chamber that this government's climate policies, of which this bill is a key part, will not destroy the very businesses it seeks to safeguard. We won't be supporting the bill. Senator Smith, and can I just remind senators, your comments go through the chair. Uh, thank you very much. Before I begin my contribution at this very, very late hour, I thought it important to acknowledge that the Senate is continuing to be supported by uh, a Senate chamber staff and, department of the, and, and staff from the Department of the Senate. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because as we deliberate, sometimes it's easy to think it's only about ourselves, but this chamber is still being supported at this very, very unfavourable hour. Um, as you've heard from coalition senators, this bill is not going to be supported. And I do want to associate myself with all of those remarks that have been made last night and this morning by coalition senators. Um, because many people might be seeing it on, hearing it on the radio, they wouldn't be able to see what is happening in the chamber. And I think it's also important to note uh, that earlier in the night we heard contributions from the Greens. Um, in actual fact, the Greens have spoken more frequently on this bill than government senators have, and that is quite remarkable given that it is the government's bill that we're talking about tonight. But as I said, the, government, uh, the bill would not be supported by coalition senators, uh, but of course it is important to acknowledge that the coalition is committed to transitioning to net zero emissions in a way that is responsible and protects the growth and prosperity of Australia. It's important to restate as well that the coalition exceeded Australia's coyote targets, signed Australia onto achieving net zero by 2050, and reduced emissions by over 20% on our 20, 2005 base level, putting Australia well on track to beat our Paris Treaty commitments. And of course, under the coalition government, uh, 
emissions were reduced at rates faster than some of our most important trading partners. Yeah, yeah. But at the core of this debate, the Senate is being asked to embrace a reform initiative that has not been properly modelled. What does that mean? The effects of the legislation are, on, are unknown on the economy, and what we're saying is that in that unknownness there's a risk and you can only plan for the worst. This reform in this bill is unbalanced and its immediate impacts will be felt disproportionately by regional communities across Australia. And for other Australians, they will not escape the consequences. For them, this reform will be felt in further price increases for Australians as the additional costs of delivering the required emissions reductions will be passed on to Australian households. Critically, the Treasury confirmed at Senate estimates in February that modelling of the safeguard mechanism reforms had not considered broader economic impacts such as the impact on investment, the impact on jobs and the impact on prices. In addition to that, the Department of Climate Change, Energy and the Environment and Water also declined to provide senators the economic modelling that was undertaken to fashion this initiative. And where information about costs have been available, they've been revealing. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry confirmed business would pass their higher operating costs under this safeguard mechanism on to consumers. This is a very real, real cause of concern and alarm. This is a bad idea happening at the possibly the worst time for the Australian economy. At a time when Australia needs to be talking about the next tranche of reforms to protect our living standards, to protect this country from becoming poorer, what we're being dealt with is a market intervention so severe that it will leave a lasting scar on many Australian industries. This bill will make Australian businesses less competitive compared to our international competitors. It's true that the previous coalition government had introduced a safeguard mechanism to limit the growth of emissions in the industrial sector by applying an emissions baseline on 215 of Australia's largest emitters. That reform delivered emissions benefits. But Labor's plan is not the same as the previous coalition government's plan. Claims that this safeguard mechanism policy mirrors the coalition is designed to confuse and to mislead. The new government safeguard mechanism will force facilities to reduce their emissions intensity by up to almost 5 per cent each year, regardless of whether the technology exists for them to do so. Without access and pathways to technology, there can be no pathway to decarbonisation of the Australian economy. Instead, many Australian businesses will have no option but to reduce production, move offshore or shut down entirely. That amounts to declining economic growth, lower levels of productivity and a fall in real incomes and living standards for every Australian. This so-called safeguard mechanism will be felt in the daily lives of many Australians. Higher building material costs in the middle of a housing affordability crisis, higher fuel costs in response to rising energy bills, higher transportation costs that will hit our supply chains. Australia's strength can, can be easily turned into a vulnerability when put in the hands of the ill-informed. As an open economy and an export orientated trading nation, reforms such as this should be embarked upon with great care, a much deeper understanding of their consequences and a proper awareness of the drivers of our domestic and international competitiveness. Concerns this reform may risk closing down Australia's cement, steel, aluminium, oil refining and mining industries have been met with disbelief by some people in the community and some senators in this chamber. But just this evening, the first ripples of the economic repercussions of the so-called safeguard mechanism have been revealed. In this morning's papers, senators will be able to read how Australian coal companies have warned of a carbon tax by self 
confirming that this safeguard mechanism will drive up energy prices, destroy jobs and kill foreign investment. Companies companies that employ thousands of Australians, such as Whitehaven, New Hope, Bowen, Coke and Coal and Peabody Australia, have all condemned this 11th hour, perhaps it's the 12th or 13th hour now, 11th hour safeguard mechanism shake-up amid concerns that changes will damage prosperity and make it harder and more expensive to reduce emissions. These are the same companies that are custodians of $15 billion worth of projects and count billions of dollars in their investment pipelines. They say the government's proposed amendments will make Australia un uncompetitive and that, makes, and that means making Australians poorer. The president of Peabody's Australian operations, Jamie Frankham, has said this legislation makes the mining industry less competitive at a time when it's integral to providing the minerals and energies required for the energy transition. goes on to say the very real danger in setting aspirational emission reduction targets and imposing rigid rules to achieve them is that it will reduce our competitive competitiveness, lead to potential job losses and hurt regional communities. Glencore has said the reforms needed to achieve emissions reductions are needed without destroying the jobs and without destroying the investments that are critical to our national economy. And the future owners of Origin Energy have said the government must better balance the need to reduce emissions while ensuring energy security. They've said if we don't get the balance right and we have the extreme volatility like we saw in Europe last year, I think you're going to get very significant consumer backlash. Consumer backlash. They are the two words that government senators should keep in mind. At the last election, Labor did very well in Western Australia, and congratulations to them. But to borrow Senator Scar's term, West Australians did not vote for this. And when you look at some of the projects that are on the list of 212 liable entities. These are names of projects that are household names in Western Australia. Let me just read some of them to you. Hammersley Iron Projects at Hope Down 1, Hope Down 4, Brockman 4 Mine, Brockman 2 Mine. On the list is the Pilbara Rail Operations. On the list is the Alinta Energy Transmission Unit at Roy Hill. On the list is the Newmont uh, Tanami operation. On the list is the Yilgarn Iron Ore Project in Koolinobbing. On the list are the BHP Iron Ore Projects. On the list is CSB Limited at the Kwinana facility. On the list is the BP Refinery at Kwinana. On the list is the AD Barai Limited in Dongra and Coburn operation. These are projects that are going to suffer as a result of the safeguard mechanism and not 12 months ago, West Australian voters put their trust in Patrick Gorman, the member for Perth, Tracy Roberts, the member for Pearce, uh, Zanita, Zanita, whose name escapes me, the member for Swan, uh, Sam Limintangney. So Patrick Gorman, the member for Perth, Tracy Roberts, the member for Pearce, Anne Arley, the member for Cowan, must now go and front their communities in suburbs like Clarkson and Merriwa and Morley and Bassendine and explain to Australian, West Australian families who have benefited from well-paid jobs flying up and out of the Pilbara region of our state, why is it that their jobs will soon be at risk? Not my word, the words of industry themselves why will their jobs soon be at risk at a time when they're feeling mortgage pressure, at a time when they're feeling rising cost of living pressures? A bad idea being introduced at the worst possible time. So why is it then that only one Labor senator, Senator Grogan, had the courage to come into the Senate and stand up 
in make and make a contribution on this bill. I have not heard. I have not heard. I have not heard one WA Labor senator come in here and say this is a good idea for WA families that they have not broken the trust of West Australian voters. Not yet 12 months. Not yet 12 months since the first anniversary of the government. And at the core of this. At the core of this is not just WA's prosperity, not just the prosperity of West Australian families, but the prosperity of the whole country. This is remarkable. And it's a shame that more people are not watching the television. Because here are Labor senators who have made little to no contribution. The Greens did all the speaking and they've gone home. And you're left carrying the can. Wow. You have been really, really outdone by the Australian Greens. When we come back to this chamber in just a few hours' time, I'm afraid to say, you should be very embarrassed because West Australian voters are going to hold you accountable. They're all in bed. Are going to hold you accountable. These are big projects that make Western Australia very, very successful that have given West Australian families higher levels of uh, income, higher levels of, standing, uh, of living than they would have otherwise have had, and in this so-called safeguard mechanism, you are putting that all at risk. Wow. And not yet 12 months of this government. Wow. That is brave. Senator Aston. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I stand um, tonight, this morning, um, to speak on the Safeguards Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023. Um, and I stand here at 3.42 in the morning um, because I think this is a really important piece of legislation that I wanted to make my contribution so that my voice would be on the record um, as opposing what has got to be one of the most farcical things that I've seen in a very long time. But in doing so, I draw to the attention of those who may be listening now, but more importantly those that may consider my contribution at some other time, that the family-friendly situation that exists in this chamber is such that I had to wait until 3.42 before I could make my contribution because so many other people wanted to and because this government has not got the capacity to organise itself in an appropriate way so that we were able to have these debates in the chamber at a time that actually is family friendly. So it does make somewhat of a joke um, of, uh, of the everything and all the rhetoric that we heard leading into the election about how we were going to be family friendly, but apparently we're only family friendly when we want to be family friendly. When we don't want to be family friendly, we can still be uh, five. Uh, yeah, so we can be sitting here at you know like um, four o'clock in the morning, and I know there are others that want to make a contribution um, after me. So uh, very disappointing that that's the way we find ourselves today. But this is an important enough bill for us to stay out of bed until this hour of the morning to make sure that we put on the record the extraordinary concerns that we have about the impact that this bill is likely to have um, on Australia, on the Australian economy, on Australian businesses and ultimately on, on Australian families. And this is another broken promise um, and I think as the contribution that was made by Senator Smith before me you know, made the comment that there are many out there um, and when you, when you get up this morning and you read this morning's papers you'll see that um, you know, there is no hiding. It doesn't matter how much lipstick you stick on this pig, this is still a carbon tax. You can call it what you like. But we have got a new carbon tax, um, and you know I'm sure that should strike um, fear into the hearts of uh, many Australians because we know what a carbon tax will do to our economy, um, and uh, you know it sort of strikes you back to those Julia Gillard moment when she said there will be no carbon tax under the government that I lead. Um, Mr Albanese went to the last election promising that he'd keep his hands off our resources sector, but tonight, after the dirty deal that's been done with the Greens. Once again, we will see um, that this government cannot be trusted um, with what it says in the lead-up to an election. After it's been elected, it will do whatever it feels like, and it will do whatever the tail, the green tail that's wagging the red dog, will seek for it to do. 
So tonight we um, not only have a bad bill, but we have a bad bill made worse by the deal that's been done by the Greens. But the real losers out of all of this are the Australian public, because at the end of the day, when you put upward pressure through legislation, through regulation and through means like we've seen, will be legislated through here in a minute, because we know the Greens have been bought. Um, ultimately, that cost is always passed through to the consumers. And right now, there has never been a worse time for us to be putting extra pressure on Australian families and Australian households as we see the cost of living spiralling across Australia. But the thing that probably should concern people more than anything else is that despite many, many attempts um, in this chamber to seek for the government to provide the modelling that sits behind the impact of this decision on Australia, they have continuously refused to provide that information to the chamber. Now, um, I've been around a while, and I've got to tell you, the first conclusion one always jumps to when somebody refuses to provide you with the evidence on which they are basing a decision, it usually means that our evidence is not particularly um, conducive to supporting what they are doing. So we can only assume, we can only assume that the modelling that's being hidden by those opposite in relation to the impact of this decision on Australian businesses, Australian economy and Australian families um, is the fact that it is actually showing that exactly what we think is likely to happen by this piece of legislation um, is exactly what is going to happen from this piece of legislation. And that is it's going to drive uh, the cost of living up, it's going to drive prices up and it's going to make the Australian economy weaker. But in saying all that, um, I have to say, um, I, I think that there would not be an Australian that wouldn't like to see a clean energy future um, and that we take action to make sure that we are um, doing our part in the world to make sure that we have got um, a, a future that our children, um, with a, that our future for our children is, is, uh, is one that lives in a clean uh, environment. But you can't just ideologically jump to a position um, of reducing carbon emissions in the manner that those opposite have already legislated with their 43 per cent, without actually thinking about the significance and impact of the transition from where we are today to where we want to be into the future. Um, I think if you have a look at, you know, you speak to any change manager, any successful change manager anywhere in the world, and you ask them what is the secret to success, the secret to success of any change is the way you actually manage the transition to where you want to be. And right now we have seen a lurch away from what I think our government did, and that was had a very sensible transition that allowed technology to drive uh, the kinds of investments that we needed to make sure that we had adoption of clean energy technologies and clean energy um, substances to make sure that we had a clean energy future that was built on the back of a prosperous economy and an economy that could rely on the fact that it wasn't going to get belted over the head by a tax, but actually could be incentivised into providing that clean energy future for our, our country. And, and the coalition met all its targets. Um, somehow those opposites seek to demonise um, what um, has been achieved. We achieved every target that we have uh, had before us, met and exceeded you know, Kyoto. You know, we signed on to achieving net zero. You know, we've reduced our emissions in excess of, of what we've said over our baselines. You know, we put Australia well on track to meet absolutely every target into the future. And yet those opposites somehow think that that fantastic track record that saw us underpin a strong Australian economy uh, is somehow not good enough. And in pursuit of the ideology of some sort of, you know, green sort of light into the future, it doesn't matter that you destroy the Australian economy going forward. And, um, Senator um, Smith drew um, the chamber's attention to a, uh, an article that's in the Australian this morning, and I mean it could not be more damning of what this impact of this is going to be um, on one of Australia's absolute foundation sectors. It's a sector that has provided Australia with the wealth that's allowed us to be and our communities to be as strong as they have been and as wealthy as they have been for so long. Uh, and that's our resources sector. And this morning, um, our resources sector is basically condemning this government. And the really sad thing is that we're probably going to have to wait to see the consequences of the actions of this legislation, the damage it's going to do on Australia, um, before 
uh, those opposite will realise that what they've actually done is destroyed a very strong Australian economy, an Australian economy that had a reputation internationally as a great place to invest, a reputation uh, of someone who put innovation at the head of what they did to try and make sure that our economy continued to be strong. Um, but the problem is that what we've got here is a piece of legislation that basically is about to render Australia's extraordinary competitiveness in the resource sector to becoming one that is completely uncompetitive. You know, and, and thinking about the, the list of names that sit on that list of the big emitters that will be hit by this carbon tax um, and the cost that, that, will be, uh, that, that they will have to bear, which clearly they'll pass on to consumers, um, that what that will do to our economy. I suppose the thing that is really, con really concerning is that we, we heard going into the election Mr Albanese saying that he would not be doing any deals with the Greens. Right. They were going to be a government in their own right and they were not going to fall over every time um, the Greens tried to, to, um, to force them into some of these ridiculously uncompromising and damaging situations. But no, 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 no. We can say one thing before the election, but after the election we'll do whatever it takes to make sure that we can, can, we can get our, our promises through, no matter what the cost to the economy is. And today we have seen exactly that. Um, and we see this morning in the papers many companies coming out and actually saying that what we've seen is a really bad bill. The bill that was really int originally introduced by Mr Bowen has been made worse by the deal that we've seen done with the Greens. Um, you know, they draw to the attention the fact that 70 per cent of Japan's thermal coal imports come from Australia. So it exposes a really close friend, Japan, to extraordinary uh, material new risks uh, in terms of their energy supply. Did anybody think about that? Uh, and in the midst of a global shortage on energy, um, and considering that the alternative technologies that we need to be able to pick up the difference um, from our 80 per cent reliant on primary energy uh, derived from fossil fuels today, um, it just seems extraordinary that you opposite would concede um, or even entertain these sorts of concessions that the Greens are demanding of you. Um, but the, the, the challenge then is, um, you know, so we're going to see Australian prices pushed up as a result of this particular piece of legislation. Um, but all we're actually seeing is that not only will we see prices pushed up, we will see um, Australian jobs lost, um, Australian jobs offshored, um, and we will see rural and regional communities once again bearing the brunt of the kinds of decisions that those opposite make. Because whilst we will see across the whole of Australia the, the, the economic wrecking ball that this will put through our economy, it will once again be felt first and hardest in rural and regional Australia. Um, you know, it just seemed quite extraordinary. And then you, know, you add to that um, you know, the, the pollution trigger that we've got um, legislated now through the, the deal with the Greens. You know, so we now have a situation where um, um, uh, you know, it, emissions need to be considered in absolutely every project for approval. Now, whilst that may not of, of itself sound that bad. Can you imagine what it's going to do? It's just going to slow down every single project, and it puts another, uh, yeah, exactly, and it puts another sovereign risk um, uh, uh, inhibitor into everything that happens in Australia. And you know, Mr. Bantz out there this morning or last night, you know, claiming it's uh, the deal is going to stop about 116 coal and gas projects that are already in the pipeline. So, what kind of politician would come in here and say? Your primary energy source at the moment. We've just gone and stuck the proverbial spanner in the works, so you will no longer be able to get back to it. But at the same time, Mr. Bowen's out there saying the safeguard mechanism won't damage investment and won't drive up prices. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Either Mr. Bant's telling the truth, or Mr. Bowen's telling the truth. And the really sad thing is. It's Mr Bant that's telling the truth, not Mr Bowen, because the sad reality is these projects will be stopped, our economy will be stopped, and the damage will be felt by the Australian economy as a result of it. But I think the other thing too is that you know, the fact that this particular legislation, whilst it seeks to make Australia's credentials look the way those opposite want them to look, in effect all it does is push the problem somewhere else. Um, because what we will do is we will see economic activity that would otherwise occur in Australia get offshored 
to overseas markets with no carbon policies or bad climate policies and higher emissions intensity. You know, how on earth you can sit there in all consciousness and say that this is okay, that you can shove our problems in Australia to other countries that are less able to be able to deal with them, who have higher emissions um, in the process of trying uh, to somehow appease uh, an election commitment that you have, have made to the Australian public. So we have a double whammy here. We have Australian businesses rendered uncompetitive, we have them forced offshore, uh, and then we see, um, you know, in many instances, a doubling of the kind of emissions for where these projects now um, will be undertaken. So um, it is just extraordinary that you would actually um, you know, sacrifice Australian jobs um, that lead to a perverse outcome for the economy. Because at the end of the day, what you have done here is you have put a policy in place that will actually worsen the impact on the economy um, because you have pushed emissions to a place where they are less likely to be controlled, less likely to be managed, and in the process of doing so, you have destroyed Australian jobs. You will put a wrecking ball through the Australian economy. You will force up costs for Australians at a time when they can least afford more cost of living pressures, um, and you don't seem to care. Um, because at the end of the day, as I said at the start of my contribution, the, at the end of the day, any increase in price will always have to be paid for. And the increase in price that we are going to see from this absolutely ridiculous um, policy that is about to be legislated in this place is higher costs for Australian companies, higher costs for Australian families, higher costs for Australian individuals, and sadly, a higher cost for the Australian and the world environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, it's no secret that the politics of climate change have frustrated me over the years. Frustrated me uh, in my 16 years in this place, uh, bearing witness to debates here uh, and indeed to debates around our country and around the world. Too often uh, I've borne witness to extreme arguments, variously coming from all sides arguments that are detached from the facts of science or detached from the facts of economics or ignorant of the realities of geopolitics. It's also no secret that I've pressed publicly and privately uh, for my party to adopt a more positive position at times on matters of climate change and that I've been concerned at extreme perspectives that too often consider Australia in a vacuum as if our actions alone can solve these issues or can isolate us from these challenges. What well, the challenge of climate change necessitates is a careful, analytical and fact-based assessment. Consideration of the problem, the cause, the solutions available. A sober, fact-based approach. And in this early hours of the morning, uh, I hope to at least work through some of those issues and place my thoughts on the record. How we should view the problems, the causes and the solutions, do so in the context of Australia and relevant policies for Australia. The problems and associated risks around climate change are well articulated, studied and published, even if they're not accepted by all. Most recently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report assessed the impacts of climate change on ecosystems, biodiversity and human systems, differing impacts across regions, sectors and communities, and outlined how to best reduce adverse consequences for current and future generations. The IPCC report found that impacts are increasingly severe, interconnected and often irreversible. It assesses the vulnerability of human and natural systems. It outlined the role of adaptation in reducing exposure and vulnerability to climate change. It looked at the levels of resilience and how to further build them, including through transformations and transitions in human and natural systems. The IPCC report finds that there is at least a greater than 50 per cent likelihood that global warming will reach or exceed one and a half degrees in the near term, and it observes the risks of concurrent hazards, compounding effects and extreme events. From an Australian domestic context, from the perspective of many of our Pacific Island neighbours in particular, and that of most of our global friends and partners, these are risks that we can and should take seriously. And this, of course, is not new, new, new news. Indeed, looking back on past contributions in some of these debates, I saw that way back 
In 2009, I quoted Margaret Thatcher speaking at the Second World Climate Conference on the 6th of November 1990. It's a quote many others have used at different junctures, where she said the danger of global warming is as yet unseen, but real enough for us to make change and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. But unlike 33 years ago when Thatcher spoke, we do know much more now. Not all of the dangers remain unseen. We have made some breakthroughs, but we need to make more. Commitments under international climate change agreements, like the Kyoto Agreement and the Paris Agreement, tend to be benchmarked off of 2005 levels. Now, I entered this place in 2007, and it's instructive to look at the changes in the global and domestic emissions landscape over the horizon of that last couple of decades since those timeframes. Globally, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere had moved from its stable long-run base of an estimated 270 to 280 parts per million up to 384 parts per million by 2007, rising up to 419 parts per million in more recent estimates. This shift in atmospheric concentration has been driven by growth in annual CO2 emissions, climbing from around 5 to 10 billion tonnes per annum through the Industrial Revolution and global population explosion to reach an estimated 31.5 billion tonnes by 2007. But since then, we have seen the rate of global annual emissions rise even further to a reported 37.1 billion tonnes in 2021. This continued growth in annual emissions and atmospheric concentration fits the narrative of despair and emergency that we so often hear about. But what of our role and our contribution here in Australia? Well, Australia's emissions inventory, as reported under the Paris Agreement, has gone from 646 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions in 2007 down to 498 million tonnes in 2020. So, while global emissions have continued to rise, Australia has reduced our emissions by 20 per cent, even as our economy grew by 45 per cent meaning that our rate of emissions intensity has declined even faster than our nation's actual emissions. You wouldn't expect or appreciate this from much of the commentary, but they're important facts for us to bear in mind. Australia's share of global emissions used to be put at around 1.4 per cent of global emissions, but is now estimated to be closer to 1.1 per cent. More than half of global emissions are attributed to just three countries. China, who now account for around 32 or 33 per cent, the United States at around 12 to 13 per cent, and India at around 6 to 7 per cent. The rapid growth in emissions from China, more recently from India, and of course in many other smaller nations pursuing their own development agendas is understandable. It is a function of their pursuit of higher living standards, higher living standards which we otherwise celebrate their achievement of. And the reality is that Australia's per capita emissions remain significantly higher than these countries who are still charting their development trajectory. If we are truly to combat climate change, truly to heed the messages of the latest, most recent IPCC report, the test is not only for how we further reduce our emissions to meet our net zero commitment and to achieve ambitious interim targets that track towards it, but also for how we best enable China and India and so many other smaller but economically ambitious nations to realise their development goals without them further worsening the global emissions challenge. This president is where low-cost transferable technology is essential. Australia, in our journey over the last 20 years, reducing our emissions and our emissions intensity, has seen remarkable transformation as part of that journey. One in four Australian homes now have rooftop solar panels, the highest rate of penetration of solar PV in the world. Years ago, the solar PV market was fuelled by huge subsidies, feed-in tariffs and government intervention. 
Today, it is largely fuelled by cost competitiveness. Commercial realities make household solar stack up for homes around Australia. Increasing cost competitiveness also saw some $35 billion invested into renewable energy in the period between 2017 and 2020, because the economics had switched in favour of those renewables increasingly as a source of generation. To achieve global net zero by 2050, the International Energy Agency estimates that low emissions technologies, including solar, including hydropower and including nuclear, must grow from around 40 per cent of global power production to 100 per cent. Hydrogen and carbon capture and use carbon capture use and storage technologies are further estimated to need to grow and contribute around 50 per cent in emissions across heavy industries. These are the types of changes that are essential to affect change here in Australia and in the nations most contributing to continued global emissions growth. That's why the previous coalition government placed genuine focus on low emissions technologies. We, in committing Australia to a net zero trajectory, identified six priority low emissions technologies that Australia ought to focus on as part of a global effort. We set measurable, quantifiable targets to make these technologies affordable and accessible to not only Australia but to other countries around the world who we knew would need that type of cost-effective breakthrough for them to be able to play their role in tackling climate change. Those six priority low emissions technologies were clean hydrogen, ultra-low-cost solar, energy storage for firming, low emissions materials, particularly steel and aluminium, carbon capture and storage, and soil carbon. Examples of the type of financial analysis we undertook were that we acknowledged clean hydrogen needing to be produced at under $2 per kilogram to make it cost effective, not just in Australia, but around other nations and to drive its uptake. Similarly, in ultra low cost solar, the strive towards generation at $15 per megawatt hour to achieve storage for firming at under $100 per megawatt hour, to achieve low emission steel production under $700 per tonne or low emissions aluminium production under $2,200 per tonne, to ensure that CO2 compression, hub transport and storage could occur under $20 per tonne of CO2, and that soil organic carbon measurement could be achieved under $3 per hectare per year. These detailed targets, backed by genuine strategies and investments. President, I regret that internal debates over matters such as the net zero commitment or images of those holding lumps of coal undermined the credibility of these strategies and with that undermined the focus on the investment, the success Australia has achieved in emissions reduction. Take our work in relation to setting the nation up for hydrogen. We built and established major new cooperative agreements with Germany, with Japan, with Singapore, with the UK to build hydrogen supply chains to share technology. We backed it with investments in multiple hydrogen hubs across every state around this country. We invested in hydrogen electrolyser projects through ARENA. We made sure that there were real plans for Australia to be able to lead in that sector. And I hope and trust that this government will make sure that it continues to pursue those types of positive policies in that space. This government has come forward with a plan contained in the legislation before us, now influenced sharply by the Greens, that is more like a stick to Australian industry than a carrot to deliver the change that can impact not just our industry but can impact and help to deliver the changes that are necessary globally. 
Indeed, the government's policy approaches are making that change harder by being driven to ideological cuts to programs such as carbon capture use and storage. We face a Labor government who have cut grants to CCUS hubs, who have walked away from projects that can help to achieve the type of step change in emissions control that is needed here in Australia and around the world. CCUS is going to be a big part of how most countries meet their targets, and it will have to be a big part of how Australia does too. And to walk away from those types of policy settings is only to make that task harder. So, President, I stand here tonight, or this morning as it may now be, acknowledging fully the task of the challenge that we and the world have. But we shouldn't look at it through ideological blinkers. We shouldn't look at it uh, pretending there are silver bullets. And we certainly shouldn't look at it denigrating what Australia has achieved, because we have achieved remarkable change in reducing our emissions. We have played a role in step change in technologies through, for example, our take-up of solar PV. And we can play a positive role if we focus on how we can get affordable technologies taken up here in Australia that set a model for the rest of the world. So I urge the government to reflect, to consider the scale of those global challenges and to better equip Australia to contribute to those challenges, not just here but right around the world, and for us to do so from a position of strength where our role in technologies to combat climate change is the most positive one possible. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, President. Um, in just a few hours, the Senate, I expect, will resume, and shortly after that, uh, we will move to the committee stage on this bill. And so, while I had planned to make some longer remarks, I think, given the hour, I won't detain the Senate. Uh, I'll have the opportunity to contribute on a range of the questions that have been put before the chamber this evening by senators during the committee stage, and I look forward to that opportunity. I'll say just this, that the reforms that are before us this evening are significant and they are also long overdue. Mm -hmm. They are reforms that have been called for by business groups and climate groups, and those same groups have been clear that the parliament should pass the reforms that are before them to provide overdue policy certainty and to allow the country and the businesses that make up our economy and support our communities and the workers in all of our communities Order. that we represent here to prepare themselves for the transformation that everyone here asserts that they support. I thank everyone who has contributed to this evening's debate and I look forward to resuming conversation with all of you later this morning. Thank you, Senator McAllister. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again at 9am today.